So you want to start a beauty brand? There's a lot of moving pieces that you have to have in order to successfully launch a cosmetic company. What are the claims that you can make? How do you go about proving them? And how should you approach product development and manufacturing? Also getting products into the hands of your customers. How do you navigate the business side of things? Also making sure that you're regulatory compliant and also protecting yourself from potential lawsuits down the line. There's so much to know and I know for beauty founders, especially for those who don't have experience in the cosmetics industry, finding all the right information can be challenging and expensive. This is my attempt to put everything all in one spot to help make things easier for everyone. Welcome to our e-summit brought to you by the EcoL, an extension of our greater free e-conference series. My name's Jen and I will be today's MC and moderator. Some housekeeping before we get started. This conference is being live streamed both on Discord and our YouTube channel. To get the most out of the conference, you'll need to be on Discord and be sure to be in the Summit Text channel. That's where the conference conversation will be happening and where I'll be looking for questions for the Q&A portions of each of the presentations. If you had issues accessing our Discord, I'll also be looking at the YouTube chat for questions as well, but I will be prioritizing prioritizing questions that come in on Discord. Don't wait to ask your questions, ask them as they come to you. I will be keeping track for the Q&As. We will also be uploading PDF slides for each of the presentations, which will be on the replay page and you'll receive that to your email tomorrow. If you would like to network via audio with other attendees, we encourage you to use the Lounge Voice channel. Massive thank you to our Summit sponsors for supporting our e-conference initiative. Thank you to our bronze sponsors, Ivonic and CLR. So you want to start a beauty brand? There's a lot of moving pieces that you have to have in order to successfully launch a cosmetic company. What are the claims that you can make? How do you go about proving them? And how should you approach product development and manufacturing? Also getting products into the hands of your customers. How do you navigate the business side of things? Also making sure that you're regulatory compliant and also protecting yourself from potential lawsuits down the line. There's so much to know and I know for beauty founders, especially for those who don't have experience in the cosmetics industry, finding all the right information can be challenging you have to have in order to successfully launch a cosmetic company. What are the claims that you can make? How do you go about proving them? And how should you approach product development and manufacturing? Also getting products into the hands of your customers. How do you navigate the business side of things? Also making sure that you're regulatory compliant and also protecting yourself from potential lawsuits down the line. There's so much to know and I know for beauty founders, especially for those who don't have experience in the cosmetics industry, Finding all the right information can be challenging and expensive. This is my attempt to put everything all in one spot to help make things easier for everyone. Welcome to our e-summit brought to you by the EcoL, an extension of our greater free e-conference series. My name's Jen and I will be today's MC and moderator. Some housekeeping before we get started. This conference is being live streamed both on Discord and our YouTube channel. To get the most out of the conference, you'll need to be on Discord and be sure to be in the Summit Text channel. That's where the conference conversation will be happening and where I'll be looking for questions for the Q&A portions of each of the presentations. If you had issues accessing our Discord, I'll also be looking at the YouTube chat for questions as well, but I will be prioritizing prioritizing questions that come in on Discord. Don't wait to ask your questions, ask them as they come to you. I will be keeping track for the Q&As. We will also be uploading PDF slides for each of the presentations, which will be on the replay page and you'll receive that to your email tomorrow. If you would like to network via audio with other attendees, we encourage you to use the Lounge Voice channel. Massive thank you to our Summit sponsors for supporting our e-conference initiative. Thank you to our bronze sponsors, Ivonic and CLR Berlin, and our media partner, Beauty Matter. Our sponsors are what helps us keep our e-summits free and accessible to anyone who wants the information. Also, big thank you to our speakers for today for donating your time and expertise to help make this event possible. All of the speakers here today are people who I have a lot of admiration for. So for you guys, if you're a brand founder, each of them would be really great resources for you. And our final big thank you to Julia Ruby from Ruby's Resources for continuing to help with I mean, every single one of our e-summits and helping us with our Discord outside of our summits and also including uh, our summits. Uh, Julia went and set up our whole Discord page to look 
like what it currently does. So thank you so much, Julia, for all of your continued support for what we're doing. And if you're not already, Julia has an Instagram page, which you can follow at Ruby's Resources. As mentioned, this eSummit is part of our Greater eConference initiative. So far, we've hosted two conferences on sustainability, two on sun care, one on safety, and one on hair care. Our next eSummit will be focused on skin care, which will be happening in February. Stay tuned for details. A common critique of industry events is that they're either too expensive, geographically exclusive, or close their eyes to misinformation or all of the above. We put this event together and all of our other e-summits to demonstrate how accessibility makes a difference. This is our attempt to help democratize accurate information for the cosmetic sector. If you'd like to support what we're doing, please share. Whether it's letting your network know that you're attending, sharing the replays, or sharing some of what you've learned today. If you're on Instagram sharing in your stories, I'll be sharing back. So thank you to everyone already who've shared on there and other platforms as well, including LinkedIn. Kicking off, so you want to start a beauty brand? I wanted to highlight someone who's had incredible success as a brand founder, who started small and landed big, achieving the dreams so many founders aspire to being acquired. For our first presentation of Business 101, we have Marie Drago from Galini. Thank you so much for registering for our eSummit. I hope you learn a lot, get something helpful out of this eSummit, and enjoy the day. Without further ado, let's get started. Our first speaker of the day is Mary Drago, PharmD, doctor of pharmacy, and the founder of Galani Microbiome Skincare. The brand was launched in 2016 following Mary's discovery of the Marie, I'm sorry, discovery of the importance of the skin microbiome in beauty. Today, the brand caters to sensitive skin, scalp, and vulvas with 23 products and four patents. Galani was acquired by the Shiseido Group at the end of 2022, and Marie Drago is now the Chief Creative Officer in charge of innovation. Without further ado, here's the presentation. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Marie Drago. I am the founder of a skincare brand called Galine Microbiome Skincare. And today I am delighted to talk to you a little bit about business in beauty and how to get from an idea to a business. Obviously, this is a very wide subject, so uh, I can only do some top line things, but at least give you everything that you need to think about when you want to create your business. So a little bit about me, uh, as you can hear, I'm quite French and also I have a double diploma. So I'm a doctor in pharmacy, which gives me a good technical background and I have a master's degree in entrepreneurship and I have experience mostly in skincare startup actually uh, in France, in Ireland and in the UK. And in 2016, I decided to create my own brand. I would going to call it Galine Microbiome Skincare. And I was lucky enough uh, to get investment from Unilever Venture uh, as early as 2018. And since last year, we've been acquired by the Shiseido Group in 2022. So what I would like to tell you about today. Uh, so first is you just got an idea how to turn it into a business, how to get money to create this business, how to make money once you got the business and what do you need to run a business on a day to day basis? So first thing first, you've got an idea and you would like to quit your job and go and develop this idea. Uh, first thing I was told and people were right and I not always listen, but get a good lawyer. Uh, if you've got an original idea, get some IP, get a patent maybe. If you've got good names or if you've got a good concept, get a trademark. Uh, and if you develop a formula, own your formula, because if you plan to sell your business in the future, uh, the value of the company will mostly be in the IP. Uh, so get a nice lawyer, someone that knows you well and that will give you some good price and also be able to create the company for you, but also register your IP. Uh, then something that I feel quite strongly about is that a lot of founders don't want to talk about their ideas because they think that we are going to steal it. Uh, I think everyone gets the ideas. What makes the difference is the effort you're going to put into it and work to make it a business. 
So I don't think anyone is going to steal your ID. Uh, but when you talk about it, people will always want to help entrepreneurs and they will also present you to people that can help or they will want to put money uh, on your business or also uh, you are going to be able to refine your ID, talk about it better and better, explain it better and uh, really uh, own it every time. So next step for me would be to write a business plan. So business plan is not really scary. It's just a notebook with everything about your business organized a little bit so that you can show it to people. Uh, and once you put your business plan, you will present your ID or your business a lot and a lot. And I think as much as possible, I did a lot of pitch competition when I created Galine because I'm not a really... I'm not a person that loves to talk in public, so I really needed the exercise. And usually you will be pitching either in your business in three minutes, in 10 minutes, or in 20 minutes. Uh, and every time you choose what are the most important points and what you want to put uh, forward. So a little bit about the business plan. Um, investors will always look at three things. First, usually they look at the ID. Is it a good ID? Is it new? Uh, is it going to be innovative? Then they will uh, look at the people. Do I like this person? Do I want to invest in it? Do I believe that this person can be a big CEO one day? Uh, what team do they have? Solopreneurs are not that cool. So if you can get a co-founder, go for it. But other than that, I was a solo founder and, you know, I had a team around me and I had an ecosystem of people, so that really helped. And then only thirdly, will your ID make money? Uh, and people think that investors only care about money, but that's not true. Uh, they will always look at these three, ID, uh, money and people triangle. So that's what you've got to put in your business plan. So in the id section uh, usually it's a good thing to put a lot about the market size of the market where it's going is it a growing market the concept uh, so what do you propose and how does it translate into what products and how are you going to market these products then the money part so the business model is where is your money going to come from so is it going to be an internet business only on your own website on other people's website are you going for retail are you staying in your own country or are you going worldwide uh, are you planning to sell to rich people or are you planning to sell to everyone that's going to determine what price you want to sell and also what is your cost structure so cost structure is something you've got to get used quite early on uh, it's just quite simple and it's a little excel table where if your product uh, is retailed so sells to people at 100 um, it's if you take the vat out usually in europe it's only 80 and then you're probably going to sell it to retailers and retailers take usually 50 percent margin so you only have 40 left and then you probably paid to make this product. So you probably paid around 10. So you only have 30 uh, your left to run your business, uh, pay your team and make some profit. So be really careful with the cost structure because it's easy when you only have your own website. But as soon as you want to have distributors or retailers, you've got to allow this cost to be absorbed uh, or you're never going to make money. Then uh, the nice part for me was always doing the sales forecast because life is so easy on Excel. Uh, so I would recommend to do it monthly, at least for the first year, and then project to three years, SKU by SKU. And that will give you a production plan. And then the two things people expect in a business plan on the finance side is the PNL, so the profit and loss. Is your project going to make money, uh, be profitable? No one expects you to be profitable the first year, but you have to show that you can be profitable. The kind of business model like Uber, where you never get money, but you just grow the top line, is not cool anymore. So you have to actually generate profit. And then also cash flow. Uh, so I'm not a finance person, so I had a bit of problem 
understanding cash flow, uh, but it's actually when money comes out and uh, comes in and when it comes out. That's what kills 95% of startups. Uh, it's running out of cash, so be very, very careful when you build your business plan about the cash flow, how much money you're going to need, and just rule up some. Everything will cost twice as much and takes twice as long as what you expect. So always give you a good little bit of buffer when you ask for money. And then the people, so the team. And even if you're all by yourself, you probably have people that work with you. Uh, so put all your advisor or, you know, your ecosystem, your supplier, who are you working with? Anyone who can show that actually you are quite structured and you've got this whole ecosystem to support you. And that's your business plan. And for the pitch deck, so the structure is a bit different, but this one is quite standard, I would say. Uh, I always like to start with a problem. So what is the problem? Pollution, blue light. Uh, aging population, something like that. What is the solution and how are you bringing the solution to the problem? And then after that, the strategy by itself, uh, what products are you going to do? How are they going to build into a range? What's your NPD strategy for the future? What is your marketing strategy? Who are you going to talk to? Through what channel? Are you a TikTok company? Or are you a Facebook company? Uh, communication that goes with it and sales so are you going to have distributors think about putting it in your cost structure or are you going to sell direct or are you going to have some rep are you going door to door etc etc uh, then about the team then the money so if this is a pitch deck for an investor make them dream big uh, you've got to show that it's going to be an amazing company uh, just for your information, I was told that when you make them dream about money, American investors automatically take one zero out of your sales figure and divide it by 10, and European investors will divide it by two. So be realistic, but ambitious. And then the timeline where you are, what you already did, what did you unlock already? Do you have a concept? Do you have a product? Do you have some first sales? And what are the next steps for you? And then you ask about money and what you give in exchange. Uh, that's where usually people start talking about valuation. For me, valuation comes as late as possible because the first one who says a number lose. So make the investor talk about valuation first, I would say. So investors, how do you get money? Uh, well, first, you've got to know how much money do you want. So thanks to cost structure and everything, you should know how much you're going to have to pay for things. Uh, how much does your production cost? How much uh, products are you going to have to manufacture in one time? Is it 1,000, 5,000, 10,000? Um, how much is going to be your warehousing? How much money are you spending to send one internet order? How much are you going to pay to acquire a customer on Facebook? And so on. And then that gives you a good pot, a good idea of the pot of money that you need. Uh, I was not always really good at keeping money. Uh, so I made too many rides and doing a rise is such a hassle. So try to get money enough for 18 months. Uh, so that you don't have to do this kind of exercise all the time because you've got a company to run. And so where to go for the money? It all depends of how much money you need and also what you need on top of money. Because to be really honest, money is not that hard to raise. A lot of governments make it easy for investors to recoup their losses in case of losses or to do tax credit or things like that. But for you, as early as possible, try to get more than money. Get money and advice, or money and connection, or money and a good board member, or a good board advisor. Um, I was really lucky not to have to ever pay for my advisor. They paid to be in my company, which is great. So the tickets for, like, let's say, less than 50,000, it's what's called friends, fools, and family. So that are the people closest to you and the easiest to reach. Uh, these ones are nice, they believe in you, they will support you, but only take money that people don't need. 
because you don't want to have to give money back before three years when you are totally in the middle of something else. Uh, and also, um, it's people that are going to be demanding because sometimes they haven't invested in businesses before. So what I like to do is on my board to have an investor um, director that was representing everyone else. So all the questions were going to one guy that would ask the questions instead of having to answer all your investors uh, one by one. Then between, I would say, 50,000 and 500,000, it's probably going to be business angels. So I was lucky to have a lot of business angels uh, as shareholders, and I loved it because they are usually quite professional. Uh, they bring a lot of contacts and they're used to it, and uh, they've got deep pockets. So it's good. Um, business angels are quite easy to find, like you have a lot of clubs where they have business angels Typically, alumni of business schools or women business angels are quite powerful now. So business angel is, for me, the best case scenario. And then from 500 upwards, it's the area of venture capitalist. So I had venture capital very early on, uh, and I was lucky to have nice venture capitalists because venture capitalists are there to get money back with a big ratio, so usually they are looking to make at least five times what they put in. Um, and they will have funds that are three years, five years, so you know they want to grow your company as fast as possible under a lot of pressure, get their money back and get out. So for me, it's only if you need a lot of money that you get VCs, uh, but they've got good contacts, they can open you a lot of doors. Uh, so it's also good money, but be worry for the pressure that they're going to put on you. And then what do you propose for all this money? So that's why I'm not that good, to be honest. I always give shares through um, Capital Rise. So loans are also possible. There's a lot of financial structures that exist country by country. But just for you to know, uh, see quite long term, because at the start, if you're all by yourself, you've got 100% of the company. Uh, don't give too much too soon usually try to give 15% by 15% so that you can uh, do more than one rise. And if people say, but like, I'm giving you all this money, can I get 30% of your company? You say, no, like, for the future of the company, to allow this company to grow more, much more in the future, I cannot give everything from the start, so I'll keep, keep it at 15, 20. Uh, and as I was saying, valuation is a conversation between two people that have probably different ideas. VCs will not let you negotiate your valuation so much. After that, if the price that you believe uh, your company is worth, so take people that believe in the same dream than you. And at the end, you'll get a shareholder agreement and a share purchase agreement. And congratulations, you've got a business. And so with this business, you're going to start to make product and to sell product and to get money out and to get a lot of invoices. So it's just the things to know to run a business on a day-to-day -day basis, you've got your cost structure. Uh, and usually I've got this big Excel file with loads of tabs and every all my finance is on one thing. So my cost structures, all my assumptions. So, you know, uh, how much the factory expect, when the factory expect to be paid, my retailers, when are they going to pay me at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Um, what are my B2C metrics? How many people I want visiting my website? What should be my conversion rate? Uh, how much am I going to spend to get someone on my website? What is to going to be my average basket? All, the, all the, of these things. And what are your KPIs? What is the profit? Uh, how much do you want to spend on logistics? Everything that you're going to monitor probably every week because <laughs> it's money, uh, but at least every month. And then also you've got your sales reports or your sales plan by channel, by SKU, by month, which give you the production plan. So I can talk about production for ages, but that's not the place. Uh, and then, as I was saying, always have monthly your profit and loss and your cash flow and make sure that you never really go, like start to look for money when you don't need money yet. So if you see that your cash flow is going to die in six months, start to get money now because the more desperate you are, the less good conditions you're going to have. 
Et voilà, that's your monitoring dashboard, that's still what we do uh, for Galinée to monitor how the business is doing day to day. And I have a few minutes left, so I thought I was going to share a kind of the tech deck, but that's quite light. Uh, that the things we use for getting a uh, agile business and some things that are cheap to use. So something quite European centric, but I love Xero to do all the accounting. It monitors your all your bank accounts. It matches uh, to when the money gets in or when the money gets out. It generates invoices, purchase order. That's amazing for everything work related. The drive like mail, everything we use Google Workspace and it works really well for us. For everything related to the analysis of our B2C business, we use Metoric that I cannot recommend enough. I love it because you really get amazing insight. For everything related to logistics and to monitor what's happening in our warehouses and all the stock that we have, we use Sin7, a bit complex, but I'm sure there's loads of other nice things, and Canva, uh, cheap, cheerful, and you don't almost need a designer anymore. So that's something. Uh, that I absolutely love. Voilà. It's been a pleasure presenting, and if you've got any questions, I will take them now. And stay tuned. I am just bringing Marie over. To the screen for the Q&A. And to everyone watching on Discord, for some reason, my video is not working. So I'm sorry, Marie. It's going to be just you for the video for this Q&A, but you guys can hear my voice. <laughs> uh, so we had some questions come in. So I'll ask from, uh, from Pam Miles, what about selling? licensing for or selling for licensing the ip formulation to an existing company uh how would you do that so you mean licensing uh your own technology to other companies i think that's what she meant okay uh well congratulations if you've got uh, something to license uh, it's usually a really good business model because you just have something already and you just collect money at the end of every year, which is amazing. Uh, that's a discussion where it's a lot of IP lawyers involved. It's not my specialty, but yes, if you can do it, that's great. If it's in the other direction, so buying or renting technology from other companies, uh, it makes you really dependent on someone else. So it's probably not what I uh, would do for my own business, but that's also probably very good because it means it's a proven technology. Uh, the next question from Discord is for entrepreneurs who might come from a creative rather than a business background, any tips on where to find a business and financial advisor? Uh, so when I decided to create Galine, I was out of business school for a good 15 years, so I really needed a refresher. And I really recommend the Y Combinator business, uh, it's called the Startup School. It's free on uh, on YouTube, the one from 2016, I think is really good, where they tell you everything that you need uh, to run a business. And for me, advisors, I met all of my advisors through just pitching my business plan. Uh, so, you know, like at a dinner party, I was going to talk about my project, show them a little bit, and people would say, oh, like I've got this girl who would be a great co-founder for you or something like that. Uh, and that always worked. I know there's a lot of networking events where you can also find some co-founder people. Uh, I prefer to know people that I know. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's everyone wants to help startup people, so it's not that hard. But you have to own your financials, like you've got to understand how to calculate a margin, uh, how to make a sales projection. Even if you're creative, you should own the money side because it's what makes your business, even if you don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> uh, this next question is from Ricky on YouTube, who asks, what are your thoughts on bootstrapping the business rather than going to investors? 
Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so you hear all your investors always tell you that you should bootstrap for as long as possible before raising money. Uh, and that you should have a concept or you should have a MVP, so minimal viable product, or even you should have some sales or you should have done, um, um, you know, like the kind of website where everyone puts money to get your product in advance. For me, I bootstrapped not that much, actually, because I had no other means to live. So I really had to pay the rent, which means I raised money from the start. And also be careful with this kind of thinking from investors, because as soon as you get some sales, they will put the valuation of your company as a multiple of your sales. And you're going to tell them, look, like I'm really small. That's why I'm raising money. And they will always tell you, yes, but you know, like it's going to be five times your sales number. And so suddenly your valuation drop as soon as you sell the first product, which is a bit ridiculous. So yeah, it's in between. Huh? But sometimes you don't have the choice but to raise money upfront with a PowerPoint. And honestly, you can make dream bigger with just a PowerPoint. Uh, this next question is from Discord again. Firstly, thank you for your presentation. And what inspired you to start your business? Uh, I think I always wanted to start having my own little brand, like, uh, but what the way it happened is that I've always been a very bad employee. So I, I was stroppy, which, uh, like I tended to argue with my bosses a lot because I thought they were wrong. And then I had this ideas, like, and I had the weird autoimmune disease that got me interested in the microbiome before it was cool. Huh? And I was telling this idea to my flatmate nonstop. And he told me, look, Marie, like do a business plan. Uh, and I'll help you finance the company so that just you stop talking about it. And he was my first investor. So thank you, Tom. Uh, another question from YouTube from Alina, who asks, what should be the split between retail versus wholesale? Is it best to try and stay direct to consumers? Uh, that really depends of what you're selling. Uh, uh, I think when it's a product that people are going to buy every four to six weeks because they get out of the product, so typically skincare, uh, I think it's really good to have a good direct uh, consumer business. Makeup and perfume, it's harder because people are not going to repurchase that much. So it's a lot, you know, you pay a lot for acquiring your customer and then you don't hear about them for 12 months. Uh, so that's not as easy. Today, I would say like if you start a business, probably 30% of your sales are going to come from your own website and it should stay that way. Uh, because yes, you're going to give a lot of money as margin to retailers and they will still expect you to do all the hard work of bringing the consumer to buy your product. Um, so ideally, you would go direct uh, for a long time, but even the brands that did so well selling direct, like Glossier uh, or The Ordinary, at some point they've got to go to retail because you cannot do everything yourself and you're, st you're starting to reach this ceiling. But yeah, always keep a good B2C business, not only for the sales and the margin, but also because that's where you can talk directly to your consumer and learn a lot about what they like or don't like about your product. Um, so this next question, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to close the uh, Discord stream because I can't see your questions for some reason, and I will fix it for the next one. But for you guys that are watching on, on Discord, then if you just go and watch on YouTube instead, then you will be able to see the answers there. So I'm just disconnecting there so that I can read the final question that came in. Um, so this one was from Maria who asked, if we've done the FFF investment round, how would you approach up leveling to that angel investor round if our top line revenue is growing, but we are not yet profitable? Should we wait or just go for it? Well, if you can be profitable, you don't need other people bringing you money because you're generating money, which is beautiful. Um, but no, if your sales are growing and you think that you could still grow organically, but you could grow much faster with some investment, that's the perfect timing to go and see business angels. And please be aware that anyway, doing a rise will take you anywhere from six to 12 months. So you've got to see so much in advance. So as soon as you've got good news and you've got a good trajectory, 
go and hunt for money and you're going to get money a lot cheaper than if you start to see like the plateau arriving and you think that to start the machine again, you're going to need money. So you no, know, as uh, soon as you've got good news, go and hunt. And after that, you can always say no to the money a bit later or make them wait, you know. Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have for this Q&A. But I think that Marie is in the YouTube chat. So if you have questions for her, <laughs> she's there. I see you. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I love questions. Go and answer questions. Thank you so much, Maria, for joining. Thanks, Jen. It was a pleasure. Our next presenter is Craig Weiss, who received a BS in biology for Mammoth College. Prior to arriving at Consumer Product Testing Co., Craig held technical positions at Dell Laboratories, Norwich Eden Pharmaceuticals, Procter & Gamble, and Roxanne Laboratories. Craig began his career with Consumer Product Testing Co. Inc. as the vice president of the Analytical Service Division, which was composed of the Microbiology and Analytical Chemistry Departments. In 1999, he became the president of Consumer Product Testing. Craig is active in many trade organizations and is a member of the Independent Beauty Association's Board of Directors, serving as the chairman of its Technical Regulatory Committee. Craig is also a member of the SEC and has served on the Committee on Scientific Affairs, COSA, and PCP, serving on its Scientific Advisory Committee. Additionally, Craig sits on numerous international expert panels, including ICCR and JCCT. And without further ado, Here's Craig's presentation. And I will just say before this gets started, there will be no Q&A. That's live. But if you have questions, I will be emailing them to Craig after the summit. And then I can send out his uh, answers in the email following to anyone who had questions. So still ask your questions. And yeah, without further ado, here's Craig's presentation. Good morning. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Jen for this opportunity to present to you. I'm Craig Weiss, and I will be presenting on cosmetic claims. Today I'm going to discuss why we make claims. I'm going to discuss a little bit of safety claims. I'm not going to go into depth on any one of these subjects because each one of these subjects could be an hour or two, but I will discuss efficacy claims, both subjective efficacy claims and objective efficacy claims. I'm going to give you some examples of claims and I'm going to do some label review. What I've done over the years is call this the Hall of Shame. So, why do we make claims? We want to inform our customers, obviously. We need to stay competitive. And by staying competitive, I mean sell more product. Safety claims are probably the most economical claim you have you can make because you have to do safety testing anyway. So you might as well get a little more bang for your buck by being able to use those safety studies to create claims. I'm sure you've all seen the dermatologist tested. Well, typically dermatologists tested is a human repeated insult patch test or an in-use study where a dermatologist reviews the reports or does the grading and signs off on the report. Hypoallergenic, uh, there's a lot of people saying hypoallergenic is a lot of different things. I like to use something with little regulatory underpinnings. At one time, the agency or the FDA allowed for the term hypoallergenic if an RPT done was, two, was done with 200 subjects and there were no reactions. Safe for contact lens users or ophthalmologist test that is typically run, is typically supported by a safety and use study of a couple of weeks, sometimes two, sometimes four, monitored by an ophthalmologist. Physician tested is just an in-use study monitored by a physician. Pediatrician testing, again, is a in-use study of children with, that is monitored by a pediatrician. Now we're going to move into cosmetic efficacy claims and how you support them. There's lots of different claims out there that really don't need anything more than a formulation type claim. In other words, it contains a product contains aloe. You can make that claim if it's in there. It contains honey, a natural humectant. If, if an ingredient has a cosmetic benefit that you can highlight that's because of the ingredient itself, then you can make the claim. Oil-free, for example. If you don't have any oil in the product, you can make the claim. Then there are performance-based claims. Things like hypoallergenic, dermatologist tested, ophthalmologist tested, suitable for contact lens wearers, which we discussed 
earlier in this presentation, those are safety based. Then you have things like instantly boost hydration by over whatever percentage. That would be a subjective performance claim. And I will get to subjective objective later. Then you have things like uh, in two weeks, consumers perceived a 74% decrease in fine lines and wrinkles. That would be an object, that would be a subjective based claim. So we will get into how they're defined, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what the claims look like and sound like. And under normal circumstances, you really only have to validate or support performance-based claims. Okay, well, I gave you an idea of what type of claims need to be validated and what don't. Let's talk a little bit about what a claim actually is. Well, it's easier, I guess, to say what it's not. A cosmetic claim is not a structure function claim. When you start talking about mechanism of action for your product, you have just crossed the line and you are now a drug. So you have a claim that doesn't talk about structure or function, just appearance, for example, appearance of fine lines and wrinkles. How do you validate it? Well, you have to use a study. We call them efficacy studies, call them claim support studies, however you want to call it, you have to have a study. The advertising of these claims are regulated by the FTC. The difference between the FTC and the FDA, the big difference is the FDA has to go through AG's office in order to get prosecution. Federal Trade Commission doesn't need to do that. They can file suit, they can get injunctions, they can fine you directly. So they are the biggest bear on the block when it comes to claims. Your efficacy studies for your label claims must be restored, uh, supported by a valid study. What does that mean? Well, since there's no regulations on these, on what kind of study you have to run, just that a, an expert in the field feels that it's, a, it's, it's validated, you run an industry standard study, meaning industry standard equipment, which we'll talk about, and industry standard methodologies. And if you're using um, questionnaires, industry standard questionnaires and validation techniques. The FDA does regulate things like ingredient statements, warnings, uh, anything, anything that um, has to be on the label, they do regulate. Okay, so now you're, now you're getting ready to set up your study. What do you need to prove? You need to prove that you have statistical significance. In other words, the data, if you're producing numbers, whether it be by questionnaire or whether it be by um, instrument by instrumentation or expert clinical grading, you have to prove that it is a real difference, and that requires statistical significance. Statisticians measure that with lots of different methods. There's a couple listed on the slide. And as importantly, you have to prove clinical relevance. Can the changes made by the product be seen? In other words, is it clinically relevant? Can, can the subject who's using the product see it? You need both of these in order to make that claim and if you're challenged to support the fact that you have the data you need to make the claim. Okay, study design. That's very, very important. Regardless of what type of study you're running, study design is extremely important. This is this, it, it's the key to the strength of your claim that you make. If you don't design your study appropriately, then there's room for anybody who's challenging the claim, whether it be in court, in the court of public opinion at, at some place like the NAD. If it's not designed well, you don't have a study that you can that, that supports your claim. As easy as that. There are multiple types of studies. I'm going to go through a few of the more common study types so you have a feel for what type of study you may want to run. First part of study design is blinding. Are you going to blind the study? There's several different kinds of blinding. Blinding typically is the study participants don't know the identity of the test product. That's important because then there's no brand bias. On top of that, you can have double blinding, which not only does the study participants not know, but the study personnel who are running it don't know. It's typically done in drug trials. For the sake of cosmetics, it's not done as often, but it can be done. You have different needs for different types of studies depending on what you're testing. You can go with a monadic design, which is sometimes called baseline control. You have the baseline measurement, and then you have a measurement at the far end of the study. You can have intermediate measurements. This study is used when you really don't need a control. And I'll give you an example. It's on the slide, moisturization. If you are not testing a specific ingredient, 
for a moisturizer, you're testing the whole product, for example, then a placebo is really not necessary. And in fact, it, it hurts the study because any placebo you're going to make is going to be a similar product. If you're using an oil and water or water, water and oil emulsion, a cream, a lotion, however you want to put it, you put it on your skin, what are you going to use as a placebo? Now, in certain instances, you may want to use it on treated control, but for the most part, these type of studies are run in a monadic fashion with a baseline control. Another common used study design in cosmetics are crossover studies. Crossover studies are really important if you're comparing one product to another, especially things like if you have a new and approved product and you want to prove it's new and improved, crossover studies are ideal. You take your volunteers and you split them into groups or cohorts. Each group is assigned a study product to start the study. Each product is used first by at least one of the cohorts, simply because there's something called the first use bias effect. Especially in questionnaire studies, people tend to rate the first product better. So this way you nullify that effect. And in the case of instrumentation, if you get a slight bounce at the beginning that doesn't quite go away a washout period, this should even it out. You take a measurement, you assign product, then each group goes into a use period, whatever it is, two, four weeks. They come back, you take another measurement, then they go on rest phase for whatever the protocol calls for as far as rest phase. Then they come back, you take another measurement, you assign the next product to them, they use that product, come back after the use period and get a measurement done. And each group or cohort repeats this until they've seen all the products. The big strength of this is each group sees each product. Really, really well, really used for things like pain relief or uh, anti, you can't really use this for anti-wrinkle effect, but something like pain relief, it's perfect for. And again, if you're comparing new product versus old product, it's ideal for it. Now we're gonna discuss placebo controlled study. Typically done only on drug products. Occasionally you can do it in nutritional supplements and occasionally it's done in cosmetics, specifically if you want to prove that an ingredient in a formula does something, you can test it with or with uh, the formula with or without the ingredient, and that will tell you whether the ingredient does anything, and you can do that in, in a placebo-controlled study. You can run it double-blind or single-blind. Typically, it's run double-blind in drugs where the investigator doesn't know, and the subject doesn't know whether they're getting placebo or product. In nutritional supplements, you can run it as a single blind, and typically in cosmetics is run a single blind study where only the invest where the subject does not know whether they're getting test product or placebo. So now that we know different study designs, let's talk about the actual support necessary for a claim. You have subjective support. And again, earlier I alluded to the way you word a subjective support typically subjective support is done by a questionnaire for example two week in two weeks the consumers perceived x degree reduction in fine lines and wrinkles long wearing can be done this way and you have sensorial based claims that have to be done that way for example safe for sensitive skin if you're talking about burning stinging and itching since it's a sensorial it's a subjective claim, although it does have some objective ways of looking at sensitive skin or reactive skin. So that is really a gray area in whether it's subjective or objective, depends on how you look at sensitive skin. You can use calibrated graders to see if they can see the change. It's very important that you see the change for your clinical re relevance. So in most studies, you'll have at least some objective, even in, a, even in a totally subjective study, you'll have some objective data. Objective support. You have bioinstrumentation, instruments for looking at things like wrinkles, hydration, things of that nature. That is objective support. Instrumentally boosts hydration, those um, reduction in wrinkles, those are objective claims, and you need objective support. You can also produce this if you have very, very good trained expert calibrated graders because their numbers will be the same for each change because they're calibrated. 
you can use that as both objective and subjective support. I alluded to bioinstrumentation, so let's talk a little bit about bioinstrumentation. It won't take a lot of time on this, but it's important that you understand what each instrument does. For moisturization, you have things like uh, capacitance and conductance instruments. These are really good for testing humectant-based products, in other words, products that instill moisture into the skin. You have things like the Nova meter, the corneometer, the moisture meter. I'm sure there's others out there. They work by putting low voltage electricity into the skin, seeing how fast it transfers through the skin or how much the skin can hold. These claims are hydration based. Then you have transepidermal water loss, which looks at how much water is coming off your skin. It's a function of barrier and products that make a lot of skin protecting claims or barrier claims are tested this way and need to be tested this way. You have the TEWL or transepidermal waterless meter, there's Vapamed, there's Servamed or Vaporimeter, there's a lot of different instruments out there, but these are ideal for testing uh, barrier function products, even skin protectants. But when you start talking about healing and barrier function, you have crossed the line into skin protectants, which is a monograph drug category. So you have to be very careful how you make your claim so you don't become a drug if you want to stay a cosmetic. Also, I read articles over the years to talk about ideally you would test both with both methodologies. That's really not economically feasible. It becomes very expensive. Um, I would be happy if you would. It's you know it's a great study to run, but it's really not typically economically feasible. Let's talk a little bit about uh, wrinkle reduction, as that's still the largest claim or the most requested claim is anti-aging and all anti-aging studies have wrinkle reduction as a component of it. So let's talk a little bit about that. For wrinkle reduction, you can do uh, wrinkle reduction by profilimetry, uh, which here's two instruments that we just haven't used. You have the AVA 3D and you have the Primos 3D. Both of those instruments work on uh, multiple photographs in an arc around the around the area of interest and then a computer integrates those images into a 3D model and from that you can get everything from the number of wrinkles to the depth of the wrinkles, width of the wrinkles, length of the wrinkles, it gives you a lot of different parameters to look at. These are the state-of-the-art ways of quantifying wrinkles. Then there's other instrumentation like the Voigt system. The only place I know that is used is in one lab in England and the skin visiometer, which works on putting a dye on the skin and looking at how much dye is left. And then you have older technology like uh, image analysis of silicone replicas. Um, it has its pluses and minuses. However, when you start making silicone replicas, you have to worry about shrinkage of the silicone and deformation of the wrinkle by the technique of putting on the silicone. So it really depends on who's doing it, how well that comes out. But I think it's older technology and I don't think it's used all that much anymore. Then you have calibrated expert graders, which is used from time to time. Again, I always recommend you add them to a study because if they can see it, you can see it. It takes care of your clinical relevance. and You don't need to add a questionnaire or do a home use test on top of this study. Again, these are the largest group of claims is anti-aging, but wrinkle reduction is in all of them. So you might as well understand upfront what's involved in making a wrinkle reduction claim. As part of anti-aging or not even just anti-aging, I do occasionally get people that are looking for firmness claims, just firmness or just elasticity claim. There are a lot of ways of looking at uh, firmness and elasticity. They are two sides of the same coin. You can't have more firmer skin and more elastic skin because if you're more elastic, you're less firm. So let's talk about methodologies. There's torsion machines, suction machines, like the cutometer that pulls out my new pieces of skin and measures rebound time. Dermaflex that actually does the same type of measurement or twistometer, which actually twists the skin and looks at how long it takes for the deformation to go back. Then you have Ballastometer. Ballastometers were really big at one point. I don't think they are anymore. But basically that blows a puff of air at the skin and looks at um, the response of the skin. For example, if you threw a, a pebble in the, in the water really high, you get a lot of 
of lot, a lot of disturbance. If you threw it very low, you get less of a disturbance. It's kind of how the ballastometer measures things. And then there's the old-fashioned technology, which is pinch recoil. In other words, people actually pinch the skin and try to time the recoil of the skin. So if you're doing firmness or elasticity, again, these are the instruments you'd be looking at. There's other instrumentation out there. There's instrumentation for specifically just firmness. However, in our tests of that instrument, we don't find it as reliable as looking at elasticity and cali uh, calibrating firmness based on that or calculating firmness based on elasticity. Another claim that is really important is tone measure, skin tones. I hear all the time, oh, I want to prove even in it's the skin tones. There's lots of ways of doing it. You have people that want to reduce age spots or the reduction of, uh, reduction of the appearance of age spots for cosmetic people. If you're looking at age spots, you can use regular instruments that just measure the LAB values. Uh, LAB, just, there's just different uh, changes in color. Um, so the measurements of LAB are typically done by things like a Minolta chromometer, IMS Smart Probe, or a data color. And I'm sure that, again, there are others. I, there are lots and lots of instruments. I didn't want to create an exhaustive list because all I'd be doing is reading brand names right now. There are other ways of looking at it. This is very popular today is digital photography with image analysis, which is a very good way of looking lar at larger areas. You can do this, but just make sure that whatever program, computer program, is doing the digital analysis, it's compliant with what the FDA would want to see. For example, there, that the images can't be changed without an audit trail. So they know that the image that you're using is a real image. So if you're going to do that, just make sure you're using somebody who's reputable and they're not using something like Photoshop as the, at, the, at the rear end so they can change everything. There are competitive technologies. Again, you can use expert graders. And the claims, as I said, are skin tone and basically age spot reduction, also sometimes used as part of an anti-aging protocol. Now we're going to discuss photography in general, clinical photography. Again, clinical photography is different than the glamour shots you may be looking for. There are laboratories like mine that can do both. There are laboratories that only do one or the other. But clinical photography or things like the Vizia CR, CR2, and I think now we're up to CR3, which gives you the ability to fix a person's face in that little box you see there and take I think it's 17 different lighting and filtering parameters. So you can look at different areas of the skin under different lighting, and each lighting shows a slightly different view. There's Charm View, which is a digital electron microscope. You have EpiFlash systems, which is just a standardized flashing system. And the nice part of it is you can use photography for both qualitative and quantitative. If you're ever challenged, it's really nice to have qualitative photos saying, here's a before and after. I know everyone wants before and afters for their advertising too. So you get, as I say, more bang for your buck by doing clinical photography in a study. And quantitatively, you can certainly measure color really, really well using a photographic system if you have the right software on the back end where you can look at color fade, color change, pixel by pixel. So you really get a really good quantitative number. You can also look at different structural areas based on photography. We already talked a little bit about image analysis for wrinkle reduction in 3D. Well, that's 3D photos. You can also do color the same way. You can look at um, pores this way. You can look at cleanliness this way. It's a phenomenal methodology to use and have part of your study if for nothing else than to have a photographic record of your product's performance. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about subjective claims. As I said earlier, anything that has a sensation, a skin sensation, a smell, a feel, burning, stinging, and itching, those are all organoleptic, so they're subjective because they're sensory. Then you have subjective claims based on questionnaires. Typically, it's a benefit 
uh, positive benefit statement with, you know, the seven, five or seven boxes about agreeing, disagreeing. These have to be worded as weaker claims because you can't give a real percentage. You can talk about a percentage of the pa panel and what they felt. It's very helpful to have both subjective and objective as claim support, but it may not be economically feasible. All right, now let's talk about actual claims. I just picked products at random, took some pictures. Some of these pictures are fairly old, so I do apologize. But on this particular product, it talks about being hypoallergenic. To my way of thinking, that's an HREPT of 200 subjects with no reactions. Or an in-use study, when you talk about sensitive skin, you can also run a quote-unquote sensitive skin panel, REPT. For the most part, you lose part of the sensitive skin definition when you do that, because the definition of burning, stinging, and itching that may or may not be accompanied by a visible reaction is lost, because if you have multiple patches on someone's back, which is how a patch test is run, how are they going to be able to define which one is burning, stinging, and itching? So if you're doing something that talks about burning, stinging, and itching, HREPT is not the ideal method. But you can do a sensitive skin REPT. It talks about moisturization. Now, I'm not going to go through the ingredients, all of them, but it does say dimethicone now, as, as its active ingredient. So dimethicone is more of an occlusive. It's not a humectant. It blocks the pores. So ideally, you would do TEWL, but you could do TEWL and or the conductance type measures that we talked about earlier. Here's two products that look virtually identical. You have a branded product and an unbranded product. The claims are reducing age spots. We already talked about using a chromometer for that. Increased firmness. Again, you look at viscoelasticity any way you want, or you can use a firmness meter. But again, viscoelasticity is probably a better measure because it's more consistent. And non-comedogenic, that's really where you count pimples, comedone. That is typically done, the dermatologist actually doing count by global, in, uh, global comedone counts. It's an in-use study. Here's another example. This one's ideal because it talks about having a Q10 complex in the product. So it's a formulation-based claim, which we goes back to the very beginning of this presentation. Proven to moisturize, firm, and tighten skin. So you have both a moisturization portion of the, stu of the study, and you have to run viscoelasticity as well. And then there's a claim in two weeks, visibly firmer, more toned skin. So visibly firmer. You have to have a viscoelasticity that does work in your study at two weeks. And more toned is the same as visibly firmer. So at two weeks, you have to have measurements for that particular claim. Again, you have a branded product and a un uh, store brand product. Understand that regardless of whether you're going to go private label or you're going to go your brand, you have to do the study. You can't just say, well, I'm the same as this brand. So fine lines and wrinkles, image analysis study we discussed, non-comedogenic, I just discussed global comedone counts pre and post use on a significant number of subjects, at least 30. That will give you your non-comedogenic and moisturization we already discussed tool or uh, TWL or conductance capacitance measurements. Here we go with what I would what I would term my hall of shame. If your products are in here, I truly apologize. I do not intend to malign anybody. Some of these are older photos. They may have corrected the issues since these were taken, but it talks about botanical oils, which is a formulation claim, which is fine. Then it starts talking about protective, which is an OTC monograph claim. So it's possible it's non-compliant because uh, there's no drug facts box on and you don't have an active ingredient listed. Talks about penetration. The second you start talking about a penetration, you are by definition a drug. This, this particular label is interesting because it talks about a 24-hour cellular energizing cream. Now this is, I believe, the name of the product, but it also could be interpreted as a claim. And if it's interpreted as a claim, I don't know how you substantiate energizing the cells. Then it makes a firmness claim. 
So you'd have to run a viscoelasticity or firmness study. Talks about cellular re re renewal. There are studies like the Daniel Chloride Cellular Renewal Study that will give you evidence of increased cellular renewal, but you have to run them if you're going to make that kind of claim. This label is a very, this is a very old photo first off. Just want to let you know in front that I, I don't know if this is still sold, but it makes an anti-wrinkle claim. Anti-anything is really not a claim that every regulator will allow you to make because it's not an appearance claim. It's saying it's anti-wrinkle. It stops wrinkling. That's a, a structure function claim. It's a drug. Not every regulator looks at it like that. Not every jurisdiction, not even every, every regulator in a single ju jurisdiction. But understand that anti-anything can get you into trouble. Results in minutes. That means you'd have to have an evaluation of those wrinkles in minutes. But here's what really, really upsets me about this label. Talks about the three anti-aging technologies of GABA, Matrixol, and hyaluronic acid. Wrinkle reduction claims can't be made based solely on ingredients. So we're really talking about reduction of wrinkles. Even if each ingredient has a great record for it, you're not testing the final formulation. And many regulators would say, you need to test the final formulation for a claim like that. This label is one of my all-time favorites. It talks about detoxifying for a bubble bath. I'm not quite sure if you can support a claim of detoxifying without making it a drug, even if you could support it. Draws out impurities. Again, definitely not a cosmetic claim, and I'm not even sure how you'd support that claim. And restores lost minerals is either a supplement, nutritional supplement claim, if you're going to eat the, if you're going to drink the double bubble bath, or it is a drug claim. This label I, I include only because it says anti-cellulite. The FTC takes a very, very, very jaundiced view on any anti-cellulite claim, even if it's not as bold and upfront as anti-cellulite cream. Even if you're talking about the appearance of cellulite, they really look deeply into these. Um, every few years, you'll see a bunch of le regulatory letters come from the FTC on anti-cellulite products. And this one also talks about retinol and vitamin K, which are formulation-based claims, which are fine. This product is absolutely amazing. If you take a look at the first image, it talks about 37 skin conditions this will work for. That, those are all drug claims. That's why I said possible drug claim, drug claim, drug claim. That's pretty much it. But it does also talk about uh, renews skin. Again, you'd have to look at cellular renew renew renewal studies like the Danzel Chloride Cellular Renewal Study. Here's my contact information. I apologize for not being able to do this live and having to record it. Unfortunately, that was not an option for me today. If you have any questions, you can send them to Jen and she'll forward them to me or you can send them to me directly and I will try to answer them as quickly as I can. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and have a good rest of your, your seminar. Our next speaker is Erica Douglas, who's managed to find a creative niche in the beauty industry as a cosmetic chemist who also has a proven track record in marketing and brand development. She built her career using her passion to push for innovation in stagnant areas of product development and is globally recognized as an expert in the beauty and personal care space. Erica earned her Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering from Stanford University and spent the first decade of her career working for leading manufacturers as a product formulation chemist, quality manager, and regulatory specialist. Her desire to understand the full scope of building successful brands in beauty space led her to Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, where she earned her MBA. She spent most of her career working on the Organic Root Simulator brand, where she worked her way up the ladder to Director of Research and Development. In 2014, Erica became the co-founder and CEO of MSEED Group, a product development, contract manufacturing, and business marketing management company focused on providing strategic growth solutions to aspiring entrepreneurs in establishing business in beauty and personal care. 
While most of Erica's time is spent as the brains behind the brands managing the multi-million dollar B2B full service company, Erica's public persona as Sister Science has grown into a globally recognized brand through social media, educational workshops, and fun social media videos. And without further ado, here is Erica's presentation. Good morning and welcome to the next session of So You Want to Start a Beauty Brand. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Jen for inviting me to be a part of this conference. I think this is an excellent resource and I hope that you can take home something valuable today. So uh, in this session, we're going to talk um, just a little bit at a very high level about what you need to know as a beauty brand working with a contract manufacturer. So first and foremost, it's probably important for you to understand uh, why in the world I am sharing this information with you? Well, uh, my name is Erica Douglas. I am the CEO and founder of MC Group. Uh, I'm also probably better known on socials as Sister Scientist, and I am a cosmetic chemist who has worked on the brand side and now on the contract manufacturing side for 15 plus years in the beauty business. Um, MC Group is, has been, was founded in 2014, and we've been in business uh, working with budding beauty brands from all over the world. Um, and essentially, the ethos of MC Group has been to take the knowledge and the skill set that me and my team learned working with brands in corporate and applying that for uh, startup brands mostly. And so our mission has been to provide strategic growth solutions for aspiring entrepreneurs and established businesses in the beauty space. And so uh, my team is compiled of not only chemists and operations and supply chain gurus, but also marketing and business development experts who have also worked on the brand side. And we combine all of that experience under one umbrella at MC Group. And so our primary uh, business is small batch and scale contract manufacturing. We also offer research and product development, regulatory services, marketing and branding strategy, and also some business development services. So I hope that uh, if you are in the market for um, working with a contract manufacturer that you consider us. And I hope that what I share with you today will be helpful with whoever you may work with in the future. Um, and so you are getting a behind the scenes look on kind of how we engage with clients and what you need to know in order to be successful at um, really building a relationship with a contract manufacturer. So uh, here's a high level view of what we're going to cover today. First, we're going to cover what you need to do to assess your brand needs and goals. That should be the very first thing you understand before even contracting or looking for a contract manufacturer. This is a very important step one. Uh, we'll also talk about collaborating on the formulation process and then what scale up and production actually looks like and what you need to know. And also understanding the cost to do business. Um, so many times people don't understand this basic concept. Uh, and, and I want to go over some things at a very high level there. And then who's responsible for what? Your manufacturer versus you as the brand. From a legal perspective, the government uh, looks at things differently as far as who's responsible for what. So we'll go through that. And then just a, a brief stint on communication and contracts. So important. And then there should be some time for Q&A at the end. So let's jump into it. When you are assessing your brand's needs and goals, there are a few things that important things that I would say you need to understand. First, what is your current and future product range? So in today's world, your brand may have, you know, let's just say four products, a shampoo, a conditioner, and maybe two styling products. But when you are deciding on what type of contract manufacturer you want to uh, work with, it's important that you understand what your you know, your goals are to expand that product range uh, because there are manufacturers that may only do skincare or only hair care or only have the capabilities to produce creams and liquids. Um, maybe you want to do a shampoo bar. That particular type of service may not be offered at all contract manufacturers. Aerosols, sachet packets, tubes, things of that nature, uh, when it comes to deciding what type of packaging your product is in, also very important questions to ask a contract manufacturer. You have to understand that uh, one contract manufacturer may not fit all of your needs, but understanding what their capabilities are will help you to understand uh, 
how far they can scale with you and what type of flexibilities you have when you're growing your brand. Also, it's important to know that certain products uh, do fall under, at least in the in the U.S., fall under the FDA at, or fall under the FDA as fall under um, FDA regulate products such as acne, dandruff. Those are required to be manufactured in an FDA uh, reg or registered plant, and and that is very different than some of the other contract manufacturers where the FDA is not at this particular time uh, does not have oversight on all co cosmetic manufacturers in the US. So important to understand whether your contract manufacturer has certain types of certifications, uh, what their actual equipment can fill as far as like what type of packaging they can fill, and then also which formulations um, they specialize in and what they can actually scale up. Uh, also understanding uh, what are your target consumers needs and um, priorities. And, Here's the thing, we all want everything, but when it comes down to making key decisions in which products um, or, or what attributes you decide to keep or not keep in your products, it's important to understand what is important to your consumer. Efficacy, ingredient standard, maybe there's some consumers who only want clean beauty type products, but then there are other consumers who uh, who don't care as much when it comes to natural or clean beauty. Um, do they have a specific price point? If that's the case, then you need to be walking into your pricing backwards to um, understand what is the maximum you can even your product can cost so that you can price your product uh, appropriately for your consumer set. Uh, maybe uh, your consumer likes certain types of packaging or they are buying into your brand mission. So understanding those things are important because that will trickle down into you know what your contract manufacturer can or can't do and understanding uh, those limitations will be important in how you choose your contract manufacturer. Um, also, it's important to understand what your current and forecasted volumes are. So uh, at MC Group, we work with a lot of startup companies. And so we work with brands that are starting with, you know, maybe 500 units at a time per product. There are other contract manufacturers that have much higher minimums. Sometimes they say, eh, you have to be making at least 10,000 units. And so um, I think when you are ready to work with a contract manufacturer, you have growth in your mindset. The way to determine whether you are ready to work with a contract manufacturer is if your demand for your product outweighs your ability to manufacture it on your, your own, if you are somebody who is manufacturing or producing your own product in the beginning. So that means if you are making product in your kitchen um, and you can't keep up with demand, then it is time to start engaging contract manufacturer. Or if you are looking to start from scratch, but you only can produce a limited quantity in the beginning in your first runs, then it's very important to find a contract manufacturer who specializes in small batches um, and can price it at a point that's affordable to where you can still sell it to your customer as a prop at a profit. So understanding um, your, your volumes is very important because if you're coming in at 500 units or 1,000 units versus you need 10,000, 25,000 units, those may be two different types of contract manufacturers. But what's also important is finding somebody who can start, can, can accommodate you where you are but has the ability to grow and scale with you over time. Um, and sometimes you may have to switch contract manufacturers once you get to a certain um, uh, certain volumes in your ordering. Sometimes you can't find a contract manufacturer that does both small and large quantities in their runs. Um, and But that is for you to assess where your priorities are in your business. That is one of the unique value propositions we have at MC Group. We work with the companies who are doing 500 units at a time, and we work with companies who are putting in you know, 10,000, 20,000 plus uh, purchase orders at a time. Um, also, you need to understand where are you selling these products because the requirements and the needs of a retail channel versus direct to consumer or online e-commerce sales, very different. And so um, you have to understand where you expect to sell these products. Also regionally, there are different regulatory requirements in different areas of the world. EU has different standards compared to Canada, compared to the US. And so if you have the foresight that you may be selling in a different part of the world at some point, it's important to express that and communicate that with your contract manufacturer because it's very hard to change these brands and the formulations to meet other countries' standards if you are doing it on the back end versus doing it on the front end.
Uh, another important question to ask yourself is, do you plan on bringing on investors or selling your company? Investors often look for intellectual property or look for the look for who owns the intellectual property in a company. And so formula ownership becomes very important here. Um, not, and this is something that is often not said up front, most contract manufacturers don't offer formula ownership specifically for smaller brands. So it's very important that you ask those questions on the front end and uh, find a way to negotiate uh, what that may look like. Uh, in our world, uh, brands can own formulas uh, after they have produced so many units with us, they also have the option to buy them out directly. Um, and so setting those pri um, those parameters of what the path to formula ownership looks like is extremely important to understand at the beginning before you start engaging with a, with a contract manufacturer. Um, and then how profitable do you need to be? This is extremely imperative to understand because oftentimes I will get companies that want to sell, you know, their uh their skin care uh you know face cream and they say they want to be the economical brand they want to be an affordable brand they want their their moisturizing cream to be ten dollars in a jar with a box embroidered and all these things but the thing is to make a ten dollar product quality product uh with the, all the bells and whistles and you're only making five hundred a thousand units is practically impossible and so it's important to understand what the cost is to the brand what it's going to cost you to uh, make or to buy a finished product from a contract manufacturer and then put your markup on it to make sure that you are earning profit when you sell to a customer. And so that means your products have to be priced appropriately and based off of the cost of goods of your formula or your product. Um, and if it's too expensive and price point is very important in your company or in your brand, then you may have to, um, you know, make some concessions in order to ensure that the cost uh, makes sense for the price point. And so you have to work backwards into that. So make sure that you understand uh, your financials when, um, when engaging with a contract manufacturer so you know what your target price should be. Now, going into the formulation process. Um, Brands come in at different places with their formulations. Sometimes we have brands that have existing formulas that they're bringing from other contract manufacturers or maybe something they've been making in their kitchen. And then we have other brands that are starting from scratch. Either way, it is very important that you have a detailed product brief for your contract manufacturer to understand what your expectations are of every product, even if it is an existing product. We wanna know where it's positioned, what the functionality is, uh, the physical attributes. Is it red? Is it creamy? Is it, you know, um, is it transparent, the color, all the things? What restrictions are there? Maybe you don't want to use parabens in your formula. That should all be written out on this product brief. And the more detailed you are and the more clear you are about what, is, um, what you can allow in this product and what this product needs to do, the better experience you will have with getting to the finish line and finalizing your formula when working with a contract manufacturer. And understanding your priorities of you know, where, what your non-negotiables are versus where you can make some concessions to get to a finished product. Also, it's important to understand what types of formulations your contract manufacturer offers. Uh, stock or private label formulas tend to be formulations that um, the contract manufacturer owns and they are just putting your label on it and they may allow you to add some your own fragrance or key ingredients versus custom formulations are made from scratch and are formulated to the specific needs of a brand. In most cases, we see that our brands have a combination of stock and custom formulas. Uh, stock formulas are usually cheaper to bring to market um, versus custom formulation requires additional testing, uh, time, and uh, iterations to make sure that you're you know, getting the product that you want. Um, and so also, understanding the formulation standards that they have. Um, you know, what are the clean beauty standards? And there's no real government agency that regulates this. So what are your brands, what is your brand's definition of what clean means? And making sure that your contract manufacturer is clear on what is allowed to be used in your product and what is not. Um, ingredient sourcing, are they using organic materials, natural materials, ethically sourced? Um, and then of course, formula ownership, which we discussed a little bit earlier uh, in the conversation. So these are all types of things that you should be discussing uh, before you start the formulation process. Now, when you receive your samples, you want to evaluate each formula meticulously. Um, I mean, everything from the color, the smell, uh, what it looks like when <laughs> you left it sitting in the bathroom for 10 days, um, because 
Um, of, and of course, the efficacy did it work? Did it do what you needed it to do on your hair, or your skin, or your body? Um, because your feedback is extremely important to how the contract manufacturer makes additional um, changes to that formula. And so the process is we give you a sample, you evaluate it, you provide feedback, we use your feedback to make changes, and then you get additional samples. And that process repeats itself over and over until we get to a formula that um, we can finalize and approve based off of your the brand's um, approval of that formulation. Now, what's also important is to make sure that your CM has um, can verify the formula um, and the quality testing protocols. This means that once you have a formula that is final and that you want to move into production, that the standards are written and documented to every last detail and there are parameters set to where we are approving that this formula can be within a certain pH, a certain viscosity, uh, you know, kind of the allotment of how light or dark the color can be. Uh, all of those standards are documented and approved by the brand. And then there are, of course, quality testing protocols such as stability testing, challenge testing, and in some cases you may need additional tests such as HRIPT, which is allergen um, testing, toxicology, and then you always want to have claim substantiation. Now, this is a little murky because uh, it's the brand's responsibility to ensure that the claims are substantiated, and some contract manufacturers help with this process more than others. So this is also a good question to ask your manufacturer, what is the extent of how they can provide data and information to help you with your claim substantiation um, and, uh, and how they assist in that process. And so once uh, the formula has passed the, the, proto the quality protocols and you have verified that this is indeed the final formula that you wanna to bring to market, you're signing off on the standards and um, and that is what moves forward into production. And once that is signed off on, there's no going back, right? If you go back, there are usually additional fees to change things, but you're basically locked in at that point. So as we move into preparing for scale up and production, uh, there are a few things that you will need to look at. You want to, you're gonna be in a place where you need to choose your packaging. Uh, in most cases, the CM will provide stock or custom packaging options, and they have to compare uh, test the compatibility of that formula in your packaging, which can add additional, um, it, it should be part of the, the standard stability testing, which often takes, you know, anywhere from, you know, can be up to 18 weeks in some cases. So you want to make sure you're allotting time for stability testing of your formula before it's actually going into production. So that's important to keep in mind when working through your timelines. Um, also, if you're a small brand, do not, I don't think it's best to invest in custom packaging until you have the volumes to justify the cost of custom packaging. It often comes from overseas, it's often more expensive, um, and also causes some logistical issues. So if you're a, a, a budding brand starting from the beginning, it's much easier, better for you to stay in stock options until your brand is at a point where it can afford custom options. Also, this is where you will design your label, which is often this fun part, right? Branding, marketing, how do you want your brand to be visible to the world? Uh, your contract manufacturer will provide you with uh, the weight, the, the net weight of the product, the ingredient panel, the warning, suggested claims, but everything else rely, the brand has to come in, up with on the on the copy. So uh, be prepared to hire a label designer uh, who can help you with this process or a copywriter who can help you with branding uh, a product or you can do it yourself, but your contract manufacturer only provides you with kind of the, the, the scientific data needed to go on the label. Um, and then there will be a quotation. So now that you have a final formula, you have packaging, you have labels, all of these things get um, priced from a contract manufacturer to determine what will their price be to you. So um, that could be, you know, pricing is based off of volumes, uh, the quality of the ingredients, the formulation itself can range um, in price. And so all those things get added up. And so this is where I kind of referred to earlier where you need to be uh, very cost conscious of how much you can, what you should be pricing your product at when you, um, when, when you understand what the cost of goods is to you. Very, very important. And it's important to communicate that with your contract manufacturer so they can kind of pull you back or say, hey, you know, our, the cost is getting out of control based off of where you need to be. Um, and they can pull you back if you are making decisions that are too costly. And then once you have a quote, uh, 
uh, and it's agreed upon, the product is scheduled for production. And that's where, you know, everything gets locked in. The contract manufacturer starts ordering components, materials to make your product. In some cases, uh, brands will provide their own packaging or provide certain components. Uh, but, you know, all of these things get put into a ERP system so that it can be tracked in the warehouse, logistics can be monitored, and then the actual formula is scaled. In many cases, you might do a pilot batch if you're a smaller brand, not as likely, but for bigger runs, there would be pilot batching to ensure that uh, there are no issues when scaling up from the lab to the manufacturing floor. Um, and, um, and then from there, once the product is ready, we are calling the brands to say, hey, your order is ready to be shipped. Um, and that's when the truck comes to pick it up. And so you as a brand should be planning for the freight and storage of your own products because most contract manufacturers are not storing their products there. If you're doing e-commerce, um, you will want to store your products or keep your products at maybe a, a pick, pack and ship faci uh, uh, facility that can you know, ship Amazon orders or ship direct to consumer. And then if you're doing if you're selling in retailers, they will have very specific instructions on how and when the products can ship to their warehouses. So you need to be um, aware that that cost is not factored into the cost that you or the price that you are paying your contract manufacturer and you should plan accordingly. And then most importantly, figure out your reorder point. The time to order more products is not when you have a week's worth of inventory. So you want to understand uh, with your CM, how long will it take you to make more product for me? And then if you ordered a thousand units on the first run, maybe you anticipate ordering 2000 units on the second run or 5,000 units. What is the time it will take your contract manufacturer to make that once you place an order? And you should work the math backwards to where you should be reordering when um, at the point where you have the lead time in weeks plus three additional weeks. So if your contract manufacturer says it's going to take them five weeks to to produce another run, then you should be calling them when you have eight weeks of inventory, ideally. Um, and so it's very hard as a budding brand to know your forecast, but if you monitor your sales accordingly over a long period of time as you're growing, you'll understand better kind of how to navigate that. Now, understanding the costs associated. So when you are paying a contract manufacturer for a finished product, there are all of these things that go into that price, the raw materials, the labor, the overhead, and all these kind of indirect costs that maybe you don't see. And so that all goes into how a contract manufacturer prices what they, you know, prices out the products that you're purchasing from them. This is your wholesale price because that is the cost of goods to you. Additional costs that you should be considering and incorporating in you know, pricing your brand, of your products accordingly, is that you have marketing expense, you have overhead expense, you as the founder or the owner needs to be paid. Um, how much is your retailer's margin? How much is it costing you for freight? So make sure you are calculating all of those costs together when pricing out your products, right? And so understanding your COGS, which is stands for cost of goods sold, and like your direct cost, which is what you're paying your contract manufacturer versus your indirect cost, which may be, you know, kind of all these other additional costs um, need to be considered when pricing your uh, brand. And so your suggested retail price should always be your COGS times one plus whatever your markup is. And your markup may be, hey, I wanna make, you know, 100% margin, I don't know, 100% profit on this. And so, you know, you would basically be, you know, pricing your brand accordingly to ensure that you're getting um, at least 100% of the cost back when you sell these products to your consumer. Another thing is when you are scaling with a contract manufacturer, it can be very costly. So start looking for additional financing options. Do not or try not to pay for your production runs out of your cash reserves. You should be looking for credit. You should be looking for factoring things that can help you to float cash flow or protect cash flow and float your, um, your, you know, how you spend your money in a way that makes sense with how cash is coming into the business. So that's more of a business um, um, kind of scenario, but definitely you should look into that. Now, the last thing I would say is very important for you to understand is who's responsible for what. The contract manufacturer that's respons is responsible to the brand, but the brand is responsible to the consumer or the government, right? And so we, as a contract manufacturer, are ensuring that our facility is up to code and meet certain requirements with the government. Um, we're supplying you with finished product that is safe. Uh, we're verifying that what's in the product is actually in the product and is safe. Uh, and we're providing the brand with the necessary data they need to complete their paperwork and, you know, the things that they need to do on their side. But when 
uh, your brand is on the shelf, most people don't know who your contract manufacturer is. So when there's a problem or you're not in compliance, they're coming after the brand. And so that's why it's very important for you as a brand owner to really understand what's going on your your label, what's in the product, and that you're working, you have a good working relationship with your contract manufacturer to make sure that all of those things are in compliance because they're coming after you if anything's wrong, not your contract manufacturer. So it's important for you to do your own due diligence so that you know exactly what is required of you and what is required of the products that are um, that you're putting on the market so that you can make sure that you are covered. Because in many cases, you can go back to your contract manufacturer and say, hey, I got in trouble for X, Y, Z. But if it's something that, you know, the contract manufacturer didn't know you needed or didn't know you were doing, the buck still stops with you as a brand. Um, and so it's very important to have a good open relationship and understanding kind of what you need as a brand and how your contract manufacturer can support you in those efforts. Because at the end of the day, it's still your brand and it's your liability and what you put on the market. Um, and that comes down to kind of my final point, which is communication is key. Um, you want to work with somebody who you can establish clear communication channels with and um, you have you know, a good working relationship with. If it doesn't feel good in your gut, I would say look for somebody else because uh, thing, when things go wrong, you want somebody who want, who's going to work with you and not against you and is going to you know kind of check all the, the boxes, cross all the T's, dot all the I's and be transparent with you, right? And so it's important just like a marriage, just like any other relationship, this is a partnership and you wanna have a good relationship based off of trust and transparency and good communication. But as in any business, you need to make sure that everything is in the contract, right? So everything you agree upon, all how you are kind of your, your operating agreement, your working relationship should all be documented. And uh, contract manufacturers will be able to provide you with those agreements, but do not be afraid to review or have your attorney review those documents and to push back on certain things that don't make sense for your brand, right? You know, open mouths or closed mouths don't get fed. You have to ask the questions um, and negotiate in your best interest. But if it's not in writing, then it can never be proven. <laughs> so make sure that everything, even with a good working relationship, is in writing. And so that brings us to the end of this conversation. I hope that you have um, learned some very key things in how you can form a good relationship, choose a great contract manufacturer for your brand and form a good relationship. And um, I hope that I can continue to be a resource for you in the future. So let's keep the conversation going. Uh, you can find me or MC Group on all the socials, and you can also visit us directly on our websites for additional uh, questions. Thank you so much. And I hope that you have gained something very valuable in how you scale your business. Thank you so much to Erica for that presentation. And we are now going to the Q&A. So here she is. And I figured it was, was going on with my camera. My camera was not plugged in. So there we go. I also saw there was a question just quick that will the stream be available for download after? Everything that is published right now is going to be on our YouTube channel. Tomorrow you're going to get a replay sent to your email tomorrow. Okay, so the first question. Uh, so this one is from Amanda who asks, if I'm doing custom formulations and custom packaging, what's a rough estimate on how long the process should take from start to finish? Uh, great question. So um, it, it varies per formula, but I would always say to make sure that you're in a comfortable range plan for nine to 12 months. Um, with custom formulations, there are a lot more iterations going back and forth, testing things. Stability takes um, quite a bit of time. In our case, we use an 18-week stability program. And then custom packaging alone sometimes can be an eight to 12-week lead time, and that's from when you order. So just a lot for all of those very long timelines when um, planning for your for custom formulation and custom packaging. Uh, this next question is from Hanson who asks, how do you deal with NDAs on formulations that a brand owns that they will bring to you, the manufacturer? Yes, so uh, NDA or non-disclosure agreement is basically for us, we put that in place first step. We don't um, engage with the client without that 
being in place. And essentially, if you're bringing an existing formula to us, which means that it already it can be qualified with exact quantities and manufacturing instructions, et cetera, so forth, then that remains your intellectual property. Unless we make very drastic changes to the formula to where it doesn't even look like your original formula, we would not take any ownership in that or charge, you know, additional fees to, you know, uh, to develop that formula. But if you're bringing an existing formula to us, we are just verifying that we can, we can actually recreate that formula and scale it up. And then it still remains your intellectual property. Uh, this next question is from Sherry, who asks, how does startup know the right questions if they aren't aware of what to ask? So maybe also, what should people be asking their contract manufacturers? Yeah, so I mean, the first of ensuring that they have the proper certifications, um, the right quality uh, protocols, and that, you know, you can also look into, you know, who have they worked with previously and what their experiences have been. Um, I think in the beginning of the presentation, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about like assessing what your brand goals and needs are. And based off of a lot of those things, the, that will help you to understand what you need to be asking a contract manufacturer. A lot of it is about minimums, timelines, formula ownership, um, and then exactly, you know, how, what their capacity is too, you know, especially if they are a big contract manufacturer, what we've, what we've seen is that a lot of small brands don't often get the attention that they need. And so that's also something too important to consider. Um, but I would say if we are sharing that presentation, go back to the, you know, what to consider with your, your, your brand goals. And that's kind of like the first step of really where you need to start with asking those certain questions that align with what you're trying to actually achieve with your brand. And for everyone watching, yes, we are sharing these presentations. And as soon as I have all the PDFs, those will also populate on the replay page. Okay, the next question is from David who asked, I've previously had experience working with a CM where the finished manufacturing product differed slightly from the small batch formulating we did during R&D. What's happening firstly, but also how do you hold the CM accountable? Yes. So that's why contracts are extremely important. Um, one, when you are coming from the lab or small batches, there should be kind of what we call um, uh, the, the C of A or the specifications that are agreed upon. And that's like color, viscosity, pH, uh, the percent solids, all of these things have to fall within a certain uh, parameter. And if the customer has signed off on that, then we are being held, we should be held account accountable as a contract manufacturer that when we give you a finished product, everything lines up in those parameters. If everything lines up in those parameters and there's no difference, then there's no way to, you know, then it's like the contract manufacturer has fulfilled their obligation to the brand. But if you get product that does not align with those parameters, then it should be in your contract that says, hey, if you cannot deliver product that meets these standards that we agreed upon, that the contract manufacturer should be replacing it, reproducing it, or you know, reimbursing you for something like that. Make sure that language is spelled out in your contract. Um, everything goes back to the contract. Everything needs to be in writing. And you know, I always like to say, keep your receipts. Uh, this next question is from Jerry over on Discord, who asks, if creating a hair care product that is fragranced and fragrance-free, should both products go through stability testing? Or would a major change warrant the need for additional stability testing? I love this question because everybody thinks, oh, it's just a minor change. And actually, fragrance is one of the most common ingredients to change the, an entire for, formula or degrade the stability of a formula. Fragrance is like the most um, risky thing to change in many cases. Um, and so I would definitely do stability for the base itself with no fragrance. And I would do stability for every uh, fragrance variant that you're doing. We've had experiences where, you know, we'll have the same base five different fragrances and one fragrance will all of a sudden change the entire color, 
break the formula down and then it's like oh this fragrance we can't do it so definitely stability for everything and every change that you make and also i'll just say this is also for stability or sorry for extracts even if they have the same inky even if they're like the same ingredient but you switch suppliers there might be variations that impact the stability of your formula Okay, this next question comes back from YouTube who asks, can we engage with multiple ZMs and then select the best product? Is there a cost during the engagement if I don't go ahead with a certain CM formula? Uh, I would encourage it. Like, <laughs> I would totally encourage it. This is, you're dating. So, you know, date and, and figure out, you know, who, ha who you have the best relationship with, um, who has the, you know, every contract manufacturer engages with their clients differently. And so you kind of want to get a feel for what's out there and what fits your needs the best. Um, you do not have to engage with them until, you know, you sign the document and work commences. Uh, it's different for uh, as far as how we engage with clients may vary contract to manufacturer to contract manufacturer, but for us at MC, we will not even, start, we'll provide a quote and say, hey, we'll walk you through what we're going to do, how it's going to look. And until you kind of sign the quote, we won't even start the formulation process. So I think with some manufacturers, they might try to get started, you know, sooner rather than later, but we like to keep it very like, this is the beginning. Now we are agreeing to this. Here's step two, step three. Um, but I do think you should date manufacturers and figure out which one makes sense for you. So that's all the time that we had. There's so many questions that are coming through on YouTube. I think Erica is in YouTube, so maybe she'll continue answering your questions, but this was like literally the most informative presentation that has ever been made ever on contract manufacturing. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, also, and follow her on Sister Scientist on Instagram where you can continue asking her questions and also MC group. Yes. And I will stay in the YouTube channel to answer additional questions for a little bit. So thank you so much. Hope you guys learned something and it's been helpful for you guys. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, we're going to go into the uh, lunch a little bit, but I figure that you guys would want all the information that Erica has to share. So sorry for going a little late there. And so we'll just get straight back into it with our safety 101. We have a bit of a change of plans right now for the safety 101. Mojan Matarasi was supposed to do this presentation, but unfortunately there was a last minute cancellation due to things that came up. So Mo is going to take her spot and we're going to do something a little different and do this as a fireside chat. So Mo, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this. And before I start asking you safety questions, would you mind introducing who you are and what you do Hey everyone, my name is Mohammed. You can call me Mo from Mo Skin Lab, of course. You know me on Instagram. I am a pharmacist, a toxicologist, and safety assessor. I do science communication for the past four years covering the topics like safety of cosmetics, toxicology, ingredients, and sometimes formulation. So I guess just to get into it, I feel like it makes sense to start with what does safety mean from your point of view? When we want to talk about safety as a concept, there is is uh, no generalized or harmonized definition for this concept. It depends as a result or the conclusion of the safety assessment of the product that if you follow the regulations and the rules of each country and you produce the product matching those rules, you will have a safe product. So for the brand, a safe product is a product that matches the regulation, is compliant with the regulation, and as a result, technically it will be safe. For brands thinking about, well, another generalized question, but maybe what are some fundamental tests from your point of view that every brand should be doing when they are developing a product and putting a product onto a market? 
It depends again on the market. The testing in general, the uh, for example, we have the stability testing and the microbiology testing, the challenge testing, for example, and compatibility testing. Those are the most in common between the US and the EU, which are considered the, one of the main markets for cosmetic product. For stability te uh, testing, it helps to evaluate how the product will age with time. Describe the physical and chemical and also micro biological characteristic of that product and when it comes to microbiological testing for this product this test will assess the level and type of the microorganism that may be presented in the cosmetic product and the challenge testing is another test that i would consider very important is to help the brand uh, assess if the product actually is going to be able to be challenged with contamination when it comes to different microorganisms if that preservative system is good enough for repeated contamination. And lastly, the compatibility testing tests the uh, formula itself with the packaging, if it's a plastic, if it's a glass. And this test is quite important as well that can help with stability of the whole product itself. And also it is important to repeat the test if any type or uh, ingredient in the formula is a change or the packaging is a change. Microbial contamination is one of the biggest health concerns for products. And so this is why we do this testing. If a product isn't stable, then you have no idea what's going to happen. If your preservative system isn't robust enough, you have no idea. You have no idea and therefore you might be putting an unsafe product onto the market. What is the role of a safety assessor in product development to ensure brands are doing the right thing? The safety assessor is the responsible person when it comes to document what we call it the product information file, the PIF, both in the EU and also in the UK. In the US, it's a, a little bit of a different story. Safety assessor is responsible for creating the cosmetic product safety report, which is a very important part of the actual product information file. And it contains the information about the product itself, general description the physiochemical properties of the formula, the ingredients, what type of preservative is used. And it also contain a section that contain the toxicological data of each of the ingredient used of each of the ingredient used in the formula. For the, the second section is actually the safety assessment itself for the formula as whole, matching each ingredient with the regulation that is done again by the independent bodies for the specific market. And lastly, contain any possible information about potential undesired effect. All of this is the responsibility of the safety assessor. And all of this information needs to be ready in the EU, for example, needs to be ready uh, before the product is marketed. So if there is any type of, let's say, possible undesirable effect, it can be immediately, we can go back to this type of uh, documentation and see if those uh, are predicted or it's something different that needs a serious action and, for example, a recall, a warning by the brand or a changing of the packaging, telling the consumer to use the product in a different way to reduce this risk. And then what's the role of cosmetic COVID Cosmetico vigilance. Oh my gosh, I I've had to say this word a few times on air, and I've butchered it every single time. And then also for uh, for brands for reporting safety, uh, re reporting adverse effects from their products, keeping track of what's happening, what's going on with all of that. Yes, it's it's a very important, I would say, system to report and detect any possible adverse effect. Let's talk about the EU first, then the US. In the EU, it is mandatory. The EU has a great system for this type of concept. They create a, a full document that is very complicated. So if it's available online for anyone uh, to check and have a look at it. What they do is that if any type of undesirable effect popping up, uh, reported by, for example, a distribution a single report from a medical professional or actually the competent authority of that market reporting this type of information. They have what we call the causality assessment, which is a whole protocol of six points with a lot of tables to create scores to see if this actual uh, undesired effect 
is actually matching those, let's say, requirements, and then the action will be taken. So there is a complete system between the industry itself, the distributor, and the responsible person of the brand communicating all together to maintaining the safety of the product. When it comes to the US, before the update of the regulation MOCRA, it was not mandatory. It was more related to self-reporting and self-regulation for the, the consumer to report or the distributor to report to the FDA and the FDA can then collect information and ask for a voluntary recall. But after the update, actually, this update gives the FDA the power to do a mandatory recall if the brand decide not to do the voluntary recall and ask them to recall this product if the information and the data suggest that this product may cause a risk or a harm to the consumer. I guess I'll ask some more juicy questions. What are some common mistakes that you've seen brands make when it comes to safety? There's a lot, to be honest with you, when it comes to mistake that possible brands can do is actually just going easy with the regulation when it comes to the safety of the product. So for the brand to create a product that is actually going to give them the good image in the market, Sometimes brands cut corners, like they don't do the uh, risk assessment, which is not mandatory depending on the market, of course, because we, ca we cannot generalize. Depending on the market, they might cut corners because risk assessment can cost a little bit of money or creating the safety report for the cosmetic product. And when a problem pops up, they don't have what is the base to go back to to see if this formula is actually able or predicted to cause this type of uh, adverse effect. This is one of the most, I would say, problems that uh, brands can face. Also, can uh, the brand go to a manufacturer to create the formula itself? They can go to not very reliable manufacturer and create formulation that are, again, cutting corners when it comes to stability testing, the uh, challenge testing, uh, compatibility testing, all of those can be not done perfectly or go to a lab that is not GMP. All of those are actually present and there are cases and because the regulations and the competent authorities show that okay, a product is being recalled for um, uh, contamination, for the this is an evidence showing us that actually these kind of mistakes are happening. Yeah, I think a lot of people want to rush to market. When I talk to many indie brands, especially those who are just getting started, their expectations for timeline sometimes are like, mm, you need to think about that a little bit more, like three months. You know, it takes like <laughs> it takes like three months just to do some basic stability testing, and that is basic. So <laughs> you should be thinking more about like two years. But I've seen products, so companies will launch their products prior to the stability testing being completed, and then oh shoot, this salicylic acid is crystallizing out of solution. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is what I mean by cutting corners. Like, okay, we are doing this stability te testing, but the product needs to hit the market, which is not ideal at all. And then on the flip side to this question, do you have any top tips that you would want brands to think about as they are navigating safety? My top advice would be the brand is just go easy. Like, don't, like you said, the, the point that you mentioned earlier, don't rush it because if the product, especially in the U.S. market, if the product cause any type of safety concern to the consumer, filing a case is super easy because the spirit of law in the U.S. is different than the EU. In the EU, is mainly based on safety and assurance that the product is safe. In the U.S., is more about freedom and productivity that, okay, we allow the brand a little bit of a space to wiggle, but they have to self-regulate themselves, make sure that our product will not pose any type of risk. The second point is don't cut corners when it comes to safety by not assigning or hiring, like I would say, a safety assessor, a toxicologist that help the brand while the product is being developed, understanding the potential risk. Because if the brand have the information for potential undesired, if undesirable effect, 
the action of the brand to minimize the damage is way way faster because okay we are predicting irritation so if there is an irritation happening we can understand that it is a possibility so the brand doesn't have to do evaluation that our product is actually the cause of this uh, reaction so they can react way way faster do you have any final take-homes that you want to leave our audience with and also where can our audience learn more about the work that you're doing and also if they have questions where they can they direct their questions so my final takeaway is uh, for the the consumer to understand that most brands are doing their best to produce a safe product the very famous uh, eu versus usa regulation that eu is safer or usa is less safe is not a thing because most brands they when they try to launch uh, locally they have the goal to expand internationally and when they do they have to match each reg uh, regulatory framework they want for the market they want to sell in. And for the second part of the question, they can find me on Instagram mostly. I, uh, I am mostly active on Instagram at Most Skin Lab and also on YouTube. So if they leave a comment, a DM, I tried my best with the DMs for Instagram, but Instagram is so glitchy when it comes to DMs, to be honest. Also in the comments they can, or uh, the comments on YouTube, I try my best to answer them as fast as possible. And maybe I'll just quick say before I end this, it's really helpful when you just ask in comments rather than DMs because then other people can see the answers and it's not just for you. And then it also helps the side commerce because it adds more engagement. It helps them in the algorithm for social media. So when you have questions, comment. Thank you so much, Mo, for agreeing to do this. My pleasure, my pleasure. Our next presenter is Pia Long, London College of Fashion graduate. Her perfumery career started as an in-house junior perfumer for a well-known global cosmetics brand, after which she worked for a UK-based fragrance trader and supplier as a technical manager and perfumer and moved on to join a fragrance consultancy as a trading manager and perfumer. In 2016, she set up Old Fiction Limited with Nick Gilbert. They provide perfumery for fine fragrance, home fragrance and cosmetic product categories, plus range evaluation, training and marketing support to suppliers, distributors, manufacturers, and brands. He has created fragrances for global and niche brands, as well as product and ingredient manufacturers. There will be no Q&A for this presentation, but if you have questions, still ask them, and then we will follow up with answers in a email post-conference. Hi everyone, this is about fragrance for your brand and what you need to know. This is what we'll be covering. Some of the points relate to your fragrance brief. So this is really a preparatory presentation for you to be able to write a really good fragrance brief and work with a fragrance supplier. So I'm from a company called All Fiction, which is a portmanteau between all faction and fiction. And I think of fragrance as writing a story just in another medium and fragrance is a form of communication and this is really important point actually for beauty brands that are thinking about fragrance because you're communicating something about your products through the fragrance or the lack of fragrance in your products. We started about seven and a half years ago um, I have a business partner called Nick Gilbert he's a renowned fragrance expert in his own right and we use our combination of skills to help fragrance businesses of all kinds. So what is fragrance? In a single sentence, fragrance is a mixture of raw materials blended according to a formula created by a perfumer. Fragrance is sometimes thought of or talked about as though it was a single line or single component um, or that it's some kind of monstrous entity made up of 2,000, 3,000 materials, and neither of these extreme uh, misconceptions is quite right. Fragrances can be anything from a couple of materials to 200, um, anything in between. Typical fragrances might have a few lines, some perfumes that you wear on the skin, like an eau de toilette. Um, they might be 75 lines or 36 or 150. 
Um, you could make a simple aromatherapy fragrance that's only four lines. But those essential oils, natural raw materials themselves are mini fragrances in their own right because they contain chemical constituents. And actually, if you exploded those out and, and looked at the chemicals in a natural fragrance, the list would probably be longer than 150 lines. In fact, all you'd have to do is add rose oil, which contains 350 chemicals in its in its own right. So um, here's a sort of a list for you to maybe save for later more than look at now. But these are the types of raw materials fragrances can be made from. And they're split between naturals that are harvested directly from botanical sources, nature identical synthetic molecules, but nevertheless they exist in nature, it's just that the molecules have been synthetically reproduced from other feedstock, um, and then synthetic materials. And synthetic materials themselves don't just all come from necessarily petrochemical sources, some of them will come from uh, fermentation or bioengineering or even upcycling. Uh, waste products from other industries, um, turpentine, wood pulp, for example, are good sources of uh, chemical feedstocks to produce synthetic fragrance materials. And as a whole, the industry, of course, really stemmed into producing synthetic raw materials when you had the Industrial Revolution. But nowadays, we're all trying to move towards greener and more sustainable models. So fragrance industry too, um, is trying to look at how to move away from uh, crude oil and petrochemicals. And so even now, there are actually a lot of synthetic materials that are available from non-petrochemical sources. And natural raw materials can be a complete material. So you could harvest something like lavender plants and you get the flowers, leaf and, leaves and twigs uh, made into essential oil. Or you have the orange tree, which produces orange oil from the peel of the orange. Um, and then you have petit gram from the leaves and twigs. And the flowers themselves produce uh, botanical oil, orange blossom and neroli, depending on how it's um, processed. And so it isn't quite so clear cut as, OK, here are natural materials and here are synthetic materials. They, they arrive to us from different kinds of roots. One of the things um, I mentioned just now was sort of misconception and oh boy are there a lot <laughs> about fragrance and some of those are actually sort of historically created by the trade itself because in the past before social media, before blogs, before even advent of sort of glossy magazines, you know, since time immemorial Fragrance has always seemed like a mysterious, magical process uh, akin to alchemy. It's been something that's deliberately perhaps been um, presented as something magical and something that a normal person couldn't possibly understand. And of course, the idea of perfumers wandering around lavender fields looking very pensive and smelling the air and creating some kind of masterpiece in their head while they're doing it. Well, that seems much more magical than thinking about a perfumer sitting in front of a computer and trying to calculate the tiniest minutiae of regulatory compliance. Um, and I guess in our work, we do a bit of both. I mean, you do have to, as a perfumer, go out there and, and be the dreamer too, but the language used about perfumery, how are you supposed to, as a person who isn't in the trade, really understand, for example, that notes lists aren't actually ingredients lists. So when you're looking at the notes lists presented to you by brands who sell perfume, they are sort of verbal mood boards. They're, they're there to prime the consumer they may include some ingredients that are actually in the product but they're in fact a form of marketing there's also this idea that you can have a non-toxic or clean fragrance um, and then not only that that if you were to do that it has to be all natural well both of these concepts are really wrong um, 
first of all, it would be very strange for perfumers to deliberately be adding something into the products that would harm the consumer. No one wants that. Um, and also, second point being that natural materials are actually usually the ones that cause us more problems because the complexity I mentioned earlier, if you think you have a raw material that's actually a mini chemical formula in its own right, nature has produced something that has, let's say, four, four dozen lines on a chemical formula, and then maybe there's two, two of those lines that perhaps we don't want in the consumer product either at all or at a level where it could cause a problem. Um, well, now those hazardous con constituents or allergens, we, we need to control those. So we need to either compose our fragrance in such a way that those um, constituents are limited or we need to perhaps distill or process that material further to remove those uh, problem chemicals. And so the idea that safety is determined by the origin of the material is not right. Safety is determined by context and dose and appropriate formulation and understanding what the trade tells us to do in terms of safety recommendations, limits um, and working with experts and understanding the bigger picture. It's not just a sort of an isolated, oh, if I have a blend of essential oils, it's going to be perfect. Um, and also in terms of sustainability or even your carbon footprint, if you think about how much human endeavor goes into harvesting something like rose petals, four tons of rose petals to get one kilo of rose oil, then the distillation itself, um, how much carbon is actually being used there? What about all the further processing? What about the transportation costs, whatever? So I'm not sort of saying that we should choose one over the other categorically. Because, of course, naturals have wonderful um, aesthetic properties. They're beautiful. Our human brains respond to them. Our emotions respond to them. So, of course, we want to keep using natural raw materials. But I think it's actually doing natural raw materials a disservice to paint them as um, faultless and angelic and automatically safe, because that actually leads to problems when it comes to the uh, future of our trade future regulations and future formulation. So some of the questions you could be asking instead, um, maybe more strategic, can you direct how your fragrance is actually created? Do, do you have any kind of line of communication either directly with the perfumer or to an evaluator at your fragrance house? How do your customers feel about fragrance? Are they, are you aiming at a customer group who may be already conditioned to be really anti-fragrance, in which case, how are you going to negotiate this? Because there might be some product types where fragrance is really important. Um, and are you going to then fall into the natural fallacy, um, but then maybe encounter problems later when people uh, find that your product is not suitable for sensitive skin? Um, so, for example, if you wanted to make a completely allergen free fragrance, you could only do that using synthetic raw materials. So it's a complex topic um, and it absolutely isn't binary, natural or synthetic. So think about this a little bit beyond the surface and certainly not as a either or. Creating fragrances is quite exciting to me because it's really like multifaceted puzzle solving. It's not just about the smell. You have to think about all these different facets um, and each of the facets affects the other ones. So if you might be solving one side of it, oh, it smells wonderful, it smells exactly like the client wanted, then what if it's now not to their budget or what if it's now not suitable for the product category that they want to use it in? So because there's so many facets to creating a fragrance and everything affects everything else, you do have to be quite good at informing your fragrance supplier or your perfumer in advance of some of the things that you want to achieve with your products, even if it doesn't seem to have anything to do with fragrance whatsoever. So you might be thinking, well, I'll eventually expand to USA. I'm just going to be selling in Europe for now or the other way around or you know, I'd, I'd quite like to use this fragrance now in my cleansing balm, but I'm planning to use it also in a, a, a face moisturizer. 
Now, that might not seem like an important distinction for you, but one is a rinse off product, one is a leave on product. Uh, and one market has one set of regulations and one market has another set of regulations. So some of the things that we have to think about um, really are to do with all these different facets rather than just the smell. Um, and so one of the most important takeaways from this entire presentation would be that you really need to tell your fragrance supplier in advance uh, what types of products you'd like to use the fragrance for. This is one of the most common stumbling blocks where you, you sort of get far down the line and maybe the conversation wasn't clear um, and then, oh yes, we want to use it here too. Um, and that really should be prevented at the point of writing the fragrance brief. So since there's so many misconceptions about fragrance and since it can be a difficult topic and since creating your fragrance in tandem with a fragrance supplier or perfumer is actually quite a complex process, why bother with it? Why, why put fragrance? I mean, it'll add cost to your formula. Sometimes it's the costliest part of your formula. And yeah, arguably, um, I would say some products don't need it or shouldn't have it. So eye cream, does it need a fragrance? Maybe not. Um, a barrier cream for damaged skin? Probably not. There's lots of products where you could argue that fragrance is not necessary or could even be a hindrance. On the other hand, fragrance is a little bit like a soundtrack for film um, in that it becomes inseparable from your product and it enhances its attributes to such a degree that studies have been done that you can have the exact same product formula, something like a shampoo, one without fragrance and one with a fragrance that really enhances the user experience. Um, and people think that the shampoo is better. They're not saying, oh, I like this because it smells nice. They think their hair was shinier, in better condition, more manageable. And so, that's a really crucial thing to understand that actually fragrance and the product development needs to happen as a holistic process. The fragrance developer or your supplier of an off the shelf fragrance really needs to understand what it is that you're trying to communicate about your product, to whom you're communicating and about what. And really, even if you're just looking at a basic malodor, combating fragrance even if it's oh you know I've got these vegetable oils or I've got these waxes or these other ingredients in the formula that make it smell a bit like crayons or oh it smells a bit fatty and you're just looking to cover that odor even then it will actually really help your sales it would actually really help the user experience it will help people become obsessed about your product and really develop uh, a relationship with your product where they want to repurchase it um, if the fragrance uh, is right uh, for that product type. So clearly fragrance regulations and cosmetic regulations, they could be an entire seminar in their own right um, and you need to be a regulatory professional to really go into it in depth. But you do need to be aware that there are regulations that differ from region to region. And the reason you need to be aware of at least that is that when you're sourcing your fragrance, when you're asking for someone to create a fragrance or supply an existing fragrance to you, one of the things that needs to go on your fragrance brief is where you're going to be selling the product because regional examples um, can be as small as California, a single state determining that certain things need to be mentioned. Um, or they can be as broad as the EU, which of course includes several countries. And ultimately, the entire fragrance journey from where the materials have been grown and harvested and processed or where they've been created in a lab, ultimately the ingredients themselves have come under various regulations through their journey. And then the finished fragrance oil, um, when it's treated as an industrial product, that comes under uh, different regulations than the fragrance when it's in your cosmetic product or your household product. Um, and so here's a sort of a really broad overview of some of the different layers of regulatory um, bodies that affect how your 
fragrance is regulated and then how your end product is regulated. So rather than sort of list various regulatory bodies and, and I can just imagine all the eyes glazing over, I wanted to show you sort of from my point of view, what, what would I see if I was doing a fragrance for an aromatherapy brand or somebody who said, oh, I want my products to smell like a spa um, and I want it to be all natural. Um, and well, OK, well, here's an example then. Let's let's have a few lines of uh, natural products. And remember, all of these materials like lavender oil, rosemary oil, they would have a mini formula within themselves. They're actually in themselves little mini fragrances created by nature. So actually the ingredients, the chemicals in this formula would run into the several dozen, um, but the formula looks deceptively simple with all these complex materials. Um, and so the reason you're seeing all those uh, CLP hazard pictograms is because of all the chemicals found uh, naturally in these uh, complex raw materials. And so there's all kinds of things there from um, irritation, which is the exclamation mark. That's quite common. That's really difficult to avoid because you'd get that if um, something is irritating to the eye. And I can't think of many things that aren't. Um, but then there's things like flammable or um, aspiration risk or even hazardous to uh, the aquatic uh, environment. So those are all um, relating to those individual raw materials and the hazardous components, chemical components they contain uh, at their undiluted form. And then what I would look at is, OK, well, what are the inclusion levels in the product types? Um, is this going into a household product or is it going into a spa product? Is it going into a perfume? And depending on the categories um, and type of product this would be included in, I would be able to look at the classes uh, of the International Fragrance Association recommendations. 12 is a candle, so that's 100% <laughs> because you're not expecting people to take a candle and rub it on their skin, hopefully. Um, four is fine fragrance perfume, so I could actually make a perfume out of this if I added some ethanol and um, water. Uh, I could add this at up to 15% into a perfume. It wouldn't really develop very well on the skin, mind you, but you could do it. Um, and then you've got all these other categories for um, shampoo, uh, rinse of products, leave-on products, uh, even lip products. Um, and the cosmetic regulation categories for Europe, in this case, on my software, they show uh, sort of a parallel set of uh, inclusion level maximums that I would have to observe, uh, which run parallel to IFRA. They're not identical. And... Uh, in this case, um, I'm absolutely fine for rinse of product, should I want it in a shampoo. Um, leave on product, I could even put quite a lot in on a leave on product. And then it would be up to me and the brand to decide what's an appropriate level for that actual product and the user experience. Um, and then we see a list of allergens there um, that would have to be listed on the packaging. And those are completely dependent on the inclusion level. So if we included it at 0.2% or 2%, the listed allergens would change quite dramatically because it's based on how much of the allergen ends up in the finished product. So just as a counterpart, I wanted to show you an example regulatory landscape if I were to do a almost completely synthetic fragrance. So this is a shampoo fragrance. Um, there's a couple of allergens you'd have to list if we were to include this in the product at 2%. Um, and the hazard pictograms don't look anywhere near as scary. Um, those relate to the uh, CLP regulation, uh, classification, labeling and packaging regulation, which comes ultimately from the United Nations. Um, it's called the globally harmonized system, the uh, overarching system, but it's actually not really harmonized. So that's sort of slightly ironic. Um, but every region that has some kind of labeling and uh, transport regulations about hazardous chemicals will have a similar system, if not um, a sort of a mirror of this. So you'll see when you, you sometimes see trucks going around with a flammable pictogram in the back. 
um, or you might get a canister into your factory that has all kinds of hazard diamonds on it. Um, those are all relating to the industrial handling of chemicals and um, that's of course what chemicals are what fragrance is made of, so natural or synthetic. And uh, the irony is that the synthetic ones are less hazardous. Um, and this is often really misunderstood. And similarly, if I wanted to make this shampoo completely allergen free at the point of inclusion, I could actually. Um, and so that's another interesting fact here is that for rinse of product not to have any allergens um, present at a level where they would be significant enough to be listed uh, and by the way the listing limit is pretty tight so that would mean that it's highly unlikely anyone would react um, i could easily make this fragrance completely allergen free whereas i couldn't do it with the other one really some of the things you should ask for or be automatically provided and offered include obviously a safety data sheet which relates to the globally harmonized system we just saw uh, the safety data sheet should ideally be in the language of the country that you operate in or the uh, product is ending up in and this is really relevant information for the stages of transport storage and handling uh, as the full concentrate and some people get scared looking at safety data sheets but as you just saw you know a bunch of essential oils look really scary when you look at them from a hazard perspective so as long as you follow the correct handling and storage instructions um, and don't flush them down the drain um, you're fine one of the most hazardous things to pour down the drain is lavender oil I once worked in a factory where um, a very hmm, <laughs> unconcerned factory floor compounder who didn't really care about safety, who, by the way, did get sacked in the end, um, once spilled a whole uh, barrel of lavender oil. And instead of using the spill kit in the factory, as you would correctly do, he just thought, oh, what the hell, and just <laughs> swept it down the drain. And um, a few days later, we had the local water board um, down saying what's going on hang on shouldn't you have done something else um, and so yeah safety data sheets good to look at how you're supposed to store and handle and dispose of materials that's what they're for and they're also for safe transportation and if you um, look at them they tell you information that can also be then useful for um, preparing consumer products for the household market because some of those hazard statements and pictograms end up on, for example, a diffuser uh, bottle uh, or a candle packaging or household cleaner. And so those hazard pictograms um, that end up on a consumer product um, relate to the ones that you would look at in the concentrate, but they're like allergens calculated based on the inclusion level of the fragrance so you might have a scary looking canister but if you've only include included 10% of that fragrance in your candle you might actually drop below uh, a point of hazard and your candle packaging might not have a single pictogram or it might just have the exclamation mark so safety data sheets relate to all these things um, and then the allergen certificate that's to do with cosmetic regulation in the EU specifically the um, cosmetic laws um, and IFRA certificate International Fragrance Association certificate um, that gives you or should give you um, maximum inclusion levels per product category um, and you would have hopefully discussed thoroughly with your fragrance supplier what inclusion level they recommend and what you'd like to use for your product to be uh, optimized for a lovely experience um, and it is useful to have a um, certificate of analysis per batch because when your fragrance arrives it's really nice for your traceability within your manufacturer environment to be able to take quality control samples of each container that arrives and marry those to the batch numbers in your certificate of analysis. 
and then make sure that you have some traceability between your product batches and the fragrance batches and containers that we use so I know sometimes you won't be able to tell exa exactly what container the fragrance came from um, but at least if you can trace the batch um, should there be any problems um, you have that full line going all the way back to the fragrance and then storing fragrance you should obviously keep it away from anywhere where it could get uh, really hot or frozen or catch fire um, but also really be careful about things like cross-contamination so if you're pouring fragrance from a canister into a metal bucket and then pour another fragrance and then pour some of it back well now you've con contaminated your fragrance um, and obviously you should try not to have bits um, go into it um, or have it oxidized so if the fragrance canister is really really low and there's a lot of air sitting on top if that fragrance then sits in your factory or warehouse for a year uh, the oxygen up top might have oxidized it so you should have really transferred it into a smaller container and obviously look at the safety data sheet for the correct storage instructions always so you actually need to make a decision uh, between different um, mutually incompatible factors when you're deciding what kind of fragrance and from whom you should be including in your products because if let's say that you're a very um, exclusive brand let's say you're in fact a beauty brand just going to be sold in two high-end spas you're not going to be manufacturing thousands of units of product you will just have a few hundred units a year and your fragrance inclusion levels are really low and so in actual fact, you'll only be buying under 10 kilos of fragrance total, uh, for instance. Um, well, at that point, you may be better off considering an off the shelf fragrance or something that um, has a starting point and is just modified for you. Or if you're prepared to pay for the R&D phase, um, by all means work with a perfume and have a bespoke fragrance made but you've got to understand they're not going to make any money on your project whatsoever so it's pure risk for them so at that point you would have to pay up in advance effectively the profit that they would get from the sale of a fragrance oil for a larger brand most fragrance suppliers and even some independent perfumers or, or sort of smaller fragrance houses work on a model of there being a sort of a sliding scale between how much fragrance oil are you going to be buying versus um, what does it cost to actually have that fragrance developed for you so you need to think about all these different facets of your branding how important is fragrance to your branding do you want to mimic um, existing signatures out there in which case perhaps an off-the-shelf fragrance might work um, or do you want to have a really totally unique brand signature that's recognizably your brand even if you have different fragrances across your brand but you can probably name a couple of um, cosmetic brands where it's obvious that the fragrance is from that brand even if the fragrances between their different product types are different and so think about these attributes what matters to you where do you want to invest um, how much is that fragrance going to cost you initially in the investment stage um, because of course an r d fee is a one-off uh, you don't then have to continuously add that to your product uh, costings worksheet or are you thinking no I don't want to invest so much in the beginning maybe I want to do a proof of concept and then if the brand takes off perhaps at that point we'll have a bespoke fragrance there's all kinds of options um, but you really should think about for instance um, whether fragrance is an important factor for a particular product type or for the consumers that you're um, hoping to attract and um, whether it's something that you want to invest in straight away or later on and you need to have a clear idea in your mind about what's in it for the fragrance supplier quite frankly because 
if you turn up and say, well, you know, I'm actually going to only buy two kilos of fragrance and I probably won't come back uh, for two years. And oh, by the way, I want you to develop something completely bespoke for these new products that you've never worked with, these completely new formulas um, that don't exist in your database. And um, yeah, I want it for free. Then that's not going to happen. So you need to think about how do we find uh, a mutually beneficial way of working with a fragrance supplier or an independent perfumer. So how does a perfumer work exactly? Once they know the sort of more prosaic side of things, once they understand the poetic side of things, once they know what you're dreaming of, what your brand vision is, what stories you're wanting to tell, what ingredients is it that you want to talk about? Is there something that you want to really draw uh, on? Is there some concept that you're wanting to really um, pull on for the consumer's imagination? All these different things come into it. Um, you end up going through this sort of process that involves these different hats you're wearing almost. So you start off as the dreamer, you start off as the perfumer, perhaps wandering down the lavender fields. Um, I often wander down the forest paths. Um, and you then have to become the artist and you have to think of your raw materials as an artistic medium. But then you become the serious person, the formulator, and you start thinking about, OK, well, performance and stability, cost contribution, is it suitable for this particular formula? What kind of impact is it going to have? Is it a waste of money in this product type? Will it just disappear into the formula? Um, all these different things come to it when you're formulating and you're looking at your fragrance from all these different facets. At that point, you're looking at your formulating software or you're measuring things out by hand and having a look at how they interact. All these different parts um, come into it. And then at that point, you also need to become a problem solver. Perhaps your client has asked you something that's difficult to deliver. Maybe they wanted something um, that was quite challenging. So you, you tackle the problem and it itself becomes creatively quite inspiring. Um, and at some point, you then submit your samples to the client and the client then feeds back and maybe wants some changes or maybe doesn't understand a facet that you've tried to communicate through the fragrance or maybe just thinks, oh, no, this is nothing like I imagined. Um, and at that point, you need to find a way to communicate. And this can be the sort of make or break situation. Are you able to communicate your exact wants and needs or what you don't like, what you do like. Um, why is it that you don't feel it's on brief? Um, how is it that you'd like it to be changed? And at that point, it can be helpful if there's uh, almost an interpreter um, between you and that can be a fragrance evaluator. In some companies, they're called scent design managers. Whatever the role title, it's basically somebody who's acting as a in-between and a sort of an interpreter between client and perfumer. So that can sometimes really help. But however you do it, um, communication is absolutely crucial to fragrance development, even if you're buying an off-the-shelf fragrance because you might not be able to quite specify what it is that you're looking for. And so you need somebody at the other end who can really kind of get that information out of you, but also you need to be able to provide as much information as possible and be as clear as possible and be as honest as possible. I think one of the worst things is when people think, oh, no, you know, I, I can't say what I really think. It's like, oh, no, please do. <laughs> That's actually really important. Um, and sometimes it helps in the communication phase for you to also way before the fragrance actually gets developed is for you to talk about your olfactive preferences that have nothing to do with your brand, but just your own personal taste too, um, and communicate clearly with the fragrance house or, or the perfumer that that's, um, those are the sort of things that you personally like, because that can help um, avoid something or, or include something uh, based on that conversation. So let's say that you, for instance, have a sort of visceral hate of lavender smell you just can't stand it um, and if you didn't say that in the beginning um, and let's say you were creating a cleansing balm and uh, maybe it's for sensitive skin or maybe it's a sleeping time cleansing balm and now you've gone off down a road where the perfumer might 
draw some conclusions based on what they've done before and they present you with a lavender heavy fragrance and you go oh no I hate it uh, please please make it less like this and uh, there's there's got to be some way to excavate the true reasons for your um, feedback uh, but ultimately all of these things can be stumbling blocks if salt wasn't put into the fragrance brief and the early stages and the whole process prior to briefing the perfumer. So the fragrance brief. These are some of the basic things you should have thought through prior to asking someone to supply you a fragrance. Be it a bespoke fragrance that you'd like them to create for you or an off the shelf fragrance that you'd like to source. And you may be going to a large fragrance house um, if you're buying in high volumes. Uh, we have a really high value project. And they may give you a form to fill out. They might, might have a whole process where you get to talk to a salesperson, an evaluator, maybe even directly the, to the perfumer. But in any case, there's possibly some extra steps um, that will help you. But before you approach anyone, you should have thought through a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so the olfactory profile, ironically, is almost the last thing um, because it comes from all these other things. Uh, what region um, are you going to be selling in? How will the product be retailed? Is it from websites? Is it from uh, pharmacies? Is it from spas? Is it from beauty salons? Is it from dedicated boutiques? Um, is it direct to consumer in some other way? Um, that actually affects things. Who is your target consumer? Who is it that's going to be hopefully falling in love with your product? Um, and what do they already use? Um, what are their likes and dislikes? How is your brand different? How is your brand unique? What is it that you're wanting to actually tell about your brand through your products and inevitably therefore through the fragrance. And then the more pragmatic things of how many kilos of fragrance oil are you likely to buy, what your ultimate products will retail at, what's the price of the product um, and that will then determine your fragrance budget, um, how much are you going to all allocate for the fragrance on your product costings worksheet. Um, all these different things are really important to have thought through prior to talking to a fragrance supplier. And hopefully you understand some of the reasons why um, they go from the sort of dull but necessary regulatory side to the actual uh, artistic and poetic creativity. Um, you have a better chance of communicating during the development process too um, and so the feedback between you and the fragrance supplier or perfumer is going to be smoother if you've got a clearly defined idea of what it is that you're actually looking for and there's no reason why you can't in addition to providing the basic information then chat through your olfactive profile preferences or your hopes um, just in person but all the other stuff is really important um, because that determines what the scope of the project is, what it's going to cost you to have the fragrance and how long it's going to take you to actually get the fragrance developed or sourced, who you're going to even go to in the first place because some people will turn you away if the project isn't big enough. Um, and all these different facets are really important to have worked out prior. So just wanted to thank you um, for coming, thank you for attending and hopefully there'll be lo lots of very smart future clients out there for fragrance suppliers and perfumers of all kinds and obviously if you have any questions about the conference itself then uh, talk to Jen but if you wanted to ask me anything about fragrance um, then do email me or contact me through Instagram and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Our next speaker is AJ Aday. 
founder of Sula Labs and an award-winning cosmetic chemist, clinical researcher, and chemical biology PhD student at the University of California, Los Angeles. When AJ was a clinical researcher and formulator in the medical-grade skincare space, she immediately saw how underserved and underconsidered Black consumers are in the R&D process and sought out to build Sula Labs, a research-forward product development and testing laboratory that develops and tests products for Black-owned brands and dark-skinned consumers, with customers in retailers including Sephora, Credo Beauty, and Ulta Beauty. AJ's dermatologic research is published in the Journal of Drugs and Dermatology, and she is a Future Laboratory Future Innovators awardee. She is ultimately driven by her innate passion for using chemistry and clinical research as a means for change for the health of skin of color. Without further ado, here's the presentation. Hi everyone, I'm AJ Ade, and I'm the founder and chemist of Sula Labs which is a product development laboratory based in Los Angeles that develops and tests products for black owned brands and brands that are looking to develop products for darker skin consumers. Thank you so much to Jen for having me here at this EcoLL eSummit. Um, and today I'll be speaking to you all about formulation, a crash course. So I've put together a development framework on formulation because this often seems to be heralded as a linear process but as you can see for the squiggles that I've put in this graphic, that it's oftentimes not necessarily very linear and you find yourself bouncing back between different steps. Now, some of the stuff on this development framework I'm going to save for my other esteemed colleague that will be giving wonderful presentations in today's eSummit. So what I'm mainly going to focus on are market research, ingredient and literature research, cog determination, formulation, and stability and preservative testing. So for market research, the question that this particularly answers is, where does your product fit into the skincare market? For ingredient and literature research, the question that we're answering is, how will you create product efficacy? For cog determination, the question that we'll be answering is, how much will your product cost and what will the margins be to create your product after you've figured all these things out? And for stability and preservative testing, the question that we're answering is, is your product safe to use, which is actually a very, very important thing to take into account considering the MOGRA law that went into effect this year. So market research. I have a few graphics here and they're very businessy, but we're going to dive into these really meticulously so that we all understand them. So I have here PM fit, which stands for product market fit, which we've probably all heard, right? And what this really says is, how does your product fill a white space? We're gonna look at this quite systematically so that we determine whether your product has a strong functionality, a unique value proposition, fills a white space, and targets a target consumer. So for strong functionality, that's more so called user experience. And of course, this is the product and functionality that ensures that the customer usage is seamless. For example, if you want to develop a product that sort of slims down the steps that people take in a beauty routine. For value proposition, we want to make sure that you're creating a unique and superior product. Now, I feel you that's really hard to do these days when the product is or the market is saturated with a bunch of skincare products that all claim to sort of do the same thing, which is bring someone a life changing skin. But again, we'll go into this a little bit deeper later on. For filling a white space, we want to make sure that your product targets an underserved need, which again, I understand is really hard with a saturated market, but you'd be surprised that there are still unmet desires of customers, which of course is an opportunity for your products to be developed. And then lastly, your target customer, which is what people often tend to think about first. This is the people of which the product is made for, which oftentimes the founder or the brand aligns with take into account that you can satisfy these needs to address a larger market. Now, people often talk about product market fit, but what they don't understand is that product market fit is actually one puzzle piece in the context of a larger market, which we tend to break down into four different categories. For example, product, channel, model, and market. So these can kind of be you know, regarded as their own sort of ways in which you're answering the overall question of where does my product position itself in the market? For example, your model. That really speaks to how much you charge. Is your product going to be free, which I hope it's not? 
But is your product going to be on a subscription basis? How do you acquire a customer on Glossier and how they really took their market by storm? For channel, that answers the question, where are you selling these? So are you going to be direct to consumer? Are you going to be a brick and mortar? So are you going to you know, build your own store to sell your product? Or are you going to rely on retailers? So again, we need to make sure that your product fits these sorts of axes here, right? That there's not only product market fit, but that there's also product channel fit and that there's model channel fit and that there's market model fit. And then of course, you know, lastly, as we all know, that there's product market fit. So just in case this was confusing, like I mentioned, we're gonna go into an example that we all know and love, which is Glossier, which was able to, you know, really take the skincare industry by storm. And it's interesting because they didn't necessarily even start off with skincare, they start off with makeup. And if you remember the rise of Glossier, there were several things that they did that really made sure that they ushered in a new brand of you know, freshness into the beauty industry. So we're gonna break down how they did that and assign them to the different axes that I discussed on the last slide. So for strong functionality, if you remember correctly, um, Glossier, I believe launched with their boy brow. And then I think they had a foundation and their bomb.com. So there was strong functionality in that it was lightweight, easy to use makeup products that fit easily into a busy schedule, into the routine that you already have. You didn't have to upheave your, your entire makeup routine to fit these products in. Cause you could just, you know, flick the boy brow on your brows, add on the bomb.com and pat in some of the concealer or the foundation around your skin. And it gave the unique pr value proposition of your skin look better. This wasn't necessarily something that was centered in the beauty industry at the time, because at the time, the makeup industry was very centered on being high coverage. If you remember in 2016 ish, we were all beating our face. We had those really bold, dark lips and eyeshadows and eyeliners. But Glossier really took this by storm because there wasn't necessarily a makeup brand pressure on yourself to have, you know, everybody be your target customer. Sometimes there's a really narrow niche. Other times, like in Glossier's case, you can really address a full market. But this is how they were able to do this so well. And when you're creating your beauty product, I want you to make sure that you have all these boxes to check off. Now going into the fit model, their product was makeup and the axes for product channel was that this makeup was gonna be sold direct to consumer. For the longest time it was direct to consumer, but remember they built their flagship, which is their brick and mortar for exclusivity. So that was how product channel fit was observed. For model channel fit, it's interesting because their model overlapped with their channel. Their model was a direct to consumer business model and their channels were to just sell directly to their consumer and also have a brick and mortar store. But what this really enabled was repeat customers because they had a marketplace that they could go back to and they could repeat buy Glossier, which is a really important thing to ask yourself. How are you going to acquire customers? And that answer is going to be elucidated by model channel fit. For market model fit, of course, they're selling makeup and their model was direct to consumer. And then for product market, they were in the makeup market and they were making makeup products. So a lot of these are pretty self-explanatory, but you'd be surprised when it comes to formulating a product. We often tend to miss some of these things, which result in lower sales. But I want you all to do really well. So that is the secret sauce to market research or research, which is far more, I, I would say, aligned with the actual bare bones of formulation. So when I speak to founders of how they want to formulate their products, I always ask them, where do they go to for efficacy inspiration? Because at the end of the day, what we all want is for our products to be safe and effective, especially when it comes to addressing that target customer. So there are four ways that I often recommend for um, efficacy inspiration. However, you want to use a combination of all four of these, and one is more likely to stand out to you than the others, but I would recommend highly, highly to not just rely on one. So I'm going to go through all of these. Literature review. Literature review goes into clinical studies, ingredient properties, and review papers. So you can go look for academic literature on Google Scholar, on Science Direct, on any you know, literature platform database, but there are pros and cons to this as there are for all four of these. Of course, the main pro is that you may not be able to be 
you know, deduce clinical studies and that's okay. But if you are a scientist, and this is so easy for you to do, right? There's always someone to deduce these for you. So make sure that you ask an expert. Um, my colleague, Javon Ford, who you are all probably familiar with, he said something very interesting in an episode of Los Angeles a while ago, which was, you know, we don't all have to do our own research, right? Because some folks may not be able to read studies in the way that they you know, necessarily need to present their results. However, it's really important to find someone who can. So I would highly, highly recommend if you don't feel confident in looking for ingredient literature and really understanding how a study arrived at determining its efficacy that you find someone you can. The cons are that not all studies are very rigorous. I would highly encourage you to look at the study sponsors because they could be sponsored by a company, which is not always a terrible thing, of course, right? But, you know, oftentimes when companies do studies, they will have an agenda to make sure that, you know, they, they show efficacy of an ingredient or a product. So make sure that you take more than one study into account because favorable results do not always mean reproducible. And in science, we have an R and R term, which just means rigor and reproducibility. If you arrive at a result, you want to make sure that you are rigorous in arriving at that conclusion and that that conclusion can be reproducible to a larger you know, sample size. The second way to go is looking at ingredient trends research. Now, there are so many places that you can find ingredient trends research, and I would highly encourage you to take advantage of these. Um, my friends over at SPATE, which is an intelligent trends agency, um, they're super cool and huge shout out to them because they display data of how ingredients, um, you know, come about over time and how they have year over year return in terms of buzz. Now, the pros to this is this, this tells you where the market has been. For example, snail mucin has been a really buzzy skincare ingredient over time. So you know that there are customers out there that buy products with snail mucin and you may want to formulate that into your product. However, the cons are that buzzy ingredients aren't always the most effective. Um, and this is something that, you know, scientists, I feel like we really, really stand 10 toes down on because you really want to make sure that just because customers are buying it, if the case is to make an effective product, that you really, really determine whether or not it is necessary to have those buzzy ingredients. Product testing. This is another way to make sure that you, you know, arrive at efficacy inspo. The pros of product testing is that if it works well on you and you're the target customer, then you know you may be able to make the conclusion, maybe, that it could be reproducible to an entire market. However, the cons is that this is not always the case. So if you find an ingredient that you like in a product that you've developed and it works really well for you, I would highly encourage you to go into claims testing, which I know there's going to be a presentation on claims testing later on. So please, please do you know make sure that you engage in that. And then supplier data. Suppliers, the pros of this are that they have not already tested the ingredients. Sorry for that tech issue. Um... Just bear with us one moment and we will get the stream back going. To consumer business sell directly to office and office. we had those really bold dark lips and makeup you know fresh and sell your product you're still unmissed proposition mist of Sula labs and it gave the unique sponsors because they could be sponsored by a company which is not always a terrible thing, of course, right? But, you know, oftentimes when companies do studies, they will have an agenda to make sure that, you know, they, they show efficacy of an ingredient or a product. 
So make sure that you take more than one study into account because favorable results do not always mean reproducible. And in science, we have an R and R term, which just means rigor and reproducibility. If you arrive at a result, you wanna make sure that you are rigorous in arriving at that conclusion and that that conclusion can be reproducible to a larger you know, sample size. The second way to go is looking at ingredient trends research. Now there are so many places that you can find ingredient trends research and I would highly encourage you to take advantage of these. Um, my friends over at SPATE, which is an intelligent trends agency, um, they're super cool and huge shout out to them because they display data of how ingredients um, you know, come about over time and how they have year over year return in terms of buzz. Now the pros to this is this just tells you where the market has been. For example, snail mucin has been a really buzzy skincare ingredient over time. So you know that there are customers out there that buy products with snail mucin and you may want to formulate that into your product. However, the cons are that buzzy ingredients aren't always the most effective. Um, and this is something that, <laughs> you know, scientists, I feel like we really, really stand 10 toes down on because you really want to make sure that just because customers are buying it, if the case is to make an effective product, that you really, really determine whether or not it is necessary to have those buzzy ingredients. Product testing. This is another way to make sure that you, you know, arrive at efficacy inspo. The pros of product testing is that if it works well on you and you're the target customer, then you, know, you may be able to make the conclusion, maybe, that it could be reproducible to an entire market. However, the cons is that this is not always the case. So if you find an ingredient that you like in a product that you've developed and it works really well for you, I would highly encourage you to go into claims testing, which I know there's going to be a presentation on claims testing later on. So please, please do you know, make sure that you engage in that. And then supplier data. Suppliers, the pros of this are that they have not already tested the ingredients I am so sorry about that. Just bear with me one second as I figure out how to adjust this. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Five minutes break and we will get right back to AJ's presentation. Oh, no. I am so sorry oh. for the error here. Oh, sorry. Uh, made it. Oh, no. uh, and I'm unmuting myself. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. The whole presentation will be available on YouTube after, but this just gives us more time for Q&A. And then you will see the whole presentation tomorrow. Okay, so you guys, if you want to start asking questions, maybe uh, I will start with my own question. AJ, I'm so sorry for the tech issues that we've had with the video. I don't know what happened there. I went and no looked problem. after, and it looks like that is actually where the video ends. So there is oh. something weird from when I downloaded your video. I'm so sorry. Okay, my question to you is like, what is a common mistake you see brands make when they are going through uh, formulation development? Yeah, so I would say one of the biggest common mistakes that I see brands go through when going through formulation is kind of going through that tug between quality and cost. 
So they usually are really excited by the amount of actives that give product efficacy. For example, retinoids and peptides and ceramides. But I think it's kind of a misconception that the higher the ingredient percentage, the more effective a product is. And that's kind of the main thing that I try to get brands away from because it tends to increase their cost of goods and in many cases tends to destabilize their product as well. Uh, what is so everyone on YouTube, if you have any questions, then please ask them. I will just ask another question. I'm being greedy here. Uh, what is a common misconception that you see out there about formulation? Yeah, I I wanted I would say like of course what I mentioned is like a common misconception that the higher the ingredient percentage, the more efficacious a product. But of course that's not always the case, right? Because as mentioned, it, it tends to destabilize the product. I would also say that another thing is a really misconceiving thing that I see from a lot of folks is that you don't need safety testing, which I think has been you know, really, really seen and put across in this e-summit today that safety testing is really important. I think it's kind of a misconception from brand founders sometimes on the indie scale that they can take a formulation and go straight to manufacturer without doing all the testing involved. Because what I tend to see over time is that their products may not be stable or that there was no PET testing or stability testing done for it to go into scale up. And so they're not necessarily sure that like the formulation that they came with in order to, you know, maybe tweak or go into scale up is going to be the formulation that they launch with. I also think an, uh, one last one that I'll throw in there is that um, ingredient switches, that one, that ingredients are a one to one ratio. So for example, if you're going into scale up and you had a really nice dimethicone in your product and you switch out at the last moment and be like, okay, actually I want to use this dimethicone. I think some people are not aware of the fact that, for example, dimethicones have different grades, different viscosities. And so it's something that's, you know, really kind of not, I would say not a huge point of education in the product development process, that ingredients aren't always a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of viscosity and performance, which is where a lot of dupe culture arises from. So I think it's really important to educate brand founders and in, in where I'm at in the, in the beauty value chain that, um, you know, to really nail down on what your ingredient preferences are and make sure that these are the ones that you want to go with and that it's locked in in terms of price, performance, efficacy, and so on. Because once you switch it out, it's not the same formulation. Um, this next question for, comes from Hanson on YouTube who asks, do you find that combining two or more preservatives can be helpful in stability? And maybe I'll tack on this. Why is it generally important to think about preservation from preservative systems rather than single preservatives? Yeah, because the, the main requirement that you want out of your preservatives preservative is for it to be broad spectrum. And so that means that it's able to curb the growth of both yeast and mold in a product. And those are two completely different, you know, organisms that have two completely different requirements to live. And so in many cases, when you find a preservative, it can maybe be really good at curbing yeast, but not that great at curbing mold growth in a product. And it's also important to mention, I think this was also later in my presentation that that didn't make it, but <laughs> it's also really important to understand that, you know, your preservative system is also interacting with your packaging type. So for example, we had a client that really wanted to use this, this bamboo lid on a product um, with no liner on the lid. And they weren't understanding why there was a lot of mold growing on their bamboo lid. And it was because, you know, bamboo is wood, which is a really great bacteria food source and mold food source. And so it's really important to make sure that you have a broad spectrum preservative that works with the formulation. So in the right pH, um, in the right, you know, making sure that it's entered in the right area of the formulation, um, because that's one thing that you definitely don't want to compromise. So you oftentimes find yourself maybe using one to two preservatives in order to achieve this. Now you were starting to talk about ingredient compatibility with formula, mm -hmm. the system, the packaging, and I'm sure this was also like in your presentation, and I'm so sorry, but do you want <laughs> to okay. expand on this, how, how brands should be thinking about this? I mean, ultimately this is how their chemists should be thinking about this, but maybe think mm -hmm. they should be aware here, and then why as a consequence, testing everything is very important. Yeah, I mean, stability is key, right? And I think 
what I like to think of formulations as that they're a whole system of all these little interactions um, embedded into them. So for example, when you have something like a retinol or a vitamin C, these are very photosensitive ingredients. And they're also really heat sensitive ingredients, which is why, for example, we tend to add extracts in the cool down phase in a formulation. So it's really important to really know the constituents of your formula through and through and how they are impacted by all sorts of environmental things such as light and heat. So if you're using photosensitive and light sensitive ingredients, it's probably your best bet to, if you do wanna you know, create a product that has these, invest in packaging that's compatible with your formulation. And that tends to be you know, with retinols and vitamin Cs and photosensitive and heat and light sensitive ingredients. Those tend to be airless packaging or at the very least clear packaging. I mean, opaque packaging instead of clear packaging. Um, because you really want to make sure that the integrity of your formulation is sustained over a long time. I do recommend, because later on into my presentation, I go into the types of testing that are really necessary. So there's stability testing, which tests whether your product you know, stays intact over a long time. There is preservative testing, which again tests like the potential for yeast and mold to grow. I do really also encourage a third type of testing, which is not always um, required by a lot of folks, which is compa package compatibility testing, because that is specifically there to see whether, you know, your formula is really compatible with your packaging type. And I think that's why you see a lot of brands go to market and there tends to be recalls because that's something that, you know, they really could have curbed in the, in the earlier stages of their product development, have they invested a little bit of that time to make sure they, they got those results. Uh, so you guys in YouTube, or I mean, everyone who's watching, hopefully you're okay. We're going to go a little bit longer because I'm so sorry to the presentation. I want to get more questions. And we're going into legend, April. If you're watching this, I'm sorry. We're going to go a little bit later, but maybe I'll also give you more time. Bring your lunch right? in the audience. Yeah, bring your lunch. Okay, so we had a lot of really great questions on YouTube. The first one is from Benji, who asks. Can you say that minimal formulations are not highly effective formulations? And I guess that means, like, what do you mean by minimal formulations? Um, yeah, you, how minimal are we talking? <laughs> so. um, a min like, by minimal formulation, meaning, like, it has less ingredients than, like, the average formulation, I think. Is that what you think that means? So I feel like you could take this from two angles. So you can take it from like the ordinary angle where they okay. have like a humectant and active and mm -hmm. then a preservative and like that's their whole formula and then you use lots of things, but it's a very simple formula. But the way mm -hmm. that I also see it, and this is actually something that I like and I'll get it into in my own presentation, um, but it's stream, like you don't have to have that much ingredients. Yes, just have like right. an emulsifier system, have a like very simple formula that doesn't right. have a whole bunch of embellishments. Right. So maybe yeah. you could take both <laughs> angles. <laughs> yeah, so in my head, these are actually quite similar, right? Because of course you need the bare bones of a formulation. For example, if you're doing a serum, you want your thickener, you want your water phase, you want your preservatives, you want your chelating ingredients. If you're doing emulsion, you want, of course, your emulsifier, oil phase, water phase, preservatives, so on. Um, this actually tends to be one of, I think, one of the smartest approaches to formulating a product, because I think what people don't understand about being more minimalistic is that, of course, it's more cost effective in many, in many cases, right? Granted that your ingredients, you know, hit their MOQs when they go to upscale and so on and so forth. But there, we've actually seen a lot of success on the market of quote unquote minimal formulations. For example, people love the ordinary because it's more cost effective. It only includes, you know, what's necessary in the formulation and leaves the rest. So Molecules is also a really great example of a brand that's doing this um, because, again, it includes what you need and omits the rest. I think what people don't understand about formulations that have a lot of bells and whistles as well is that there are a lot of ingredients that are more so there for claims, but being regarded as performance ingredients, such as, you know, I tend to see this done with extracts and, um, you know, like thickeners in the formulation. So I think if you are looking to do a minimal formulation, there's not, not necessarily an argument for it being less performant, less performancy. <laughs> However, I would say that that's actually a really great place to start, right? See if you can get the efficacy that you want and desire with the least amount of ingredients um, possible. 
um, because you know the more bells and whistles you add, you're you're only increasing your cost. And in many cases, like mentioned earlier, you're also kind of increasing the potential for stability issues if you really try and just go like haywire with adding all kinds of things that may not be necessary for the product. So that's why whenever I, I get folks thinking about a product, start first with your performance ingredients. So and, and after that, just see if it works. <laughs> and then go and add certain things um, to make sure that you have your bells and whistles included. Uh, this next question is from L'Oreal. I'm sorry, I probably mispronounced your name. Um, first, you are so inspiring. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was cut off. The rest of the presentation oh, was good. <laughs> uh, the question, what are some of the challenges you face when conducting clinical research geared to black consumers and underrepresented groups? Yeah, so, I mean, just like many things, I would say clinical testing as a whole industry has a diversity problem. And one of the biggest diversity problems that I see there is enrollment and participation. It's almost as if whenever there is less enrollment of people with darker skin tones, that there's a whole area of data that's just not being captured in relation to a specific ingredient and its performance, as well as specific product types and their performance. So I would say that's kind of one of the biggest concerns that I see, because if there's less data being captured, and of course, there's less knowledge about how certain things are, you know, maybe in terms of performance and interaction with certain skin types, which isn't always going to be like a super duper necessity, but it is nice to have, right? Because if it's there for all different types of other skin types and skin tones, why not also have that data captured for people that look like me? Uh, this next question uh, is Dr. from Dr. Parisa, who asked, is it more affordable to hire an independent cosmetic chemist to own the formula versus hiring the contract manufacturer to formulate in buying the formula through them? In many cases, no. <laughs> in many cases, it is not more affordable. Um, however, I would say, and like, I have no agenda behind this, I would say it's most definitely worth your time. And it's most definitely worth the investment. And one of the biggest reasons I see for this is because we get a lot of brands coming to us that were going to, um, you know, a contract manufacturer, which this route works for a lot of folks, right? Um, especially if you have a great relationship with your contract manufacturer. But we do get a lot of brands coming to us that say, you know, we've had something working for us, but the main issue is that we see ourselves going to an exit towards the end of this road and we don't own our formula IP. And that's a really important thing to have, um, you know, regardless of any route that you go. But that's like one of the main things that I see is why people are, you know, really divesting and going towards freelance formulators. Uh, I thought this question was interesting, considering this is something that brands are going to have to navigate if they want to be sold in, in certain retailers. So this is from Alexis, who asks, is there a source that helps with guidelines for clean ingredients, i.e. the EU is more strict than the U.S.? I mean, maybe you can comment on that. Is there a source mm -hmm. that can help guide in development so you can avoid reformulation? And maybe I'll also say, like, um, Kind of where I'm coming from it from the retailers are like mm. guidance for brands or like suggestions for brands for navigating all these like mm -hmm. no no lists that's like reality they're just going to have to. Yeah, yeah. So we actually use one of our our, our most wonderful I think partners at Zula Labs is Good Face Project. We partner with them to screen retailer lists and clean beauty lists because like you mentioned, Jen, these tend to be quite tedious. And like at the end of the day, the brands, if they want the seal, they're gonna have to. Um, but a more, I would say like bare bones way to doing this is definitely go to the retailer list, write these all down and just be really aware of, you know, what kinds of ingredients that they, you know, mention are like, I guess, flagged on their retailer list. I will say this gets a little bit more difficult and you know when to hire a professional for this when it's a percentage thing, an ingredient percentage thing that it has to deal with your ingredient composition. So for example, 1% phenoxyethanol, and like this is just regulatory, but 1% phenoxyethanol is the regulatory ceiling for how much phenoxyethanol you can add. You may be thinking in your head, I'm gonna add 1% phenoxyethanol and that's it. But you might forget that there are other extracts in there that are preserved with phenoxyethanol and maybe increasing that above one. And so once you get to a situation like that, I would definitely make sure to like go to professional and make sure that they screen and that you are, you know, hitting all the regulatory check marks. But, um, you know, we 
can help with that. Like I hate to be like, we can help with that, but you know, we use good face project and that's really helpful for that because it's just one click of a button. Okay, final question. Uh, again, sorry to April, we're going so late. And <laughs> your QA is going to be delayed. And I hope you guys in the audience want this extra long QA. I mean, like I would, because this is all really <laughs> valuable information. Okay, this question is from Dennis. I thought this was a really good one that brands really need to think about it because uh, the title cosmetic chemist isn't actually something that is regulated. Anyone can really mm -hmm. call themselves that. So what specific things should you look for in your search for a cosmetic chemist? Oh my gosh. So you should definitely look for a cosmetic chemist that has a little bit more forward looking insight across the value chain. And what I mean is that the chemist is usually your first stop in your road towards getting your product developed. Um, or maybe you're a marketer, you know, but a chemist is early, right? Because you want to make the product first. Um, but this chemist should definitely have knowledge of, you know, what might happen in scale up, um, what might happen in regulatory, what kinds of claims you might be able to get off of your product, what packaging types you might want. The chemist is responsible for, yes, making it, but everything else uh, like down the line is pretty dependent on your formulation. So if you have a chemist that mainly only knows about the chemistry, but not much about scale up and doesn't know that they may need to take specs that may be translated over to manufacturer or doesn't know that, you know, you might want a, an opaque bottle for like a retinol formulation. Um, you're going to definitely at some point down the line needs for formulating, which is more expensive, more time consuming, so on and so forth. So I would just say like, definitely have a chemist that has that. And I say forward looking because those are steps down the line that, really have to do with, um, you know, how quickly you can go to market and how safely and effectively you can go to market. So that's like my biggest, biggest piece of advice to look for. Thank you so much. I'm sorry again for the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <You're> all good. <laughs> uh, and stay tuned, you will see the whole presentation tomorrow. But thank you so much, AJ. AJ and also like she just, uh, did her thesis proposal and then made her presentation and like how horrible is it <laughs> to <your> place? <laughs> thank you place so thank you okay have a great rest of your sunday thank you again you too bye okay so now we're moving on to the next one which is averil's uh legal 101. our next presenter is averil love Counsel at KL Gates Los Angeles office, where she is a member of the Commercial Disputes Practice Group. After spending years defending medical devices and pharmaceutical manufacturers, particularly in the context of recalls, Averill has considerable knowledge of FDA's regulatory regime and enforcement activities. She has defended companies in numerous industries facing consumer and e commerce claims based on products liability, advertising, marketing practices, website accessibility consumer context, data security, and privacy issues. She also has defended clients facing regulatory enforcement over quality and import-export issues, as well as business-to-business -business disputes involving antitrust, fraud, trade secrets, and other parts. Avril has developed significant expertise serving personal care and consumer product companies facing these very issues. She acts as both a coach and a line of defense, observing clients' field positions to anticipate and identify risks, training internal teams to independently navigate and reputational risks in their daily decision-making, and proactively developing regulatory compliance and risk mitigation strategies that position clients to defend lawsuits long before they reach the courtroom. Without further ado, here's Averill's presentation. Hi. My name is Avril Love, and I wanted to thank Jen for inviting me to speak to you today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. So I work for a law firm called KNL Gates. I have been a litigator for over 15 years, and I started out representing companies that are regulated by the FDA, drug and, and device manufacturers mainly. Um, and in the last 10 or so years, I've really focused my practice on working with companies in the beauty and personal care space. And what I've found over the last 15 or so years is that by the time you're in a lawsuit, it's often really too late to do as well as you might have done uh, because the facts are what they are. 
And sometimes you really wish you could go back in time and do things differently. So what I do now in my practice is I focus on litigation avoidance through risk management. Uh, what that really means is that I advise clients on all kinds of business decisions that they're making with respect to product design, advertising claims, marketing practices that may not have anything to do with the type of product that they're making. Um, and then we talk about what the risks are of doing things a certain way uh, so that clients can make informed decisions and put themselves in the best position possible if and when inevitably they get sued, which often does happen when you are successful. So um, because I am a lawyer, I'm going to have to start with some disclaimers. This presentation that I'm giving is not legal advice. It's just for educational purposes. Uh, also, if you have access to this slide deck after this talk, which I hope you do, um, that's great. But be aware that it is not going to include every single thing that I've said here today. Um, and it's really just a subset of information that you may want to know in order to make decisions about your conduct. So um, be aware that this is not going to be completely exhaustive. Uh, the views that I'm sharing today are my own. They don't belong to my law firm. And most importantly, everything changes. So as soon as this presentation is over, it's going to be old. And while not obsolete, it's going to be um, something that you're going to need to look into and follow up on. It's very important to talk to a legal advisor who's up to date on things because things change very quickly. Regulations change. Litigation can change things. Um, and so it's very important to understand if you look back at this in a year or two years from now, it may be out of date. All right. And with that, we're going to get started. So I want to talk to you today about how to formulate product and design packaging, uh, things that you may need to consider in doing that, what you want to do to protect your intellectual property, crafting legal advertising claims and the data requirements for supporting those claims. Uh, and then importantly, marketing trends and litigation risks that are out there that you're going to want to know about. So formulating your product. A lot of times when clients come to me, they are doing that because they are getting ready to launch something that they've spent the last two years developing and they want legal approval. And the truth is that by then it's kind of too late to be looping in a lawyer or a regulatory consultant because you may not know that there are laws restricting ingredients um, or requiring reporting. Uh, and those might be things that you wanna know about when you formulate. So just keep in mind that there are a number of states that regulate ingredients, even though the federal government may not be doing that as much. Um, and so there are a number of ingredients, particularly PFAs, that are um, seeing a lot of ingredient bans that are gonna come into effect in 2025, but they're not the only ones. And uh, California is leading the way, but again, also other states are also uh, enacting certain ingredient bans that you're going to want to be aware of in formulating your product. Similarly, there are certain state agencies that regulate various areas. In this case, I have an example of the California Air Resources Board, which of course regulates air pollution and tries to minimize uh, certain emissions like VOCs. So it's important if you're selling certain kinds of products, anything sold in an aerosol, for example, like a dry shampoo or fragrance, uh, you're going to need to be aware of the CARB VOC limits for your particular type of product because the penalties for violation can be quite stiff. Uh, also, there are going to be a number of states that regulate certain ingredients in that they require disclosure if you are using ingredients that are deemed to be potentially hazardous. Uh, California, again, leading the way here and um, not so recently, 2020, enacted the, the FERCA, um, which regulates fragrance ingredients in particular for our industry. So it's really important to know um, whether any ingredients that you're considering in your formulation may in fact be listed on some of the, the lists that are deemed to be potentially hazardous ingredients that would require you to report. And that's important because A, you might wind up having to put an ugly warning label on your packaging under Prop 65. Uh, or B, very importantly, there are a lot of consumer attorneys out there who look at the publicly available lists of brands and products that include certain ingredients in their formulations. And they are, you know, they are looking to sue you and they are looking at these publicly available lists and, and sending out letters about um, the potentially hazardous nature of your product. All right. Now, packaging is another area where I probably wouldn't have been talking about this a year or two ago, 
Um, but a lot of regulatory change has happened with respect to packaging as states are looking to minimize plastic waste in particular um, and in regulating recyclability claims that are appearing on your packaging. So it's very important to know about states that are doing this um, because we're going to see this more and more with extended um, responsibility programs for producers of packaging. And um, these laws basically shift the burden of waste management to the manufacturers and the packagers. Uh, and what they're going to do is require that if you want to sell product in the states that have these laws, you're going to have to be a member of a producer responsibility organization, which is going to collect fees based on how much you sell. And it's going to um, facilitate certain recyclability efforts in, in the states that are enacting these laws and just generally managing um, how disposable packaging um, is made, what the contents of it are. And um, it's really trying to push to reduce the amount of virgin plastic that's used to encourage producers to use compostable and recyclable materials. Another area that you're going to want to think about in advance is your intellectual property. Uh, it's very important for you to figure out what is it that you want to own and um, how might you protect that? Because you may have a great idea and you're really excited to launch and to get sales happening. Um, but you may find, in fact, that you do have a great idea and it's very successful. Uh, and now you've got copycats maybe in the market and you want to make them stop uh, copying your product. So you would do that through um, perhaps registering a trademark and you'd wanna you know, know in advance if anyone else is using the name that you wanna be using. Um, so that's something you can do. It's also in our industry, very important to figure out who's gonna own your formulas um, because oftentimes contract manufacturers are making the formulas for us and, um, and then they own the formula but you may wanna own the formula. So that's something that you're gonna to wanna to figure out in the relationship when you are drafting a written contract with your contract manufacturer. And, and be aware that a purchase order is not really a written contract that is um, gonna have all of the terms that you're gonna want in a written contract. So it's very important, have written contracts and, and figure out how, um, how to define the relationship and who's gonna own what. Advertising claims. A number of regulatory bodies actually oversee advertising claims. Um, some of them are not government bodies, actually. So we have the FDA, which regulates cosmetics and drugs and other products. We have the FTC. The FTC regulates advertising for all manufacturers, all brands. And then we have the NAD, which you may not have heard of. It's not a government entity. It's actually a division of the Better Business Bureau. And the NAD works closely with the FTC. It's, it's actually a private self-regulatory body for the advertising industry. But um, although participation in their process is voluntary, if you don't participate, they may refer you to the FTC. Um, so it's very important to know about them if you get a letter from them, perhaps uh, from a competitor challenging a claim you've made. And they also have a monitoring program. Lastly, and probably most importantly, because you're most likely to encounter these folks will be the consumer attorneys. Uh, class actions are a really big piece of what shapes advertising. And it's very important to know about litigation trends so that you can um, craft your advertising claims in ways that minimize the risk. All right, I know that you're gonna hear from another speaker on the FDA and these specific laws that regulate cosmetics. So I'm not gonna go into this in depth. What I am going to do is talk about um, the various products that FDA regulates. This is important to understand when you are talking about creating your claims because the FDA regulates claims based on the product classification that your product has. You may be selling a cosmetic, you may be selling a drug, you may be selling a dietary supplement, um, which is a food technically. Um, and depending on what category your product falls in, that is gonna dictate the kinds of claims that you can make. So it's important to understand the definition and the differences between cosmetics and drugs and dietary supplements. Specifically, cosmetics are intended to be applied to the body 
and they're intended to enhance the attractiveness or the appearance of the wearer. That is separate and apart from drugs, which are intended to treat, mitigate, or prevent disease or diagnose disease. Um, and it's important to understand that cosmetics are not permitted to impact the structure or the function of the body. Uh, that, that goes beyond a cosmetic function. And that is really where a lot of risk comes from because actually what cosmetics can do in the market um, may be different from what the law deems them allowed to do. So it's really important to understand this because what you can prove that your product actually does is very different from what you are legally allowed to claim depending on what product category your product falls into. The FDA limits has limits on claims and they have nothing to do with what actually is true, but rather they're based on the intended use of your product as evidenced by your claims. So cosmetics can make claims that they impact the look and the feel of skin, hair, or the body. Whereas drugs might make explicit claims about diseases, um, reducing inflammation, um, perhaps treating rosacea and eczema. But drugs also may make claims about the impact on the structure or function of the body. They can talk about how perhaps um, a compound affects cells. That's not something that is really a cosmetic function. Dietary supplements, on the other hand, have this sort of in-between position. They are actually allowed to make claims about the structure and the function of the body, but you wouldn't want to make drug claims around a dietary supplement. So for example, you might say dietary supplements boost the immune system, but you would not want to say dietary supplements prevent infection. Now the FTC also regulates advertising claims, but it does that through a slightly different lens. It's not concerned about whether you're overstepping the limits of the product category that you're in. It's more concerned about whether your advertising claims are truthful and non-misleading to consumers. It's really important to understand that all of the claims that you make have to be supported by evidence before you make the claim in the market. And if you need to make some kind of qualifying disclosure to consumers to make a claim truthful, it's very important that that disclosure be made and that it be made in a way that is really unavoidable for consumers to see it. Even if they're looking at your advertising claim on their mobile phone. Uh, likewise, a claim can be misleading if it omits information that would be deemed to be material to a purchaser's buying decision. So it's really important to make sure that you're offering the consumer all of the information that they need to make an informed choice. Now, a brand is responsible for all of the claims that it really makes about its product, regardless of where those claims are. So yes, it's very important that your product labeling be truthful and accurate, but you also need to be thinking about what you're saying about your product on your website, uh, in your social, feeds. And then you also have to think about if you have relationships with influencers, what are they saying about your product? Because you're going to be responsible for what those influencers say about your product. Likewise, you're going to be responsible for consumer reviews that appear on any of your digital properties. And you may fairly or unfairly be responsible for consumer perception, meaning whatever a consumer takes away in terms of the message of your advertising, that's what you're responsible for. If they can reasonably take away a message, even if you didn't mean that thing, you're going to be responsible for that. So it's very important to have data to support all of the marketing claims that you make, whether those claims are explicit or implied claims. It's important to understand the concept of an implied claim because you might be making a claim that you don't really think you're making um, through visual advertising, maybe before and after uh, pictures, or even through a color that you're using in conjunction with other claims on your website. So it's important to know that the FDA and the FTC are going to look at the totality of all of the claims that you are making. And that's how they're going to figure out whether you're making an express or implied claim about something that you need to support. I get the question a lot, how much substantiation do I need? How much data do I need to support my claim? What do I need? 
And the answer is that that is claims driven. So you're gonna wanna understand how strong your claim is, and that's gonna drive what kind of data you need. Uh, I've organized this list of sample claims from top to bottom in order of the strongest claim to sort of the least strong claim in terms of the support that it needs. So if you are making a claim because you sell a dietary supplement that your product supports the immune system, that's a health claim. And health claims must be supported with what's considered to be the gold standard of substantiation, which is clinical data. Likewise, if you refer to a clinical test, if you say something is clinically proven, well, you better have a clinical test. And if you are making a claim that is hard for a consumer to evaluate the veracity of on their own, because for example, you use um, a percentage, some kind of numeric value for something like hydration, that's something that a consumer might have a hard time evaluating on their own. And so you're gonna to wanna to have clinical data for that too. Now, lots of brands really don't make claims about safety. Most brands don't make explicit claims about the safety of their product. But that is a claim that is always implied if you are selling a product in the market. It is always implied that your product is safe. And so it is extremely important that you have support for the safety of your product. That's also now particularly important because um, MOCRA, which just amended the FDCA, is going to require that you have substantiation for the safety of your product. Now, there is also sometimes uh, an instance when in vitro data can be helpful. Typically, I don't think it is that valuable to have in vitro support for claims because that does not tell you a lot about how your product is actually going to operate when people use it. Um, but you might make, for example, a microbiome claim that really cannot be proven other than with in vitro data. Similarly, you might be making a claim that requires survey evidence, like four out of five dermatologists recommend. Lastly, there are claims that um, may be easier for consumers to evaluate the truthfulness of on their own. And those claims are often best supported with consumer perception studies. That's not quite as re scientifically reliable, but it's adequate for claims, um, for example, that your product makes hair soft and smooth, which is something that consumers can figure out on their own for themselves. Um, and then lastly, there are claims that are just really opinion claims and are not really possible to prove because the issue is subjective. So whether your product comes in three delightful scents uh, may actually not require any proof that the scents are delightful because that's just a matter of opinion. But you would want to have substantiation that there are, in fact, three separate scents, and you could substantiate that with your formulation. Okay, so this is a list of the various different kinds of um, data that you can use to support uh, a product claim. And what's really important to know is that the legal standard for claims substantiation is really based on whatever science requires to support that claim. It's going to depend on the type of product that you make. So for example, if you intend uh, to be selling a product for health, that's gonna require a very high level of substantiation. It's also gonna depend on the claim that you're making. Um, so as I discussed, you, know, you might have a claim that is easy for consumers to evaluate, but it might be hard for consumers to evaluate. And that's gonna dictate the type of data that you need. Also very important, what is the scientific standard for the reliability of your evidence? And then um, what's the quality of your evidence? Does it actually show that your product does what it says it does? And, and is the data that you're using relevant to your product? So for example, if you're relying on a study of a particular active ingredient that you use, well, that study may have tested that active ingredient um, at a higher dose than what's actually in your formula that's not really going to be relevant to your product. And so it's not very useful evidence to rely on. Similarly, if um, a test is done in a population of people that isn't your target market, that's not gonna be very relevant and it's not gonna be helpful for you to support your claims. It's also really important to know that you need to look at the totality of evidence that may exist about your product or a particular active ingredient on which you rely. 
you are not free to ignore unfavorable evidence in making a claim. You can't just say, oh, well, look, at there's this one study here that says this, so I can say that, um, and ignore evidence that might be contrary. You have to have a good reason to ignore any contrary evidence. Um, and it may be that, you know, there's some testing that isn't relevant to your target market. So you, you know, aren't going to consider that and that's fine, but there has to be a scientifically reliable reason to, um, to indicate, uh, to ignore any contraindicating evidence. All right, now marketing trends and litigation risks. A lot of litigation that I see actually doesn't have to do with claims at all. It has to do with how our clients market their products. And there are a lot of hot issues that we are seeing regulators and consumer attorneys focused on. Consumer reviews and influencers. So I talked about this a little bit earlier. It's very important if you have relationships with influencers that you have contracts with them so that you can regulate their behavior and monitor it and police their, their claims about your brand. It's very important that any influencers that you work with are familiar with the FTC's guidance on claims and disclaimers. Um, and it's very important that if you are hosting consumer reviews, that you understand those reviews cannot say things about your products that you cannot say about your products. So if someone out there had a really great experience, um, but they've made a claim about something that you cannot support, that's not a review that you can host on your website without incurring risk. Similarly, there are a number of um, issues related to, let's say, negative review suppression, review hijacking, miscounting of reviews that are getting a lot of attention from regulators and are the subject of certain regulatory rules that are coming out. Green and clean claims are a very big, hot issue right now. Regulators are paying a lot of attention. Consumer attorneys are paying a lot of attention. We are going to see a lot of litigation around these kinds of claims. So it's important to follow the rules that exist and make sure you're not greenwashing. The best thing to do is to use narrowly tailored claims that you have evidence to support. Subscriptions. Lots of brands want to sell their products on subscription models, and that's fine. But it's important to know that something like 33 states have auto renewal laws that regulate those kinds of subscription models. And you've got to follow the rules related to what disclosures to make, uh, whether your consumers are going to get reminders before an auto charge, uh, what the cancellation options are. The FTC has proposed a new rule that will require click to cancel when it goes into effect, um, which is not something that a lot of brands are doing yet. So it's very important to know about these rules and to avoid what, what are called dark patterns, um, where you kind of hide important information because maybe it's covered under a banner and it's hard to see on a mobile phone. Consumer privacy is another really big emerging issue. Um, 15 states have now passed consumer privacy laws that offer comprehensive rights to consumers. Those laws are not all in effect yet, and they won't be for some time, but some of them are. Uh, and they may not affect your small business yet, but it is important to know about them because consumers are starting to clamor for these rights. And also because these privacy laws have spurred consumer litigation around consumer privacy, maybe not under these new laws, but under old laws that are being sort of Frankensteined into new things. And so, um, it's important to understand what your marketing department is doing, what marketing tools you are using, because a lot of them do involve tracking of consumers and sharing of data with analytics partners, um, with you know pixel tra tracking. Uh, if you have videos that you offer on your website and where uh, viewing history is available or shared with vendors, that's something that can expose you to litigation. And so it's very important to be aware of what tools you're using to market and um, whether there's data sharing so that you can avoid trendy consumer litigation. All right, so I know that's a lot. And I'm just going to give you the key takeaways. Design your formulas and your packaging with new regulatory rules in mind. It can be very expensive to change your formula or your package. It can take a long time but those are issues that create a lot of risk. So it's important to get it right. You wanna protect your IP. You need to plan what you're gonna own. And then it's very important after you do that to monitor what your competitors are doing in the market and enforce your rights. If you don't enforce your rights, you can lose them. 
craft your claims consistent with your risk tolerance. Ultimately, it is a brand's decision. Someone like me can tell you what the risks are, whether you're making a drug claim or not. Um, at the end of the day, it is going to be your decision what claims you want to make, how much risk you want to take. But it's important to know what those risks are so that you can make informed choices and make sure that you have as much data as you can to support your claims and minimize risk. You want to make sure your data is reliable and it's going to stand up if you have to defend it in court. And then lastly, you want to market, uh, you want to monitor your marketing practices to avoid any pitfalls in litigation. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. Thank you so much to Avril for that presentation. And I am just bringing her over to the screen to answer your questions live. And we got quite a few. So the first one I'll ask is from Discord. For the trademarking of a brand name, would it be global or only local to the country of the origin? Is it a time consuming and very costly process? Bringing her over to the screen to answer your questions live. And we got sorry, just getting oh, two different so feeds. First one I'll ask I think John maybe if you mute yourself. Uh, while I'm talking, that will help it. And then also headphones, but other otherwise, uh, if you just mute yourself while I'm talking, then that will resolve all the issues. Okay, that's my question, and I'll stop talking. Um, you are muted right now. <laughs> so if you want to unmute yourself now to answer the question. So, uh, I'm sorry, I have a terrible delay. So I'm getting the question and then I'm hearing it again. And I'm afraid when I unmute myself, you're just going to hear everything all over again. Um, okay. All right. So, um, I'm sorry, but because I was getting two feeds, I, I missed the question. Can you just repeat it? If you want to unmute yourself now, that's the question. I'm sorry. I oh, that is so odd. Bear with us as we figure out what's happening right now. Okay, hold on. I just paused my live feed, so that's going to help, I think. Why oh, don't that's to that is totally that is totally what was happening. Okay, we figured it out. Okay, okay, I'll ask the question again. Okay, the question was. For the trademarking of brand names, would it be global or only local to the country of origin? And is it a time consuming process? And is it also very costly? Okay, so the answer is you can do you can do uh, separate trademarks for you know, US or other um, countries. You may want to do it globally, in fact, um, because you know if you're planning to export, that would be something you'd want to do. Um, so you know, it just kind of depends on what you're willing to do in terms of the investment. It, it, I actually think that um, you can you can do that in pieces so that it makes it more affordable. Um, you know, in the short term at least, and so that you can um, do it to align with the markets where you're selling. Uh, is it very expensive? I suppose that's relative. Um, but I think in terms of what you're spending on your formulations, probably not. Uh, this next question is from LJ, who asks, what type of data proves the safety of a product? I'm not sure if you're the person to answer this. It may have been an earlier person. You're exactly right. So that's yes. really a question for science, not for legal. Um, but again, the, the legal standard for what kind of data you need is really what does science require is, you know, you need to have evidence that is going to be scientifically reliable and would stand up in court. Uh, and so what kind of data, you know, you need for safety substantiation? Well, you know, I mean, what I often see is I see HRIPT, I see uh, sometimes toxic toxicological risk assessments. Uh, but again, it just, it depends on the product that you're making and, and what science would require for that. And so for that question, you might want to re-watch the presentations by Craig covered it in the claims presentation, but also 
AJ and Erica covered this a little bit. And then also Mo also covered this a little bit from the safety talk. So there's a little bit of patchwork for you guys to refer to. Okay, the next question, this is a common, I would say, misconception, and I think it's important to cover from Kenneth, who asked, if I use X ingredient where the ingredient manufacturer claims that this ingredient delivers a certain benefit to the skin, can I repeat this claim? This product contains so-and-so, which does X, Y, Z. Right, great question. We see this a lot. Uh, indeed, the ingredient suppliers make all kinds of claims about their um, their products. The question is always, what data do you as the brand have to support the claim? Because at the end of the day, you're going to be responsible for the claims that you make. And it is not going to be sufficient in litigation to turn around and say, well, we said it because they said it. Uh, the answer is you need to be doing your own due diligence. So unless you have a written contract wherein your ingredient supplier takes full legal responsibility and provides you with indemnification, for claims they've made upon which you died in the market, which you're probably not gonna get in your contract. Uh, I would not recommend simply relying on something that the ingredient supplier tells you in let's say their um, informational brochures. That's effectively advertising. That's how plaintiff attorneys are gonna cast it when you try to introduce it as evidence. It's really not very useful. So if your ingredient supplier has a brochure where they're showing you an excerpt or some kind of a graph from their data, um, you should ask them for the underlying data because that you can rely on and um, that can be very useful to you in supporting the claim if they're willing to share it. Uh, Kenneth follows up uh, noting that you're based in the USA and refer to the USA a lot, which is a particularly litigious uh, society or a community. Uh, can you advise for other countries as well or give any insights there? Well, I do know quite a bit about what's happening in Europe, but I really cannot advise you about that because I am licensed in the United States of America. So you're right uh, that a lot of the advice that I'm giving really is applicable to the US. Um, and uh, we do have a number of attorneys. My law firm is global. So we do have attorneys in Europe and in Asia who could help you with this, um, but I'm not that person. Uh I will I will also say that like ingredient comments, uh, if a if an ingredient manufacturer is saying a claim like this is generally an, what not to do to make that claim for your formula, because from a formulation point of view, formulation is everything. So just because an ingredient does something doesn't mean that that's going to pan out in the formula. OK, I'll stop talking. This next question is from Ted Dara, who asks, can a signature fragrance be patented? or would that be trademarked? Uh, that's a good question. And it would depend on, I mean, whether you have a novel process or some something, no, a patent requires something novel um, that no one else has done before. Whereas a trademark is just something that no one else is using. So it would depend. This next question is from Dr. Laura who asks or comments, I'd love suggestions on how to ensure packaging vendors are MOCRA compliant. Um, right. What do you think about that? Packaging vendors are MOCRA compliant? That is, yeah. oh, and then she also said also formulators. Okay, um, right. Yeah. So, so the FDA now under MOCRA is requiring that certain facilities be um, registered. So they that's they simply need to register with the FDA. They may there may be you know the FDA is going to have um, new GMPs coming out, and so you know those are the kinds of things that you need to be thinking about in terms of your third party vendors. Uh, but you need to address that in your written contracts with them, right? So you want to make sure that they're making a representation and warranty to you that they are in fact complying with the law, um, and then you can ask them. You can just ask them. Let me see your FDA registration. Um, and tell us what your CGMP is, uh, you know, they, they can make those representations to you in contract and that should be sufficient for you. Um, beyond that, you know, with respect to packagers, it would just be the, the registration um, and the CGMP, I think. Um, and most of the, most of the other um, requirements of MOCRA 
are really going to be not necessarily applicable to those folks, right? Like maintaining safety substantiation, for example, is the brand's responsibility, but it might be helpful to know what their recall uh, protocols are. Do they have an SOP for a recall in case, you know, there is one because now the FDA um, actually has, has the ability to institute a recall. So, you know, what would be the, what would be the procedures for them to work with you in the event that there, you know, is some investigation of what's what's happened, you know, if you need to do a root cause analysis as part of your recall, for example. Um, she followed up with, is there a website we can confirm the manufacturer is registered? Oh, well, you know, the FDA has been very, very slow in rolling out their um, their database for this. So it's not, you know, it's not even possible as yet to list your products, which, you know, the deadline tech tech was originally the end of December. It's now been extended under MOCRA because the FDA has been so slow in getting this up and running. So there may at some point be a place where we can all go to look, just as there is with drugs and, and devices, um, but as yet there isn't. Uh, this question comes in from LJ. There's two questions that are related, so I'll ask them both. Well, there's multiple, but they're all related. So. Do you have a trade? Do you have to trademark or patent your cosmetic formulation? That was the first part, and then additionally, how do you know if your custom formulation isn't already used, isn't already trademarked or patented, isn't already used? Could be potentially a challenge, depending if you're working with a country manufacturer. That it depends on what you're doing there. So I'll stop talking about that. Is it based on what ingredients are being used, or based on the percentages of each ingredients being used? Okay. But to start that question, do you have to trademark or patent cosmetic formulations? No, you don't. So that's easy. You don't have to if you don't want to. Um, it would be, though, probably important to just look and make sure that nobody else has done that because then you might be at risk of, you know, like, for example, if you're developing your product name, you wouldn't want to use a name that someone else has trademarked. Um, so you might want to do a check for that so that you don't get in trouble um, and, and so that you don't have to then, you know, stop using. If you get a cease and desist letter, you don't want to have to stop using something that you, you know, a name that you've already used and you've printed all over all of your packaging. Um, that could be expensive. Um, so you might want to check for that. But you're not required to patent or trademark anything if you don't want to. Um, as for the other questions. Frankly, I'm not an IP lawyer. I would always refer you to a colleague of mine for a lot of this work. So I don't want to get too much into the weeds on these um, because that's really beyond my expertise. But what I would say is that, um, you know, sometimes it can be hard to know if something's already patented. And the way to then go about it is to make the application and um, the patent and trademark office will tell you if somebody's already done it. But I think that that's also one of the functions of doing a search in advance. Um, this next question comes from uh, comes from Hansen, who comments that I am a Canadian-based brand. Uh, what are my legal responsibilities selling a cosmetic product into the U.S.? So I guess the general question: If you're from Canada or maybe even another region. What are the requirements for selling in the United States legally? Well, the legal requirements for any foreign brand are the same as they are for a U.S. domestic brand. It's just that then you have, in addition, um, the issue of customs, right? So you just have to make sure that you're complying with the customs rules. So you'd have to have a marking um, on your label that says made in Canada, uh, if that is, in fact, the case where you're manufacturing. If not, you know, it may, maybe you're manufacturing somewhere else and um you know your your brand is based in Canada so it might say like manufactured in China distributed from Canada but you know um that's really the additional issue is is just that you're going to be um an importer okay so this probably is a good place to end this q and I'm sorry for going so far over and then pushing your presentation so into lunch. I guess this is the benefit of you being at the lunch break because we could do this. So thank you so much, April, for that super informative presentation. Uh, yeah. 
So I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. And for everyone, there will be a replay. I had this question throughout the day. So don't you worry. You'll get it to your email probably tomorrow. So thank you so much, Avril. And thank you for having me, Jen. Have a great one. Okay, we are going to head into now what's only going to be a 30 minute lunch break. So I'm going to mute my mic and leave you guys to lunch. And we will be back at 1 p.m. Eastern time with a presentation from Allison Kent Gunn, otherwise known as Allison Turquoise on packaging.
Our next presentation is by Allison Turquoise Kent Gunn, who started in B2B sales six years ago, working for a skincare laboratory that emphasized science-based skincare formulating and marketing. She then expanded into B2B packaging sales and currently works as a sales director at Berlin Jancy, where she collaborates with brands ranging in size from indie to international. Working in the cosmetics packaging industry has fueled her passion for sustainability, which she pursues by teaching college-level cosmetic packaging classes at FITM, as well as using her Instagram presence to help educate consumers and brands alike on the nuances of sustainability and packaging. Without further ado, here's Allison's presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Allison and I'll be taking you through the packaging section of today's summit. I want to challenge you to think of product packaging not just as a vessel for your product formula, but as the primary marketing for your product. Most beauty consumers will never visit your website and read your about page. They just won't. But many of them may stumble across your product on retailer shelves or in a user-generated video on TikTok or Instagram. And in that case, the only branding they will be exposed to is the branding on your product packaging. Your product packaging will act as a first impression for beauty consumers. So ask yourself, what do I want to communicate with my product packaging? What do I want to tell? What do I want to project? What story do I want to narrate to my ideal consumer? Before consumers test the product formula, they see and feel the product packaging. So I encourage you, do not underestimate the importance of product packaging as your brand's silent spokesperson. Let's look at some examples. Prior to even reading the text on your product packaging, consumers will pick up on subliminal branding cues, like packaging shape, colors, finishes, and textures. Let's take this packaging, for example. What associations come to mind when you look at this package? There's no text granted, but based purely off subliminal branding, maybe you start to associate this brand with a minimal approach to beauty given its very minimal branding colors. Or perhaps you look at its soft earth tone colors and the stone-like finish on the bottle and think to yourself, hmm, it seems like this brand might utilize more natural ingredients in their product formulas. Based purely off these two observations, you may assume that this is a skincare brand that utilizes plant-based ingredients and encourages consumers to take a more minimal approach to their skin health and wellness. All of that based purely off of product packaging. Let's look at another example, but I want us to really zero in on color for this one. Here are three beauty brands that all target a different generation. Can you determine which generation each brand is targeting based purely off the colors? For Kylie Cosmetics, if you guessed millennials, you would be correct. This brand utilizes tons of millennial pink, a color that is relatively popular amongst millennial consumers, although I do want to point out that this color has started to lose some traction as many of today's consumers are shifting their preferences to more gender-inclusive colors and minimal packaging. Next we have Florence by Mills, so for Florence by Mills if you guessed Gen Z you would be correct. This brand utilizes tons of Gen Z purple, a color that is popular amongst Gen Z consumers. Some have interestingly theorized that this color is particularly popular amongst this generation because it's a combination of the masculine associated blue and the feminine associated pink, which could be a nod to Gen Z possessing a less rigid gender association and embracing gender fluidity. Last is Woman S, and this one may be a bit of a challenge if you're not of a certain age, but this brand targets menopausal and postmenopausal women. The signs of menopause often start around the age of 50, hence why this brand may have chosen the colors purple and red, which are so closely associated with the Red Hat Society. For those of you that aren't familiar, the Red Hat Society is an organization that encourages women over the age of 50 to live life to the fullest, particularly in their later years, as many women seek to reinvent themselves once they retire and are no longer actively mothering their children. I have to say this is one of my favorite uses of color branding that I've seen on the market. All right, now that we've discussed branding, let's go ahead and jump into custom versus stock packaging. Custom packaging must have a custom packaging mold created, whereas stock packaging is packaging that already has packaging molds developed and ready to use. There are pros and cons to both custom packaging and stock packaging. Some pros for custom packaging is you do have increased packaging differentiation and you have ample opportunity to brand the packaging specifically to your brand and the product. 
Some cons associated with custom packaging are longer lead times, sometimes hefty tooling investments, which can range from four to five figures, and sometimes there are higher MOQs, which stands for minimum order quantities, associated with custom packaging. Designed to pursue stock packaging, some of the biggest pros are there's no tooling investments, usually stock packaging can accommodate lower MOQs, and oftentimes there's much, much shorter lead times. Some cons associated with stock packaging though is that you can't modify the packaging structure, it is what it is, and you are going to see this package most likely somewhere else on the market. Let's take a look at these airless jars here. These are all the exact same airless jar, and yet they're all decorated differently to give them all a unique kind of presence and personality on retailer shelves. Just because a component is stock doesn't mean you can't effectively brand it. Deco, which is short for decoration, can take a boring stock component and really give it a life of its own. Let's review some basic deco. All of these examples I included here are stock packaging, okay? So keep that in mind. Deco can really elevate a package, regardless if it's stock. So on the far left here, we have silk screen. So silk screening is incredibly common in beauty packaging. It's not only used for the brand and product name here, but also for that intricate floral design that you see in the background. Next, we have hot stamping. So hot stamping is used oftentimes for a brand name or logo to kind of elevate it and make it really pop and stand out on the package. Next, we have oversprays. So one very popular overspray is matte overspray. So if you don't want there to be any sort of glossiness or shine to a component, a matte overspray is what you want. We also have metallization, which is a metallic overspray. So if you want to give it a little bit more of an elevated, luxurious feel, metallization could be something you might want to consider. And then lastly, we have labels, which traditionally were mostly used on more mass or drugstore brands, but I've started to see them a lot more in the prestige beauty section as well. Just want to briefly touch on some of the most common materials used in beauty packaging. So obviously we have plastics. Some of the most common plastics used are PET, HDPE, MDPE, LDPE, and PP but we also use other materials like glass, aluminum, and paper. There's also different packaging categories. So for primary packaging, we mostly use plastic, glass, and aluminum, although sometimes paper is utilized as well. But for secondary and tertiary packaging, you're gonna see a lot more paper and cardboard. One thing I wanna highlight is that your formula and then your final packaging, meaning final packaging design and materials, should always be tested for compatibility. This is to help ensure that your product formula maintains its integrity in its final packaging. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about packaging sustainability. Sustainability is by far the biggest buzzword in the packaging industry today. It's important to note that there's not a one size fits all solution to sustainability. Sustainability has to be assessed product to product and it's impacted by numerous factors such as material, design, size, country of origin, manufacturing process, consumer use, and country of distribution. Before we get into some of the nuances of sustainable packaging, I first want to highlight why it matters. Annually, the global personal care and beauty industry generates 120 billion units of packaging. That is billion with a B, the majority of which is single-use plastic components. To put that number in context, there's 8 billion people on the planet. So for every one person on planet Earth, there are five units of personal care or beauty packaging being created annually. But isn't recycling the solution to the global plastic crisis? Unfortunately, no. The number one mistake I see brands make in the pursuit of sustainable packaging is an over-reliance on recyclability. Only about 5% of plastic waste in the United States is successfully recycled. Let that sink in. U.S. recycling streams have limited capabilities and recyclability is reliant on many factors like material, size, color, deco, and many more. But in addition to those, it's also dependent on demand and the ability for the recycling facility to recycle the component in a way that is time and labor efficient. U.S. recycling facilities are ultimately businesses and not nonprofits. So even if they have the ability to recycle material or component, if it's cost prohibitive, guess what? that component is going to the landfill. It's an ugly truth, but it's one that we really need to face as an industry if we're hopefully going to implement packaging solutions that have a positive impact given our current recycling limitations. So while many brands continue to rely on end-of-life recycling as their primary sustainability strategy, 
I'm a big believer that one of the most impactful sustainability strategies, lightweighting, starts much earlier in the life cycle during the design stage. Lightweighting is a design technique used to reduce the amount of material used per unit of packaging. Even small reductions in material per unit can have a huge impact when accumulated over time. You can see in this example that both jars have the same amount of product, yet one is significantly larger than the other. This is an example of overpackaging, which is basically the opposite of lightweighting. Overpackaging is often driven by a brand's desire to increase the size and impression of the product, since many consumers equate larger packaging to getting more product. It's also important to note that sustainable packaging is not one size fits all. And in most cases, a material can be sustainable in one respect and not so sustainable in another. Let's take glass, for example. Glass is often positioned as being sustainable, largely because it has a higher recycling rate in the US than plastic. However, one nuance that most brands and suppliers fail to consider is that glass creates more greenhouse gas emissions during manufacturing than many plastics. That's why it's imperative when we are discussing sustainable packaging to zoom out from solely looking at the packaging material and recyclability, and instead to look at the entire life cycle of a component. Many phases in a life cycle, like manufacturing and shipping, are often overlooked. So one of the best ways to get a big picture view of the impact of your packaging is to look at the life cycle analysis. A life cycle analysis, also abbreviated LCA, helps us understand all of the different factors that impact the sustainability of a component and better compare the ways in which a component is more or less sustainable to an alternative. For example, the skincare brand Stratia teamed up with Bluebird Climate in order to conduct a life cycle analysis on their new packaging and compare it with their previous one. As a result of the life cycle analysis, they were able to determine that this new product packaging generated 36% less carbon emissions generated 27% less waste, and used over a thousand pounds less virgin plastic per year compared to their previous packaging. And that brings me to the second most common mistake I see brands make when pursuing sustainable packaging. Let's talk refills. Refills only make sense for products with a very high repurchase rate. Generally, consumers need to repurchase a refill system an average of five times before the refillable packaging starts to have any sort of sustainability benefits. Why? Well, refillable packaging actually utilizes more materials and generally emits more greenhouse gas emissions than standard single-use components. However, if a product has a high repurchase rate, over time the refillable packaging can significantly reduce the amount of plastic that would otherwise have been utilized in single-use packaging. So while refillable packaging definitely can work, unfortunately, many brands overlook the fact that refillable packaging must align closely with their customer's repurchase behavior. Oftentimes, consumers will purchase a refillable product once or twice before they move on to the next must-have product. So can refillable packaging be an effective sustainability strategy? Yes, but it can also be counterproductive to a brand's sustainability strategy if it's not utilized properly. Next, let's jump into functionality. I know, I know, it sounds so obvious, but if your packaging does not function properly, therefore creating an inconvenient or messy experience for users, they are not going to repurchase. Doesn't matter how beautiful your branding or sustainable your packaging is, if it's inconvenient, consumers will not repurchase. Dove unfortunately experienced this very thing with the launch of their refillable deodorant. From a branding perspective, it was cute, compact, and convenient. Everything a consumer could want. And from a sustainability perspective, the refill had the potential to drastically reduce the amount of single-use plastic waste generated from such a highly repurchased product as a deodorant. However, consumers overwhelmingly left negative reviews of this deodorant as a result of subpar functionality. After only a couple uses, many consumers were complaining that the deodorant completely detached from the component with absolutely no way to reattach it. Frustrated and feeling highly inconvenienced, consumers took to the internet to share their experience and to advise other consumers to save their money. This is why functionality, as boring as it sounds, is absolutely paramount. If your packaging does not function properly, consumers will have a frustrating experience, as you can see, and ultimately it's going to create a negative association not only to the product, but to your brand overall. Okay, hang on, we're almost done, but I just wanna quickly wrap things up with a few key takeaways. So first for branding, remember your packaging is your first impression to beauty consumers. 
it is your silent spokesperson. So be sure to utilize your packaging accordingly. Custom versus stock packaging. While I know custom is very, very tempting to launch with, I highly encourage you to consider launching with stock packaging and utilize the different deco processes that are available to really help elevate your stock packaging. Sustainability. Sustainability is complex and it's highly nuanced. It has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, and oftentimes there's going to be pros and cons associated with any packaging decision you make. And lastly, functionality. It's boring, it's dry, no one wants to talk about it, but if your product packaging does not function, it is not going to get repurchased. That brings us to the end of today's presentation. Thank you so much for your time. If you're interested in connecting outside of the summit, I do have my email as well as my Instagram handle on the very last slide of this presentation please feel free to send me an email or shoot me a DM. Thank you so much to Allison for that presentation. Bear with me as I bring her over to the screen you guys are looking for, looking at. If you want to see my setup, you can go to my Instagram stories and see <laughs> how much I have going on in front of me. Uh, so we've got quite a few questions. I'll start with uh, one that the first question that we had on YouTube, which is from Tadara, who asks, how do you define luxury? Packaging, product, or a combination of both? Mm, that's a great question. Um, just to confirm, can you hear me okay, Jen? Great, okay, perfect. That's an interesting question. How do you define luxury? Um, a lot of it is going to be driven by price point, in my opinion. Um, so from a consumer's perspective, a lot of consumers will automatically put a product or a brand in the luxury category based almost entirely on the price point. However, there's also a lot of subliminal branding cues that go into suggesting to consumers that this is a product and a brand that's worthy of that luxury price tag. Uh, so in the case of packaging, of course, uh, a lot of times this is elevated deco finishes that aren't quite as common, perhaps, in the drugstore or mastige category. Um, a lot of times this also involves uh, custom componentry. So we see this a lot in fragrance in particular. So fragrance tends to be a category overall that leans more prestige, more uh, luxury. Um, so you'll see a lot of custom components for fragrance, uh, because again, it's a higher price tag. And a lot of times custom componentry can kind of just suggest to consumers that this is a more elevated product than, you know, a bath and body works body mist, if you will, and stock componentry with a label slapped on it. Um, so interesting question. But yeah, a lot of it starts with the price tag, in my opinion, but it's really reinforced, at least in the packaging side, um, through elevated deco. And then also a lot of times, uh, custom componentry or custom aspects to the componentry. Uh, this next question is from Miriam, who asks, what are your thoughts on reusable airless packaging that may be reintroduced into the value chain, i.e. customers returning packaging and it being reused. What's going on there? Oh, sure. Yeah. Great question, Miriam. So I think in an ideal world, we would all like to move towards a more uh, circular system for packaging. You know, uh, consumers purchase the packaging, they use up the product, and then at the end, instead of just disposing of it, um, the packaging is able to kind of be reincarnated in a way, uh, whether that's, you know, sending it back to the brand so that they can sanitize it and then reuse it um, or repurpose it to, you know, other components or products. Um, the biggest issue that I have heard brand founders say when they're exploring a, a model like you describe is cost. <laughs> um, you know, so obviously there's a cost to shipping products back and a lot of consumers are going to feel discouraged to participate in that if they're the ones having to pay for shipping. So, you know, assuming brands really want to incentivize this behavior in their consumers, uh, let's say they pick up the tab for shipping the products back. That's going to add up very quickly. I think shipping costs are costs that a lot of times brands uh, historically tend to underestimate. Uh, but then there's the whole sanitation aspect to it, too. There's a lot of concerns around that, especially, you know, with certain materials. Um, so, you know, it's a really 
challenging model to successfully implement, especially in a profitable way. Um, but, you know, I am seeing some brands start to implement it. Like I believe the brand Evolve together. Um, so they have refillable deodorants and the refill cartridge. Um, you can actually mail it back to them and they're able to then put it to use for, for future refill cartridges, uh, which is really interesting. Um, they're still a relatively new brand. So I'm really interested to see how their business model evolves uh, with this unique setup. Um, but I think, again, circular systems, very much the ideal. It's just pretty challenging to implement, at least in my experience. Uh, this next question is from Witch Jism, who asked, uh, would Indeco affect the recyclability of packaging? Uh, and then yes. accurately, what kind of Deco wouldn't? Sure. This is a great question. So um, as we just very briefly reviewed on Deco, um, silk screening is by far the most common. So silk screening generally doesn't have a huge implication for recyclability. Um, but once you start getting into more advanced Deco, like specifically, you know, foil or hot stamping, that can really impact the recyclability, um, particularly hot stamp. You know, a lot of brands really gravitate towards it for their logo or brand name because it really gives it just like an extra little dash of class, if you will. Um, but, you know, if you go too heavy handed on the hot stamping on your product packaging, it will impact recyclability. Um, so it's definitely something to be aware of. Um, a lot of times when it comes to like hot stamping in particular, um, they recommend trying to minimize the use of it throughout the component. Um, I've seen brands basically hot stamp like almost like an entire almost like color block, if you will, on their packaging. And um, therefore it would not be able to be recycled because of that. So it really varies a lot. But um, if you're doing just traditional, straightforward silk screening, um, you're, you're good. It's not going to impact the recyclability. Uh, this next question comes from Andrea who asks, what would you consider luxury packaging looks like in the future? How do you see custom mm -hmm. packaging evolving? Ooh, this is such an interesting question. I love it. It's so conceptual. Um, sure. So, I mean, the evolution of luxury packaging, I think is actually, we're going to see a little bit of a return of some materials um, that were more traditionally used in packaging in like the early 1900s. So a lot of glass, I think aluminum in particular, especially since aluminum is often positioned as being more sustainable. I think there's going to be a shift in consumer perception of what constitutes luxury from a packaging perspective. And I think there's going to be less of an emphasis solely on aesthetics. And I think there's going to be more of a sustainability aspect to it as well. And I think we actually do see this a lot because a lot of sustainable beauty brands really position themselves more as like luxury lifestyle brands in a way like sustainability does oftentimes come with a price tag. And I think that's something certain brands are really playing into living this sustainable lifestyle. So I think we're going to continue to see sustainability increase in popularity in packaging. Thank goodness. Um, but I also think the positioning of it, I think it's going to start to be equated a lot more with a higher price tag and really kind of this luxury lifestyle that maybe not everyone's able to afford, but if you are able to afford it, it's really kind of like a validation of your, your beliefs and even like social status It's like odd as that is. Uh, this next question is from Tanya on discord who asks, do you have a website that you would suggest that startups can use for packaging or any resources or any tips for brands in navigating packaging because there's a lot to it. Great question, Tanya. Yeah. Uh, when I started in beauty packaging, I was doing a lot of my own research, really trying to compile almost like a cheat sheet <laughs> that I could reference and that I could also uh, share with the brands that I was working with. And I found that it's very hit and miss when it comes to accurate packaging information, particularly in regards to sustainability. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have one source in particular that I would say I'm like 100% comfortable recommending. Um, I know from an indie brand perspective, if you're really looking to educate yourself and like 
actually manage hands-on a lot of your packaging development. There are some courses available. I have not taken any of these courses. So, you know, I can't say that, you know, I 100% recommend them, um, but they might be a good place to start. Um, they are a little bit pricey transparently, which I think is why this summit is so amazing is because education in our industry is so expensive. <laughs> but um, I think there's um, a resource called the Packaging School. So they have I believe in-person and online packaging courses that might be helpful at least, you know, to look into. Um, but yeah, unfortunately packaging resources, especially in regards to sustainability have been very, very challenging, even for myself to find as someone who works in the industry. So um, I wish I had a list of credible resources I could share, but unfortunately it's very, very hit and miss right now, in my opinion. Perhaps a recommendation could be to team up with the right packaging consultant because you don't have to That's know everything. <laughs> very true, very true, yes. <laughs> uh, this next question comes from David who asks, how do you see plant-based materials playing a role in the coming years, such as mycelium, sugarcane, and cactus leather? Do you have an up and coming material that you're excited about? Mm, good question. Um, so yeah, plant-based materials in the industry. Plant-based materials are getting a lot of hype right now, as they should. They're really exciting. It's a you know fantastic alternative to plastic, but they also come with some pretty big limitations. Um, a lot of times, especially in regard to the formula that they can be paired with. So you know, a lot of times, plant-based polymers can't be paired with water-based formulas. Uh, so there are some pretty strict limitations, and also these materials usually come with a pretty high price tag, as cool as they are. Uh, of course, I think the price will decrease as you know demand grows uh, and as we continue to innovate. But um, yeah, it's a very interesting category. And I am actually really excited to see the industry moving away from solely focusing on plant-based plastics. I think that was all the rage a few years ago. And I think a lot of suppliers invested very, very heavily in that. And there's absolutely a place for bioplastics, but I am glad to see that we're kind of expanding the realm in which we think pl uh, plants can really help to not just offer an alternative to plastics, um, but really hopefully become like a popular material in the future. Right now, the vast majority of packaging I do behind the scenes, plastic and glass, there's a little bit of aluminum thrown in there. So right now there's such a novelty to these plant-based materials. And I'm really hoping that they become like an actual staple within the industry and they're not just a passing trend. But um, as far as a favorite, I don't have a favorite yet. Um, I'm still kind of waiting to see how things play out in full transparency, but um, really, really exciting. Uh, a comment to Dr. Laura in Discord about my audio. I'll work on it in the next presentation. I've done what I can while I'm talking, but I, as I'm not talking, I will sort that out. Don't you worry. Okay, this next question comes from Alexis from YouTube who asks, what do you think will be the next banned plastics? Uh, for example, will we no longer use PCR? Well, I mean, I feel like everyone's moving towards, maybe you can talk about that. So what do you think? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so I think PCR is kind of the next big milestone for most brands and retailers. So there's a lot of retailers already requiring PCR minimums in packaging. Um, you know, as far as bans are concerned, I don't know. I can't say that I'm a fan of plastic bans uh, because I think plastic is demonized a lot in the industry. Um but, you know, actually, Jen, I think you did a fantastic video on this. If we were to switch all of our current beauty and personal care packaging over to alternatives, um, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we would be generating would be astronomically increased. Um, so, you know, from a ban perspective, I think right now the move is to increase the implementation of PCR content. Um, I'd actually really like to see instead of plastic bans, I would really like to see more of a focus on incentivizing brands, even if it's through the potential of fining, uh, to not overpackage. Overpackaging is so rampant in beauty and personal care products. Um, and I think that that's a, a huge, huge opportunity um, and a relatively straightforward one as well. I think there's a lot of challenges 
<laughs> Sometimes when it comes to trying to implement bans or requirements, um, not only, you know, throughout the state, but throughout the entire U.S., um, things vary so much state to state with certain requirements, recycling facilities, you know, actual, you know, supply of PCR content. So I would really like to see some more proactive incentives, let's say, uh, for brands to move away from overpackaging and hopefully encourage lightweighting. Well, that's all the time that we have for this Q&A. But if you have any more questions for Allison, perhaps she'll go to YouTube and answer your questions there. Also, she's on Instagram. So ask your questions. And like I said for Bo's presentation, ask them in her comments. That's really great. Instead of DMing, comment. Thank you so much, Allison. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now. The next presentation is me. I'm not going to bother with the introduction. If you ended up at this conference, you probably know who I am. And if not, I have an about page. I hope you enjoy my presentation. And without further ado, here it is. So I'm going to be giving the 101 on sustainability and beauty presentation. There's a lot to cover for sustainability. It's quite a nebulous topic, but I hope some of the information covered in this presentation will give you some of the tools so that you can start more effectively thinking about sustainability and incorporating this into a business. For groundwork, I think it makes sense to start by defining what do we mean when we say sustainability? So I'll take kind of a historical lens and then come to current ways we're thinking about sustainability and also corporate sustainability. In 1987 was the Brundtlin Commission, where sustainable development was ultimately about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That evolved to the triple bottom line coined in 1994. So this Venn diagram that you often see still when people are talking about sustainability, that you've got the environment, economy, society, the triple bottom line. And when they all come together, then you have sustainability. That shifted to a nested model in 2006, where the orders of importance for the different layers of sustainability were addressed. Because you will have no society without the environment. So clearly we need to prioritize keeping our resources intact. We would have no food to feed ourselves. If the earth is on fire, then what does society do? Then you've got the society. Without the society, you would have no economy. That evolved to, in 2010, the natural step framework, a more scientific way of approaching sustainability, where it acknowledges the resources available on earth to continue meeting the needs of human society. Within that framework is the resource funnel that as our resources are declining and as our societal demands for those resources are increasing, what's currently happening, then the margin of action becomes narrower. It's only until we can start to open up the funnel by reducing, for example, our demand for resources or improving the resources that we have on Earth that we can move towards sustainability. I think an important piece, sustainability is a moving target. It's not a endpoint, it's more about a journey. So you're never going to achieve sustainability. You're always striving for it. And things change also year over year resources are different within a business and also within societies. There's also the planetary boundaries, which was first conceptualized in 2009, looking at the various boundaries that we need to operate in on Earth as society. For example, we've got like climate change or land system change. Have we crossed the boundary so that it's now unsustainable and it's a risk for societies? Fast forward to 2023, six boundaries are crossed. So currently the way we are doing things in society, when we're looking at the planetary boundaries perspective, not great. You probably also saw the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. These were launched in 2015. So holistically looking at sustainability, especially the social aspect, there's lots of other ways we can think about sustainability, but these are 
a good starting point, I would say. And then the business context. There's been kind of a shift to approaching sustainability in a business from doing less bad, reducing your impacts, to shifting to doing more good, less bad and more good. There's a business case for sustainability. Clearly, I don't know if I have to tell anyone this at this point, consumers are willing to pay more for products that they perceive to be more eco-friendly. Incorporating sustainability into your business has an advantage for sales. I will also say alongside, there has also been an uptick in greenwashing. So clearly there is an opportunity. Consumers want more of this and without, I would say, good governance or good regulations or policy to keep businesses in check, a lot of companies will greenwash. There's more regulations coming out now to address greenwashing. So this is important for you guys, especially as new brands, to be mindful of you don't want to greenwash because you can, especially into the future, get in trouble. But there certainly has been a opportunity to take advantage of this trend where consumers want to purchase green. And so I'll just highlight the seven sins of greenwashing by Terra Choice. The seven sins include hidden trade-offs. So you've switched to paper and you're saying that it's inherently better than plastic. There are trade-offs, higher greenhouse gas emissions, for example, may be associated with producing those packages. No proof. So maybe you are just saying that we are investing in sustainable development in our company, but you have no data to support that. So how are you going and doing that? Vagueness? Maybe you say green. What do you mean? Or sustainable? What do you mean? False labels? So maybe you're using some obscure certification that has no merit, but you're saying, hey, look, we've got this certification. Irrelevance? Maybe you say that you're sulfate free for a product that's not a wash off product. Not relevant. SLS? Not relevant to non wash off products generally. Lesser of two evils and then fibbing, like downright lying. So there was this report from Terra Choice in 2009 to highlight the frequency of these sins. The most common claim was what well, was a mix between no proof and vagueness. I would say the elephant in the room for sustainable business that we should be mindful of when especially we're communicating sustainability as a business is that in the time we started to think about sustainability and requiring companies to start, for example, measuring their greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions have only gone up. Today, most studies agree overconsumption is a key issue. So clearly, if we're in a consumerism based industry, can these products actually be sustainable if we're encouraging more consumption from consumers? And the overwhelming evidence also shows that overconsumption has canceled out any of the gains brought about by green innovation. So sustainable consumption rather than green consumerism. Those are two different things. Sustainable consumption is about consuming less. As a business, you can think about this, though. How do I incorporate these ideas in my business? Well, maybe you can think about having a streamlined product line where you have fewer products, staples that your customers can use and they don't have to use as much. You can also think about this from the lens of your purchasing as a business when you're choosing raw materials. If you're consuming more materials, then that's going to have a greater impact. So maybe streamlining also formulations, so formulations and product lines, and also having conversations with your consumers about the need to consume less. What can we do in the consumerism space that we operate in when these words, consumerism and sustainability, just are kind of at odds with each other? Well, you can have these conversations openly and try your best. And here I'll just do a rapid fire of common sustainability misconceptions. So the idea that natural equals greener. There are a lot of issues with natural materials from wild harvesting, which is a significant threat for biodiversity and like species extinction, especially for the crops that might be overcultivated, to adulteration, to illicit trade, to land use issues, according to the 2019 IPBES 
report, biodiversity loss was most impacted by the expansion of agriculture. I'm not saying that natural never is greener, but the blanket statement just clearly doesn't work. Or that organic equals greener. A lot of this is for the same kind of reasons as why natural doesn't necessarily equal greener. There's also research showing that agricultural styles in certain contexts that require more land have a greater environmental impact. Or that plastic free equals greener. Yes, there are our large issues with pollution and also with our recycling infrastructure. There are also issues with greenhouse gas emissions. So if you're using packaging materials that translate to higher total greenhouse gas emissions, is that material actually better? For example, you're using glass. It requires more energy for you to transport. It also requires more material. It's also more intensive to produce the glass. Is that better? In some cases it may be, but not in every case. There's no panacea for sustainability in packaging. That waterless equals greener? What are you replacing water with in your formula? When you look at formulation LCAs, the most impactful part of formulations typically is the emollient phase of the formula. So if you're replacing water with emollient, is that actually better? And just because you have less water in your formula doesn't mean that translates to less water usage for the product in general. So if you're making some, for example, oil cleanser with this waterless claim that requires more water usage for your consumer, is that better? Solid, if this product requires more water from your consumer, is that better? In light of the fact that when you look at LCAs for products, the most impactful part of most especially wash off formulations is the consumer use phase, particularly with their warm water usage. And so I will highlight an LCA that was done a couple of years ago on toothpaste tabs versus toothpaste. It was for this reason that they found that the toothpaste tabs were actually counterintuitively more impactful or that refillable equals greener. It's a nice idea, but it really hinges for this to have an impact on consumer compliance, consumer accessibility. So if you have a refillable system in a city and people have to drive in from out of the city, what's the impact of the transportation for consumers to get to you? Are they likely to continue doing that? If you have a cartridge system that requires your customers to ship back their cartridges, What's the impacts of shipping the cartridge to and from rather than the customer just buying a mono material PET packaged product? Ultimately, this is why we can't just assume because often our assumptions about sustainability, as I've highlighted, are incorrect. If we want to do better, we actually have to measure things so we understand what's happening. The reason why I had this information is because people went out and measured it. Accounting is what keeps us all accountable. Otherwise, we're just shooting in the dark. How does one go about building sustainability into a business? The first thing to think about is just broad corporate sustainability management. In my opinion, that's where you start. Do you want to think about leadership co commitment? So you as the founder are committed to trying to do better. You want to set goals and objectives. What are you trying to achieve within your business? Assess what your current practices are. So understanding where you are currently standing with sustainability. This will de generally be from measuring impacts. For example, you might do an LCA and see the various impacts within the life cycle. So a life cycle assessment. We will get to it in future slides, but that is one way where you can start to account for what is currently happening within your business. Stakeholder engagement, you want the perspectives of your, for example, customers who are stakeholders. You want to develop key performance indicators to show you that you are actually making improvement, have a strategy to meet those targets, and then you're going to report on it and refine and continually improve. Some key points is that corporate sustainability management is iterative and it takes time to see results. With commitment and a well-structured plan, there's a big opportunity for meaningful impact. Sustainability is a journey and not an endpoint. You're not going to just say, I'm sustainable, because then you're patting yourself on the back like you've achieved sustainability, which like reality, you haven't. You're going to be continuously improving, you can always do better. It's really important to select a good reporting framework. 
for us to see who's doing better, it's really important that there's comparability for reporting. Using common reporting frameworks for companies is key so that the market can compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges because you guys are reporting in a different way. You want your reporting to be verified by someone outside of your company, preferably a reputable auditing company. So here are some reporting frameworks that you can look to. There's current regulation starting to come forth for uniformity for reporting. That's is beyond the scope of this presentation. Part of reporting includes identifying materiality. What's most relevant to your business and to your stakeholders? So for example, are greenhouse gas emissions the most impactful thing that you are doing? Okay, well, you want to address that. And for reputable third-party auditing companies, I would recommend personally Ecovadis. I think that they do really great work. I think a good reference for everything that I've just talked about comes from our last Sustainable Beauty e-Summit. It was by Audrey Wesson of Intellex. So she just highlighted the way that Intellex is approaching corporate sustainable management. Here are two snippets of their presentation. So we started with the broad corporate sustainability management. Then you start to get into the specifics for you going and developing products. Eco design is one thing to think about. Eco design is defined by activities within the design and development process that aim to reduce environmental impacts and continually, again, sustainability is a journey, not an endpoint, improve the environmental performance of the products throughout their life cycle. A life cycle perspective is really important. You also have to consider your manufacturing processes, ingredient substantiation from your suppliers, supply chain monitoring, you wanna know your supply chain, reducing waste, streamlining ingredients, because every ingredient in your formulation has its own supply chain and each supply chain adds to the impact of your product. Here is a depiction of the life cycle perspective and this is a life cycle perspective specific to cosmetic products. So then from this eco design life cycle perspective, how do you go about substantiating sustainability? Most importantly, probably for understanding the impact of your product is a life cycle assessment. Essentially, you're just measuring the things within your system, you have to create the boundaries of your system, there's a whole conversation of what you're going to include within the boundaries of your life cycle assessment. And it's not just a one and done thing, you wanna continually improve. So you understand the impacts. Now, what are you going to do to make it better? Just because you have a life cycle assessment done doesn't mean that you're like more sustainable or less sustainable. You just have somewhat of an understanding of your current impacts. It is quite expensive. There are some groups that are working to kind of democratize life cycle assessments for smaller companies. So one group that's doing this is Bluebird Climate. When you're starting to think about how am I going to afford this, they perhaps might be a good starting point. And now we've been talking a lot about how do you incorporate sustainability into your business? How do you go about and approach sustainability and product development and measure it? What are the regulations around sustainability? One example of a uh, sustainability regulation is related to packaging. There's a lot going on with packaging right now with EPR regulations extended producer responsibility. Ultimately, this is about shifting the responsibility from waste management to the producers of the waste. This was a map as of 2020. There has been a lot of progress since 2020. Current at that time, regulations for EPR globally that companies had to comply to. And you might be thinking, well, I'm a small business, I don't have to comply. You do. And you might also think, well, those regulations are in this other state. That's not my state. Are you selling online? And is your product available to those customers in that other state? There is also regulations around post-consumer recycled plastic requirements for a certain percentage of PCR material to be incorporated into your packaging. There's also the European Green Deal. Here's a timeline of what 
is going to be happening. Some things to be mindful of is like, for example, evidential support required for green claims. There might be LCA requirements for specific green claims. Another regulation, I mean, this is more guidance at this point, but we'll see how it lands in the next few years are the green guides by the Federal Trade Commission. I will say there are comparable guidance or regulations in the European Union and also in Canada and also like globally. So you just have to be mindful of the regulations and guidance in the region that you're selling in. The green guides by the FTC, they're published every 10 years and they give guidance for what they consider deceptive. Generalized claims were broadly considered deceptive, ego-friendly, because what do you mean? Non-toxic? Anything can be toxic. It depends on the dose. So what do you mean? These are unsubstantiatable claims. If you want to make a green claim, you have to be specific and you have to prove it. So instead of saying we're sustainable, generalized deceptive claim, what are the steps that you're taking to become more sustainable? And clearly there is a lot to keep on top of in terms of sustainability regulations. You as a company are required to keep on top of them. So I'm just going to give a plug to trade associations globally. They are there to help companies understand what's happening in the market that they serve. For indie companies in the United States, the trade association that would be probably most relevant to you is the Independent Beauty Association. They represent small to medium-sized companies across the spectrum of cosmetics, including indie brands. And they do a really good job at tracking regulations, but also advocating for sound legislation. It would also be worthwhile hiring a consultant that has specific expertise here just to make sure what you're doing is compliant with the regulations and probably hire them early on to make sure that you don't make any expensive mistakes that you're gonna have to fix down the line. I hope this presentation was helpful. It's now time for Q&A and we can continue on. I'll try my best to answer all of your questions. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Well, this is kind of awkward. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for watching my presentation. If you guys have any questions, then I would be happy to answer them. One that came in was what is an LCA or what does LCA mean? Uh, LCA is an acronym for life cycle assessment, which has its own ISO standards around it. So that's what a life cycle assessment is. And it's a way to understand the impacts of a product. Um, now, as we're waiting for more questions and no pressure to ask the questions, uh, I just wanted to quick thank all of our speakers for agreeing to participate in this summit, for donating their time and expertise to help make this possible. And I also wanted to give a quick plug to, well, a couple. First, Mo, who at 2 a.m. last night his time, uh, sat on a call with me to record his fireside chat. So. Thank you so much for helping us out in a last minute cancellation. Uh, thank you so much to Julia Ruby, who helped us set up our Discord and has helped us with our Discord. I mean, all throughout our Discord's life and all throughout the summits that we've hosted. So thank you so much. You can find Julia at Ruby's Resource on Instagram. Um, Oh, and then finally, before I start answering questions, uh, thank you so much to our sponsors for uh, supporting our e-conference initiative. Our sponsors are a big reason why we are able to keep this event free and accessible to anyone. And I will say that's across the board for all of our uh, e-summits, we'll, which will continue to be free uh, in the, like into the future. The next one also just a spoiler alert, and I'll probably talk about it more on the panel, is going to be on skincare. Okay, so um, this question comes from Kim who asks, I wonder how to educate customers. My uh, company has sustainable practices in its DNA, which has limitations in scaling up. I mean, I think the big thing is just to be transparent with your customers to uh, 
I'll say I have watched Leah from Crave Beauty do this really successfully, where she's done things that maybe sometimes even didn't pan out in the way that she wanted them to, but then she just was transparent to her customers to tell them what's going on behind the scenes and to tell them the intention behind why she decided to do what she's doing, which often is to reduce consumption via streamlined products. That's what I really like. So having open, transparent conversations with your customers, I think, is a good place to start. Uh, the next question is from uh, David Black, who asks, hopefully we'll get to a point in the future where sustainability becomes more of a practice that's done without sounding bullhorns about it for marketing's sake. Uh, that's not a question, but I agree with that full heartedly. The next question or comment, I'm sorry, I'm just digesting the questions or comments as I'm going. Uh, I can only multitask so much, but this comes from the pretty mad scientist who comments slash asks, how do we approach needing so many types of consultants as very small startups that want to indeed be thoroughly compliant? For example, legal, packaging, chemists, sustainability, claims. Um, that's a really good question. And I would be really interested in other people's perspectives on this as well. Um, Maybe I'll, maybe I'll give another shout out to trade associations for navigating the need to knows, including the consultants that you need to know. Um, sometimes you can keep up to date with some regulations just by the information that they share. So maybe that would be a good place to start. That's my like on the fly reaction to that. It is really expensive to hire all the right consultants totally so um i think joining a trade association may be a good place to start and the trade association that i suggested was the independent beauty association which our next presenter is from that association um okay this next question or comment is from which i'm sorry i still can't pronounce your username uh if we're just starting the brand, how can we have the data for sustainability to be accountable? Even if we're making our choices with less impact uh, ones, aren't that going to sound like uh, greenwashing? Okay, so how do you think about sustainability before you actually have a product to go and measure? I think that's maybe what you're asking there. Uh, so, I mean, you have to start with looking at, for example, ingredient supplier data and then having that approach for eco design in mind when you're developing the product. So being considerate of like the number of ingredients that you're incorporated, incorporating in that. So taking conscious steps that likely will reduce your impact. And then after you have a product, it depends on how much budget you have. So you can have a sustainability story even just to communicate about the efforts that you're making. So you're trying to streamline your ingredients and then eventually down the line, you're going to do it LCA when that's accessible to you because it is expensive. So you can maybe start there, um, maybe work with somebody who has expertise in that area. That could also be something to help uh, build substantiation from your suppliers, looking at the supply chain of what you have in your product. Eventually, you'll probably want to do an LCA. Um, I appreciate that it's, it's expensive. Bluebird Climate is a more affordable route. Um, so y that would be my suggestion. Hopefully that was, um, that, hopefully that made sense. Uh, sorry for just kind of rambling. Um, okay, the next question. So this is from... Uh, Andrea, who says, what do you recommend as the first step as a small business manufacturer new brand to start to truly incorporate sustainability? I would start with thinking about a sustainability management program within your business. I think that's where you start and then you can progress. So right there, you're just starting to think about it. You're starting to think about the things that you need to do. You're starting to think about the things that you need to measure, report, continually improve. You have to start somewhere, and that's probably where I would. 
again, in the last sustainability summit that we hosted, Audrey Wesson from Intellex gave a really great presentation highlighting. I gave a little bit of an explanation, but the explanation that she gave was like 40 minutes. That's all she talked about. So if you want a really great reference for how you can think about this, you should look to that presentation because she did a really good job showing how Intellect started and then continued. So that would be my recommendation. Um, and I think that's all your questions and I'm sorry if I missed any of your questions. Um, I may have it, I'm sorry, and I'll answer them in the comments, but we will just move right on to our Marketing 101. So thank you again for everyone for tuning into our conference. Thank you again to our speakers. Thank you again uh, to our sponsors, to Mo, to Julia. And let's continue on. Our next presenter is Eber Bodmer, Vice President of Marketing and Communication at the Independent Beauty Association. Immigrant from South Africa, uh, Eber believes in change leadership and celebrates diversity. With a background in prestige cosmetics, she's worked for LVMH, L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, Shiseido, and more Pacific, L'Oreal, in Malin, and Goats in marketing, sales, events, and communication capacities. Bodmer has a graduate degree in cosmetics and fragrance marketing, management, and cosmetology license. She dreams of helping build great beauty brands and is passionate about anything consumer product goods related. Without further ado, here's Eber's presentation. Welcome, marketers. Today, we will be talking about the future label. What does it mean to be a future marketer? How do we look ahead? What does brand marketing look like? And as we look and think about marketing like a pendulum, this pendulum has swung from mystery to smoke and mirrors, selling snake oil to hope in a jar, all the way to the future where a more greenwashed brand messaging is seen. Um, a little bit less authentic, it veers into the extremes of reckless misinformation. So where do we see ourselves in all of this as marketeers? In the next 20 minutes or so, you will learn about myself, about IBA, and you will get a brief history of cosmetics and how the marketing, marketing pendulum has swung in each of these marketing periods, moving from one extreme to the other and back. I will highlight about seven marketing trends that I see in my crystal ball and the challenges that I see looking ahead for us. Finally, we will close up with a quick Q&A, and I definitely encourage you to drop any questions that you may have in the chat or wait for the end of the presentation where I will share my email and I encourage any and all correspondence. Now a little bit about me. Um, I'm an immigrant from South Africa and my father, working alongside the government of Nelson Mandela um, to achieve democracy actually through the arts, he was an avid believer in radical diversity and Ubuntu, which basically means that we're stronger together than alone. And I was empowered by this change leadership. So with this diverse background, I've always had that behind me as I work on brands. I've worked with all of the big ones from Sephora, LVMH, to Estee Lauder, Bumble and Bumble, L'Oreal, NARS, Clarisonic, More Pacific, all of the big ones. And I sprinkled in a few indies like Trestique and Mullen and Getz more recently. I am thrilled to be with the Independent Beauty Association as their marketing and communications head. So who is IBA? So IBA is the best kept industry secret. And a moment of brutal honesty, I had heard whisperings of IBA, and it's formerly known as ICMAD, if you had ever heard that before, but I never really truly knew about them as a marketer. Um, and many of you watching this may also not know about us. And so after joining, I wholeheartedly believe that I was missing this in my career completely as a part of my marketing toolkit. IBA is a nonprofit trade association fostering the success of entrepreneurial companies in the indie beauty space. 
We do it through education, community, advocacy, resources. We actually have a 50 year deep legacy of fostering and helping grow small business beauty brands. But we also have medium and large companies and ELF Cosmetics is actually our largest brand. And the benefits of joining us expands to every single seat in your company from marketing, R&D, packaging, legal, regulatory, the list goes on and on and on. And all of the benefits that we offer our members are really vast. And every single person that the brand has working for them gets a complimentary access to their member portal. And there's no charge to this. So I highly, highly encourage your entire team to join, especially the marketers. So let's dive in. I want you to imagine for a minute a pendulum. I see that in my mind when I think about marketing cosmetics and brand messaging over the years ebbing back and forth back and forth. I want to invite you to join me on a quick history of cosmetics. I promise to be brief. This will not be a history lesson for three or four hours, which this could be. But let's go back about two and a half million years where you see the first signs of cosmetics in the Paleolithic era and the caves of Lascaux in France. They actually found pigment. And here you see that it was known to adorn the body. So that was the first hint that cosmetics is used and connected to a sign of feeling beautiful. And then you go to um, the next chapter that really we see some more signs of history of beauty, which is ancient Egypt, of course, where queens use beauty in their rituals. And here the pendulum swings more towards divinity and it becomes that's shrouded in mystery and beauty products are connected to divinity and uh, mortality. The, the sad part in this is that I think they did not know this, but a lot of the products like coal used to accomplish that known beautiful cat eye actually had lead. So it could have resulted in a lot of health issues or even death. The first pigment powders for hair dyeing, all classes, not just royalty, was found here about 20,000 years ago made from cassia powder. So really, I mean, this shows that it was an everyday household item, hair dye, amongst other oils and items, but also this complete swing to royalty and the mysterious shroud. Then the pendulum swings completely the other way to the Middle Ages, where beauty is seen as blasphemous and it should not be used. So a lot of the beauty rituals are now more um, almost, you know, frowned upon until the Crusaders came in and ushered in an era of personal hygiene with steam distillation and toothpaste. And then we swing even further down that avenue where about 700 years ago, during the 14th century, still in the Middle Ages, we get the bubonic plague. And then cosmetics become even more crucial to hygiene to block the scents within their mosques. They used rose petals and cardamom and cinnamon to help block out those awful odors. So very functional. During the Renaissance, kings and queens used powder on their faces. We all know now that the powders was laced with arsenic and many other harmful um, ingredients. But then we swing from functional to completely flippant and um, the bourgeoisie using cosmetics and it being considered flippant and excess. So it created a bad reputation again for cosmetics where it was kind of frowned upon and there was these also sinister health um, issues that came up with using some of these items. We move to the Industrial Revolution, which is the first pivotal kind of hint to modern beauty as we know it with, of course, the invention of the printing press and the first mass marketing. Product labels were printed, business cards were printed, materials, catalogs. So in the 1900s, a lot of businesses like Rimmel and Garlon started using more modern advertising techniques. Now, the, the bar for beauty started being set by these ads, and there was a lot of um, drive to sell snake oil. They were giving promises to consumers, and the products were often 
highly dangerous and causing permanent health issues. But let's move on from that for a second. And you go towards um, promises of the standard of beauty during the start of the Industrial Revolution to fast forward 100 years to World War I, where now cosmetics are doing kind of the opposite where it's building up feminine strength. It's defining the modern woman. There's more magazines being put out. Men had to go off to war and women had to stay behind to work. And here we see what's coined as the lipstick effect for the first time, where often when societies are in flux, whether it be a war, a financial crisis, where there's a fracture point, women would turn toward beauty products like lipstick to make them feel better to take their minds off of it, to have that feminine touch, to make them feel confident. Then in the 20s and 30s, beauty became a choice. You can choose your identity through beauty. So that rebellious spirit started happening in makeup, the individuality. And J. Walter Thompson was a big ad agency at the time. And in 1916, they printed an ad that actually said that 85% of purchases were made by women. So you can see here the marketing and advertising space very early on started us on this road to speaking to women's psyche and, and telling us what we wanted and giving us personas to choose. About 85 years ago is actually when the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938 was rolled in. And this was a great moment, right? We needed this. We needed official guidelines for food and health safety. It did not really exist before. Um, and that was a great moment for the pendulum to kind of be a little bit more in the middle, where there was a little bit more guidance. I don't know about transparency, but there was a little bit more of that transparency in terms of what's in the product and for training consumers to read the label and be aware. And in the 50s, World War II helped revolutionize that strong glamour woman again. So we see a nod back to that lipstick effect. We have a sense of belonging and togetherness, an attitude towards um, women being perceived again as that pinup. Um, brands like Revlon, Max Factor, Pons, they all focused on patriotism. Some of them even manufactured products like soap specifically for soldiers. But um, I think the, the idea of seduction and usefulness in cosmetics were kind of married in this era. In the 60s, this is the decade of youth and an ever-present rebellious spirit, and we see the first noticeable influence of British pop culture coming into the United States, and it ushered in the 70s liberation, where there was equal rights, and brands became even louder and seductive again versus strength and functional. So again, that pendulum keeps swinging back and forth. In the 70s, it's the first cropping up of natural brands. You have brands like Aveda, Herbal Essences, The Body Shop. They are all coming up with new claims and labeling. The new way of messaging would continue for the next 40 years. Um, and they've added in, as you know, labels like natural, organic, tested on animals, paraben-free, and much more. Some of these claims based on truth, others fell short and is still falling short. So with Mokra creeping up upon us, I wanted to show you this timeline of cosmetic regulations. Let's pause. And as you see all of these on your screen, less than 10 major official updates since the beginning of time has ever been done in cosmetics and beauty. That's it. It was not until the late 1800s before the turn of the century that women started speaking up and wanting more ingredient control and transparency. And in the 20s, with more mass marketing, more regulations led towards this act of 1938 controlling products and goods and labeling. And then whiplash forward to last year when the Biden administration signed the MOCRA bill into effect, which would roll out next year, as you all know. I think more brands need to step up and um, step into the future and get involved with regulations and, you know, 
implement MOCRA in a more diverse manner. We as IBA actually work with the FDA to ensure that consumers, indie brands, businesses are getting the best out of these important regulatory updates. So with the history behind us, what does it set us up for, for the future and labeling? In the past few years, so much of the marketing voice has been what's not in products, right? So the pendulum has swung towards kind of keeping that behind locked doors and wordsmithing things to razzle dazzle. It doesn't really create a point of difference. We have so many little label saying what's not in it and what it's good for and standing on our different soap boxes. And I think it's important to get back to less is more and focus on what innovation inside your product is really helping the consumer with. Marketing and product development needs to be intertwined in all of this. I think we're a little separate still, especially with all of the legislative and regulatory updates. We need to be informed willing to tackle the taboo topics and be bold. And we can eliminate the stigma of this going back and forth and not being able to rely on us. Um, we want to, you know, not be known as the industry that hides harmful ingredients just to make money. But we also don't want to not make great efficacious products. So how can we make products that really celebrate our true unique selves? How can we become brands that are counted on and go beyond just being good? We should produce for the greater good of the consumer. We should put safety standards and regulations in a place that's authentic. And that will actually foster not only safety and reliability for your consumer, but the entrepreneurial spirit that we are supporting with indie beauty brands. Are you ready to go into the trends? Well, through my research and a little bit of a gut check, I landed on about seven trends that I see for 2024 and beyond. The first trend being quality. It's been a rough and tough year for indies, and I foresee the financial strategy will shift from that raw, raw growth at all costs to plans to secure a more reliable, secure future of your brand for reliable growth and stability, quality, not quantity. Small businesses will be less about that shiny draw of celebrities or influencers, and more about a promise of reliability of the efficaciousness of a product and what the product or brand's reputation is. The second trend is compliance and ingredients versus um, you know, bland labeling. It's shift, it's sifting, excuse me for, excuse me, I can't talk. It's sifting through the BS. We need a radical transparency and clear information from us brands. So I guess we all know what MOCRA is at this point. I hope you do, but MOCRA is rolling into effect next year. And I think it's up to marketers to educate the consumer. Consumers want to see backed claims, not just marketing fluff um, to soft label claims. They absolutely want to see that we are putting their needs first in the most useful manner, um, but not to hide anything. You don't have to divulge your industry secrets. You can build trust in your language and your labeling. Marketing has made strides in cosmetics, but I think there's a long, long road ahead and focus is needed on two areas, in my opinion, diversity and authenticity and strategic communication is needed on the communication and the packaging. There's so much noise out there, both in a clatter for brand success, but also in inaccurate or false claims driven from both consumers and I think marketers. And we need to advocate for the brand to be armed with up-to-date information. And this is an example where the pendulum can swing from fear-mongering and blocking everything that goes into making a product to completely greenwashing and being vague to consumers. And it's actually bad for consumers and it, it's not, it doesn't get us anywhere. We're just spinning at that point. The third trend is being you. 
a natural, less chemical approach is in showing your freckles, your natural hair texture. There's stressful days ahead. A lot of the trend monitors are showing that. We all know a recession is coming. So making products that are reliable and useful, even multi-use, and providing that balance and relief to meet your consumer's needs will win. The next trend is to not follow the yellow brick road. What do I mean by this? So when it comes to suppliers and manufacturing, the minimum order quantities have lowered to ensure efficacy and efficiency, profitability, and to be the first at market. But marketers need to drive a slightly different conversation and have those conversations with different players in your company. It's vital for a, for a small brand to be nimble and flexible if they want to survive and win. Supplier diversity for the future is crucial, crucial, especially entering, entering the uncertainty and the fluctuations of the future. And if we learned anything from COVID with supplier chain, we should be ready to not just follow what's being done and what all everybody's doing is best practices. Trend number five is time to zoom in. Find your hero. Focus on your top dog. You should create products that are covetable, adaptable, that have a reputation that is strong, that people will come back for again and again and again. The next trend is moving beyond the metaverse. Physical and digital lines are completely blurred. This trend of dual realities, living in both the physical and the digital. Even in politics, you see different parties focusing on whatever they're doing in the real world, meeting, campaigns, talking. They want to echo that in digital spaces. We should do that as beauty brands as well, to think of ourselves holistically and beyond the metaverse into this 4D world. What does your products look like in all strategies, in all touch points, in all of the different levers that you're going to pull? There needs to be modern marketing that is holistic, agile, and data driven that we can get our ideal customers to have a wonderful user experience and a brand experience. Let's take that personal experience that they share with your brand as modern marketers and understand our consumers at a deeper level. Our consumers are ever-changing. They're chameleons. So we need to be hyper-vigilant and hyper-focused on our consumer. And that does mean entering the metaverse in terms of marketing. The last trend I see is preservation. Scarcity drives more sustainable options and we need to be nimble, innovative and resource ready. New brand expe expectations need to be in place. We're seeing an evolution in the cosmetics industry, right? Where the cosmetics industry is moving beyond trying to do the right thing into doing something that can perhaps be measured, reported on, and implemented long-term. To have those goals and sustainability, as well as other ESG components like diversity and supply chain, looking at cradle to cradle operations, we wanna see all of that flow upstream. We need to make sure that we are producing certifiable, products that are good and have good plans for improvement in the long term. Companies need to look forward to and start to gather data now for the full life cycle. And we need to keep that in place as we thrive in an ever-changing environment. Now that we've seen the seven trends and seen my crystal ball, what challenges are ahead for us marketers in brand building? Well, I see four major challenges for us marketers. The first is not being educated in the full product life cycle. Marketers need to be aware of every point of brand creation, packaging, sustainability, supply trends, ingredients, regulations. It may not be our job, but we need to pull up a chair. We need to make strides now in the industry, and that means banding together 
and literally fostering that American dream of growth in entrepreneurial brands. We need to cultivate the process so we can create best-in-class brands. I highly want to put in another plug here for IBA because this is where building your community comes in very, very handy. We have multiple touch points. We have opportunities to lean in to different parts of the industry and gather knowledge that would expand your world of marketing. The second challenge is reactiveness. We have small teams. It's a rapid pace. It's a digital, physical, immediate now world. We have so many competitors and there's noise in your area. How are you going to set your brand apart? Well, you need to be ready. You need to look at your data and you need to look ahead. And the third challenge is having a unique, truly authentic, transparent message. So presuming consumers know everything, and they've made up their mind. I think the other mistake we make as marketers is not looking at your data. Your consumers, like we said, they're ever changing. They're in the metaverse, they're everywhere. So use all of your tools and make smart decisions so you can meet the consumer's needs, however nimble and fleeting. Gather information so that you can educate and educate and educate your consumer. The larger portion of your target sees your marketing efforts, they go to whatever point of distribution they're getting your product, and then they get overwhelmed. They get lost in the shuffle of other competitors, or your messaging is not clear, or the instructions on how to use on the box is not buttoned up, and you may lose them or confuse them. So not you not losing that specific brand call and Understanding what need your product fills is imperative. Finally, standing apart. With Nielsen reporting that the indie beauty category is approaching over a $31 billion stake in this industry, that is fast surpassing the total beauty category number. It's huge. It's colossal. You can't do everything. So you really have to think less is more. Find that hero in your lineup and fine tune your messaging to connect with your consumer. I wanna thank you today for joining me to explore what the future label looks like, how we should market that product and how we should get ready to win in the future. Thank you so much. I'm gonna take Q and A's now. Thank you so much to Eber for that presentation. I am just bringing her over to the main screen. Great. And yeah, thank you. That was super informative. So maybe I will just get started with my own question and everyone in the comments, ask your questions. You've gotten a number of questions or comments about how good your presentation was. My question is, uh, what is the top mistake that you see brands making when it comes to marketing? Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, the question, the question. What is the top mistake from your point of view when it comes to marketing? Um, should I just go? Yeah, we're live. I think. Hi, um, <laughs> I, I think the, the top mistake that marketers are making is really forgetting that, you know, your product that you have is amazing and you're intimately aware of what, what went into it. But sometimes when we're in front of creating that product, we repeat the message so often that we forget that some things are perhaps missed. So really just stepping back and, and having that um, overview of the need for your product and what need that fills for the consumer and making sure your message is on point. Now, uh, something that I have noticed for some brands that I've worked with as a formulator, they've tried to work with marketing firms and then they had a difficulty 
uh, with the communication that the marketing firm wanted them to do. So they were pushed towards clean and free from marketing that they didn't want to use, but that's just what the marketers felt was important. So do you have suggestions for indie brands who are navigating that relationship with marketing firms, choosing the right marketing firm? I know that this brand specifically, she ended up working with the marketing firm that had all these uh, opinions, I guess, that she disagreed with, but she worked with them so that she got something that she was happy with. But do you have any suggestions there? Oh, goodness. It's so hard. It's really hard. Um, I think from both sides. So stepping into the entrepreneurial space where you have this brand, you have limited money, limited resources, you find this marketer to help you create and carve out the message you want, and then it's off brand. So I think the number one um, piece of advice that I would give anybody that is trying to build a beauty brand is to really be honest. Don't be afraid to tell a marketer they're a little bit off message. I, I think it's okay. I think marketers are tough enough. We have pretty tough skin and we can pivot. And I think it's also important to have a marketer and, and, and keep in mind to your second um, part, Jen, of asking how you would pick the, the consultant. Pick someone who is in the industry, who belongs to associations, who's a CEW member, who people know about, who is not just, you know, someone that is falling from another industry, perhaps, that really is intimate with issues that are very intimate to our niche of the market. Um, that is, you know, the unicorns are out there, people that perhaps understand cradle to cradle operations or people that perhaps understand um, skincare better than makeup or hair care. I think there are marketers that are good in everything. And then there are marketers that are good in a very specific topic. And so it's important to find the, the right fit. Uh, this next question comes from Dr. Laura. Laura Perriman, is that you? Uh, sorry if it's not. Uh, it might be though, so hi. Uh, but the question, when and where is the next IBA conference? Oh, that's a good one. Um, the next cocktail party will be uh, in LA in February, and we're very excited to host you all. The summits we're wrapping up, that's actually part of my job to figure out when and where, but we're gonna have some amazing conferences coming up for you. We're gonna cover some FDA regulations, some latest MOCRA updates. We have a wonderful sustainability and supply chain conference probably coming up in the spring or the fall. So stay tuned, there's quite a bit coming up in 2024. Um, this is from Tanya, who is asking around for a startup, do you have any suggestions for where someone can just get started with thinking about marketing in their company? Um, I think that it's, it's probably going to be useful for you to sign up to a publication like Beauty Matter or, um, you know, look for places like Jen's website is good to go to to, get, to kind of pull latest and greatest information and really just understand what's out there. I think it's good if you have a little bit of money to invest in Mintel reports um, to really know what trends are coming up so that you can look ahead. And I think it's important to get on LinkedIn and just use LinkedIn like a social platform and just connect and connect and connect and ask questions. Um, it's important to perhaps even go to live trade shows to talk to people from different aspects that you will be touching, whether they're suppliers of yours or um, even editors out there. So it's just keep keep the whole cycle in mind when it comes to producing a product and promoting it. Uh, this next question is from Pretty Mad Scientist. Will the cocktail party be during Makeup in L LA? Is that what it's around? Yes, exactly. I will see you there and uh, I'll get you a cocktail. Yes, it, it is around that. Well, the great thing about IBA conference or IBA cocktail summits or a cocktail networking events is that it's generally an open bar. So that's fun. Uh, this next I will <laughs> ensure it continues to be. Don't worry. <laughs> This next question, maybe the final question is from David who asks, is it typically better to work with a larger marketing firm who you pay a retainer for their team of differently skilled employees or to find individual professionals on a freelance basis? 
That's such a hard one because I think it depends on the quality of even the agency that you're getting, that you're paying a retainer with. I've worked with, you know, when I was with the bigger brands, we we often do work with larger agencies like that, not necessarily in marketing, but larger agencies are great to work with because you kind of get a little bit more bang for your buck covering um, more with just that retainer and getting, as the question pointed out, different um, expertise in one place. But then again, if you're an indie starting out and you're in a very specific niche, um, I know of somebody right now, they are formulating a, a underarm sweat guard patch. That's very specific. I don't really think that you need an entire agency that's going to help you with that. I, I think you would be better off consulting with an agency that's very niche or perhaps a um, OTC driven product where you understand, you know, the, the drugs that are in place um, that would be making that product efficacious. So I think it just depends what you're looking for. So I'm not really answering your question, but, um, you know, I, I think that it's important to just look at what you're getting, whether you need the different expertise or where you need to zone in on a specific need. And that's all the time that we have for Q&A. That was fast. Uh, thank you so much, Eber, for agreeing to present our Marketing 101. I will say I was very picky about the person who was going to give this marketing presentation because I am generally skeptical of marketers. So thank you so much for being the person. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Our next speaker is Simone Swaffer, DRSC, the founder and CEO of Vogue Regulatory. Before establishing Vogue Regulatory, Dr. Swaffer worked for several small to large size companies in the personal care space, consumer healthcare, and dietary supplement industries. She earned both her master's degree and the only one of its kind doctorate in regulatory science from the University of Southern California. Dr. Swafford has given the cosmetics lecture in the Introduction to Medical Product Regulations course at USC and has also written the cosmetics chapter in the USC regulatory textbook, an overview of FDA regulated products from drugs and cosmetics to food and tobacco. Without further ado, here's the presentation. So you want to start a beauty brand, then you need to know and understand the U.S. regulatory framework for beauty products. Hi, I'm Simone, and I'm happy to be here today to present um, on what I love doing, and that's regulations. A little bit about me, uh, about 17, well, next year will be 18 years of experience, global regulatory experience in uh, cosmetics, personal care products, OTC drugs, and dietary supplements. Uh, I always say beauty is my first love. Um, I always keep coming back to it. I graduated with both a master's degree and a doctorate in regulatory science from the University of Southern California, fight on. Uh, I focus really primarily on FDA, FTC compliance, advertising and labeling claims, risk mitigation, and also product registration. And I always say regulatory is the lawyer I was always meant to be, except it's more dynamic. I get to work with very creative individuals on any given day. So what are we going to look at today? We're going to touch on cosmetics and U.S. law. Um, we're going to look at the laws that the FDA enforces as it relates to beauty products. We're going to also touch on some key definitions and concepts that you really need to be aware of. Uh, we're going to take a brief look at over-the-counter drugs and talk about what, what is intended use and why is it important. I mean, are cos cosmeceuticals a real thing? You'll see, uh, based on this presentation, we're going to look at FDA enforcement action, and we're going to touch on uh, one of the most important um, legislations to impact the cosmetic industry in a very long time, which is MOCRA, and it's an acronym for the Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act. So are beauty products regulated? Well, it, you could get a different answer depending on who you speak with, but that's their opinion, right? But beauty products are definitely regulated. The FDA regulates cosmetics and personal care products under the authority of the 1938 
FDNC Act, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and that's actually when cosmetics was added to the act. Uh, they also regulate uh, cosmetics under the authority of the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, or the FPLA, and more recently, the 2022 Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act. So the Act DNC Act defines what is a cosmetic. A cosmetic, really, it's simple. It's defined as anything that's intended to be rubbed, applied on, sprinkled, poured, um, or just introduced into the human body for the purposes of cleansing, beautifying, promoting attractiveness, or altering the appearance. Uh, I find over the years that when you ask individuals, well, what's cos what is a cosmetic? They tend to say makeup, but actually, the cosmetics category encompasses just much more than makeup. It take into account skin moisturizers, perfumes, uh, nail polishes, um, shampoos, lipsticks, you name it, they all fall within the category of cosmetic products. So it's really just a, I, I put this slide so you can get a good representation or a good flavor for the different kinds of cosmetic products that are out there. Chances are if it's in your bathroom, on the counter or in the shower, the likelihood is it's a cosmetic product. The FDNC Act also defines what is a drug. A drug really is defined as anything that's intended to diagnose, cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent a disease. And it's anything that's also intended to affect the structure or function of the body, right? So how can a product be both a cosmetic and a drug? Ironically, in the United States, we have what are called cosmetic drugs, right? And this may happen when you have a product that has, a, has two intended uses. So, for example, take an anti-dandruff shampoo. It's a cosmetic because it's intended to cleanse the hair. But it's also a drug because it has an anti-dandruff active ingredient that's, that is shown to be safe and effective to help treat and prevent the recurrence of dandruff symptoms or flaking or scaling of the skin. Over-the-counter drugs, uh, really, they follow a monograph, which if you think about a monograph, uh, the best way I can describe it is like a recipe book, right? It really the details what ingredients you can use and what level and what combinations of ingredients that you can use and then for what intended use. You typically find um, OTC monographs in the following categories combined with cosmetic claims to make cosmetic drugs. Really popular acne medications, sunscreens, their moisturizers, makeup with SPF, um, shampoos, uh, treatments with anti-dandruff active ingredients, skin protectants, you think of chopsticks or, or baby products, those fall within the category of, of um, OTC drugs and also anti-cavity uh, products. When you think about a toothpaste or a whitening toothpaste, those are cosmetic drugs. So I, talk, I talked about this, I mentioned it in the overview slide, and what we're gonna to touch on briefly is intended use. And what is intended use and why is it so important? Intended use is important, right? Because it really determines the difference between a cosmetic and a drug, regardless of whether the product is formulated to be that, regardless of if you have substantiation for it. The fact of the matter is if you're marketing your cosmetic product with drug claims, right, then it's a drug in the eyes of the FDA. So something to keep in mind. And you can you can establish intended use in a number of ways by the claims you make on your product labeling, what you say on your website and social media. Um, you can you can do it by consumer perception because if you've done a really good job of doing the wrong thing, consumer consumers know your products for that. And then if you use ingredients that are known to have a, a therapeutic benefit, for example, like fluoride in toothpaste, then your product is also intended to be a drug, even if you say it's a cosmetic. So what is a cosmeceutical? Um, that's, it's interesting, right? Because cosmeceutical, the term has been around for the last few years, and it's really an industry term to describe a cosmetic purporting to have active pharmaceutical or therapeutic benefits. But the FDNC Act does not recognize any category as cosmeceuticals. You can have a product that can be a drug, cosmetic, or a legal combination of the two in, in terms of a cosmetic drug or an OTC drug, but the term cosmeceutical has no meaning under law. Okay, 
Um, and what we've seen, though it has been a while that the FDA has acted in this area, understandably, they've had other priorities, but we've seen FDA do enforcement action against companies uh, that are marketing their cosmetic product with drug claims. And as a first level of enforcement action, what they typically do is issue a warning letter. And, and you can find these on the FDA website. And some example of drug claims um, cited in previous warning letters include acne treatment, reduction, stretch mark reduction, cellulite reduction, hair restoration, uh, eyelash growth. I could add here, you know, collagen regeneration, skin cell regeneration, you name it. Um, but these claims tend to garner the attention of the FDA. Uh, I also want to briefly touch on the going back to the FDNC Act and it introducing key concepts that you need to be aware of, uh, the concept of interstate commerce, adulterated and misbranded, right? So interstate commerce, if you really think about it, is, is the free movement of goods and services across state lines. A cosmetic product that is deemed to be adulterated is if it bears or contains anything that's poisonous, anything that's filthy or deleterious uh, that will be harmful to consumers under normal or customary conditions of the use. It's important to know that adulteration takes into account not only the product's composition, it takes into account also how it's manufactured and the product container itself in which the, the formulation is housed in. So, so really, you need to know what adulterated is. Another term that you really need to know for your cosmetic product is misbranded. And a cosmetic shall be deemed to be misbranded if its labeling is false, as in false claims, or misleading in any particular way. This includes both what the label says and what it fails to reveal. As you go further and further into the regulation, there, there's what's called material facts, right? And that's information that is required to be on the label of a cosmetic product. The FDNC Act prohibits, among other things, the introduction or delivery for introduction um, into interstate commerce, any food, device, drug, or cosmetic that is adulterated or misbranded. It is against the law. It also prohibits the adulteration or misbranding of any food, drug, device, or cosmetic while in interstate commerce, which makes sense if you think about it. You don't want individuals tampering or manipulating with product after it's left the distribution warehouse, right? The FDNC the Act also authorizes the FDA to take legal action if cosmetics are adulterated or misbranded. And we'll talk about this a little bit further even when we get to the topic of MOPA. Uh, just as important, we have the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act. And really, when you look at the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, it's more about labeling and the elements that are required to be on your product label uh, and it applies to all consumer commodity products and i think a simple way to look at a consumer commodity it's anything sold at the retail level or anything that's really intended uh, to have a consumer as the end user of a, of a product so for cosmetics that are offered for sale as consumer com commodities, the FPLA requires labeling information such as the product's identity, and it authorizes the implementation of regulations to specify the presentation, how your product label needs to look. It requires an ingredient declaration, and it also prevents deceptive packaging. So basically, the purpose of the FPLA is really to enable consumers to obtain accurate information as to the quantity of contents in a product. It helps them also to facilitate value comparisons across products and really should help to, pre to prevent unfair, deceptive packaging and labeling. Okay, so let's talk now about MOPRA, which is the Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act of 2022. Uh, it was passed on December 29th of last year as part of that big omnibus uh, federal spending bill, and it introduces new mandatory cosmetic requirements for cosmetics, which include record keeping and serious adverse event reporting, facility registration and product listing, which prior to that was voluntary, safety substantiation and i want to make it clear here that safety was always 
always required for cosmetic products. I think what Mocha has done is really it's made it more defined. Um, and that's something that you need to be aware of. Uh, it updates cosmetic labeling, and then it's going to introduce a new law regarding fragrance allergen. And it also requires good manufacturing practices for cosmetic products. Uh, some of these uh, provisions go into effect as early as December 29th of this year. So under MOCRA, just as important, the FDA was given new enforcement authorities, including facility suspension, record access and inspection, and mandatory recall authority. Prior to MOCRA, uh, the FDA couldn't mandate that a product be withdrawn from the market. They, they had to work with the manufacturer or distributor of that product to voluntarily withdraw it. Now under MOCRA, if the FDA um, thinks or, 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 or knows that keeping a product will really cause harm to users on the market, they can actually mandate that that product be recalled from the, the market. And under MOCRA, the FDA must issue three new rules via the notice and comment rulemaking process. It's going to have a new CGMP rule, a fragrance allergen labeling rule, and a talc rule. Um, the FDA must propose the GMP rule within two years after MOCRA's enactment, and a final rule within in three years, and then the fragrance, allergen, and labeling rules must be proposed within 18 months after MOCRA, MOCRA's enactment, and final rules no later than 180 days after the close of the comment period. So I just want to make sure I didn't go too far ahead. Um, so what is the importance of MOCRA? Well, Really, it's the first significant piece of cosmetic legislation in the U.S. since 1938 when cosmetics was added to the FD&C Act. It expands the FDA's authority to regulate cosmetics. It immediately preempts state and local laws that differ from the federal framework, which, if you think about it, makes sense, right? You don't want to have competing requirements at the federal and state level because then who do manufacturers, who do they follow? However, the preemption provision does have some carve-outs, such as the state's ability to ban ingredients in cosmetic products. And if you've ever had the question, if we have a new federal law, why states are allowed to still ban ingredients, this is the reason why that the preemption provision did not preempt states from being able to ban cosmetic ingredients. And that's important. So key takeaways from today. So the FDA has the authority to and does regulate cosmetics and personal care products. Uh, the FDNC Act defines what is a cosmetic and what is a drug. It also defines the terms adulterated, misbranded, and interstate commerce. Um, it also prohibits the introduction of adulterated cosmetics and drugs uh, into interstate commerce. A products category is determined by its intended use. MOCRA expanded the FDA's authority to regulate cosmetics. And even though I didn't explicitly say so, I do want to put this last one in there. If it is your brand name on the product, at the end of the day, you are responsible. So hope you find this helpful. It was a pleasure to present this to you today. And now we, we're going to do some questions. Thank you so much to Simone for that presentation. Uh, bear with me as I bring her on to the screen for you guys. And maybe I will start with my own question. What's the top regulatory mistake that you see startups making in terms of cosmetic I think, products? I, I just think not knowing the regulations. And it's, it's, it's surprising to me because I think we have such a, a transparent federal regulatory system here in the U.S. And, and I think you don't have to go that far to find the information that you need. And I just, I think just not knowing the regulations and, and then concurrently with that, I think for the companies that do have the benefit of knowing, they always think compliance is regulatory and legal's responsibility, not the business. And, and that's wrong. I think, um, in any organization, it's important really to have a culture of compliance from the top down, right? And you lead by example. Um, and I think once companies start off, especially startup brands, think of it in that mindset, I think it sets your business up for long-term success, not just in the short term. 
um, for you guys in the comments, ask your questions to um, to Simone. Pr pretty Mad Scientist asked, I already answered the question, but maybe I'll just say it again to shout out okay. the book that you contributed to, uh, which was, what was the textbook that you contributed to, which was an overview of FDA regulated products from drugs and cosmetics to food and tobacco. Okay, a common question that I get from indie brands that I'm working with is mm -hmm. when should I start working with a regulatory person? Uh, n now, like my commentary is like, now, do it now, do it earlier and like, now. Would you agree and why? Well, I think it's earlier the better. You want to think about talking with compliance even at the time you're developing your product brief, right? Because I've had instances where I've been involved towards the very end, like they've launched a product and they say, okay, well, we want to sell it even in these markets. And I'm like, well, your formulation isn't compliant. You have this preservative at this level and it doesn't meet the regulations for that particular market. And it was, it was, it was hard. Um, and so I think when that happened, the organization that I worked with at that time learned that it was easier to have regulatory even involved and in working closely with product development much earlier in the process. So I, I agree with that, Jen. The earlier, the better. And when you think about the brief, and you think about involving regulatory, I wanna have two different mindsets, right? On the side of the business, you're involving regulatory because regulatory can be a partner to the business, right? They can help you navigate, especially if it's a gray area. Having them earlier will hopefully give the business some suggestions, some ideas, some watchouts. And at the same time, for my regulatory counterparts, it's not the time to be Debbie Downer. It's not the time to say no to everything, but it's it's our opportunity as regulatory to figure out how can we be a partner to the business, how we can lend our expertise in a positive way that makes it more collaborative and that they will want to work with us in future efforts. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. And okay. Laura Perriman, Dr. Laura Perriman, asks a really juicy question. There's a brand of Keller Cosmetics that claims 100% eye safe beauty. That seems to be a gray area for sure. So um, what do you think? Is this something that would be acceptable claims wise? Uh, this so like 100% just... safe for anything kind of claim? So I, I I have the mindset there's no safe anything. I think, you know, we all know you being, you know, with your, your cyclone background, um, everything, I think, you know, everything is toxic at some level. So I, I have the mindset I don't make absolute claims, whether it's 100% efficacy or even 100% safety, because I think anything when exposed to certain conditions can create risk um, and and when you're you have products in the hands of consumers at the end of the day even if you may have tested it um, and you have that confidence of safety at the end of the day you have no control in how your product is being used so I think from a business standpoint from a liability standpoint um, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable making that risk but hey if the brand feels comfortable doing it it's within their purview to do so I will say though for any type of claim, and especially now that we have Mokra, where Mokra has defined what it means to have a safe product um, and really thinking about the customary conditions of use um, and then the level of substantiation required to, to, to support safety, I would just hope that that brand would have a level of, of, of substantiation in support of that claim, whether it be ocular tests, whether it be some type of a safety assessment by a toxicologist, one or the other or both, um, you know, information on the product composition, testing. I, I think you would need just thinking about MOCRA. And for those who are listening, MOCRA is the Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act. It was a law that passed last year. And cosmetics always had to have uh, safety, proof of safety. I think what MOCRA did was really establish a standard for what that safety needed to be. So what I'm saying is I would hope that they would at the very least meet the MOCRA standard for substantiation for safety. And along the lines of MOCRA regulations, what would you say is the most impactful effect of Mocha regulations on new startup brands? And I will also say there's a lot of attention on Mocha, and then people are just like not thinking about the sustainability leg legislation that maybe, 
maybe you should be thinking about but what do you think I think you know people are really up in arms about notification and listing and I think that to me is one of the simpler aspects of Mokra. Uh, it's relatively straightforward if you don't have the capability to do it in-house. It's something that you can work with an outside agency or consultant to do. For me, I think where it's very new to industry is the idea of um, you know, adverse event reporting. How, how do they handle that? And and putting certain processes in place, records access. When you when you think of some of really the newer parts of Mokra that's newer to the beauty industry that they really haven't had the experience of doing in the past, I think that's going to be an adjustment. And I would hate for any brand to be in a position where, hey, you're being inspected by the FDA, and the FDA asks for access to your records, and you don't have any records to give them. So I think uh, for companies, this is the time for them to be working on that and really having some type of a dossier or, you know, on each of their product where, and they also have a process for how they triage when they receive any type of reports regarding their product, having a system in place where that it's documented and that their employees are trained on. To me, that's, that's the part of Mokra that I don't think much focus is given. Um, and I think more focus needs to be given by the brands. Uh, this was a really great question, and I see it's been answered in the comments, but I feel like more people would have this question, so I just have to ask it. It's from David sure. who asks, would regulatory follow or fall under your legal team, or do you need to have uh, someone who's not necessarily a lawyer, but is just specialized in the field to guide you in the correct direction? So, yeah, are regulatory people just l legal people? What's the difference? <laughs> Well, I've had both. I've worked with regulatory counsel. I myself, I'm not a lawyer. I always say regulatory for me is the lawyer I was always meant to be. Um, I, you, It's working with somebody who has that mindset to understand law and really help companies navigate gray areas. Um, and you also need a little bit of a technical person too, because that person has to be able to look at certain documentation and really help the brand if it's with respect to claims, that type of thing. So. Um, um, it doesn't have to be a lawyer, but it's really a combination of somebody who who enjoys reading the law and who also has a technical mindset that really pays attention to details. And I think a good place for regulatory to work is closely with legal because nine times out of ten, regulatory and legal are going to be on the same page when it comes to claims and, and risk. There are some things that are legal risks and there's some claims that are regulatory risk, right? And so having legal and regulatory work closely together, I found to be the most beneficial for businesses. Now, unfortunately, 10 minutes goes by really quick and we're out of time for Q&A. But I just want to say for everyone that's in the comments, there were lots more questions. There were delayed questions. All of a sudden you guys started asking so many when there's like two minutes left in the Q&A. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be copying out all the questions that were submitted throughout today. And I'm going okay. to be sending it to the speakers. And whenever I get their answers to as many as they're willing to answer, I will send out their answers to everyone who is registered. So stay tuned for that and hopefully our speakers will answer your questions and if not I totally appreciate your time just for presenting today and so that's okay thank you so much Simone for agreeing to present you're today you're welcome have a great day thanks that everyone bye We're going to take a quick break before our closing panel on the future of beauty. But before that, I'm just going to quickly introduce the panelists for the panel. Our first panelist is Akemi Oka, PhD, and Head of Supply Chain and Sustainability Resources at the Independent Beauty Association. With over 20 years of CPG experience from Fortune 500 companies to small startups, Akemi's experience ranges from product development to sourcing and supply chain transformation. Akemi has worked at the Clorox company Method and was most recently VP of products at J.R. Watkins, overseeing development, quality, regulatory, compliance, claim support, and third-party manufacturing oversight for hand care, personal care, home care, and OTC remedies. She now heads up 
the independent beauty associations, global supply chain and sustainability programming, supporting small to medium sized businesses in the beauty and personal care sector. Akemi holds a BA in chemistry from Rutgers University and a PhD in chemistry from the University of California at Los Angeles. Our next panelist is Rob Akeridge, PhD, aka Dr. Rob, founder and CEO of Opulus Beauty Labs. In addition to creating and managing his latest venture, Opulus Beauty Labs, Dr. Rob has had an exciting career. He's a co-founder of Clarisonic. Dr. Rob helped develop clinically proven sonic devices that help make a clear difference in skin health and appearance. While at Clarisonic, Dr. Rob held several positions, internally as VP of Clinical Research and later as Global Brand President and Global Brand Representative. Rob obtained his BS in Biology, MS in Botany and Mycology, and PhD in Microbiology. With over 25 cumulative years in medical and global health, including 10 plus years spent on HIV AIDS research at FHCRC and UW Network, he was also the senior scientist in oral health care during his early days of Sonicare. Rob is a member of many professional organizations, including the American Academy of Dermatology and the Independent Beauty Association as a board member. And our final panelist is Kelly Kovac, CEO at Beauty Matter, the quietly loud renegade of the beauty industry with 25 years of experience and an ability for intuiting emerging trends. Leaning right but fueled by left brain thinking, her career is the accumulation of identifying white space, developing category defining strategies, and building brands from conceptual startups to tactical cleanups. She started her career in beauty as a member of the original executive team of Bliss and the managing director of the seminal Bliss catalog and product division. Kelly took on the way women bought beauty. This venture fundamentally changed the way cosmetics and personal care were merchandised, developed and presented to consumers, creating waves of change in the industry landscape that are still felt today and led to successful acquisition of Bliss by luxury conglomerate LVMH. Joining MD Skincare, Dr. Dennis Gross Skincare, in its nascent stage, she was responsible for the foundational branding and marketing strategies that positioned the brand as the premier cosmeceutical brand in both the retail and professional arenas. In addition, she launched Dr. Gross's book, Your Future Face, which helped establish him as a leader in the field of dermatology. Her relationship with brands has come full circle, with Kelly currently serving on the business's board of directors. As an advisor and strategist, she has helped dozens of organizations of all sizes, from emerging startups to iconic institutions, including multi-billion dollar brands like Old Navy, Banana, Republic, Procter & Gamble, Estee Lauder, and Mattel, to notable independents like Carol's Daughter, Zerk's So Cozy, Lowly Beauty, One Love Organics, Jimmy Jane, and many others. She advises venture capital and private equity on beauty transactions, executional and operational strategies. Always entrepreneurial, Kelly has also created and built her own brands. The most recent among these ventures is the award-winning fragrance brand, Odin, co-founded in collaboration with a New York fashion brand. Kovacs Projects has been featured prominently in the media, and her work as a creative director and brand architect has been recognized with many awards, including Pantone's Color Award and Penta Award for Packaging Design, a Fifi, and numerous Allure Best of Beauty Awards. Kelly launched Beauty Matter in the fall of 2016 with a firm belief that In a fast-moving world, information is knowledge, but context matters. And more importantly, innovation comes from the cross-pollination of industries and expertise. She set out to use her experience building brands and scaling businesses to offer a new perspective and holistic approach to B2B content that filled a void in the beauty industry. So we're going to take a little bit of a break and we'll be back shortly with our closing panel.
So here we are with our closing panel on the future of beauty. <laughs> and I am with some all stars of the cosmetics industry who have already been introduced. So I'm just going to get straight to my questions. Thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of this conference. My first question is, and also for everyone that's in the comments, ask your questions. I'm not going to ask them straight away, but towards the end, we will have time for live Q&A from you guys. So the first question for me is, what is the current beauty or indie beauty landscape like uh, from your perspectives? So what is the indie beauty landscape like today? Akemi, do you want to maybe kick this one off? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um... I'll be short. I, I mean, I, I think that actually it's exciting and it's very innovative, but I think it's very daunting. So, you know, I, I think like we're in a recessionary climate, but, I, you know, there are still new brands and businesses that are continuing to form and in a lot of diverse founders addressing the needs of a variety of underserved populations. So I think that that's very exciting. But I, I also think it's a really challenging time to do business, just quite frankly. I mean, I think capital is not sloshing around as it was even a couple of years ago. Um, and the regulatory climate has definitely evolved at both the federal and state level, as you've kind of heard today. And there's still, there's a lot of competition out there. So, you know, there, there's also, I think, more pressure now to understand more diverse retail models. You sort of can't just launch a, a, a brand, you know, online and expect everything to go viral. So there's some more considerations at play for, for brands today. Um, so that, that'll be my, my starting shot across the bow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Rob, do you want to go next? Sure. I, actually, I think Kelly is probably also very uh, good at answering this because uh, with Beauty Matter, they collect all the data on new brands, et cetera. So she's probably got some great insight. From my personal uh, point of view, I've noticed that over the years, even pre-pandemic, there were a lot of independent influencer brands and individuals with different uh, reasoning for, for getting into the beauty industry. I think the word is crowded, especially on the retailer side. They seem to have a lot of influencer brands, a lot of independent brands. So it becomes more challenging because there's always a limited amount of shelf, spa self spa shelf space, easy for me to say. But like Akimi says, you know, it is um, one of those things that it's it's got these unique ways of now maybe selling it, not just in your department store. It would have to be, you know, more online presence. So it's challenging that, you know, there's the, the crowded aspect, but also the fact that you have new regulations, so you have to be more educated and et cetera. So. And then last but not least, Kelly, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I am always optimistic um, about independent beauty because I think regardless of the economic climate or business conditions, there is always an opportunity. Sometimes it's easier than others. Um, and I just want to preface this with what I think the current state of the indie, not only the indie beauty, um, but I would say beauty in general. I think we're going through a moment of beauty Darwinism. It happened in 2008, and it is kind of this confluence of, um, of factors. It's the economy, um, it is consumer sentiment, it is the fact that there are just plainly too many brands and not enough places to sell them. And it is also the capital markets um, I think the past 10 years, I've been doing this almost 30 years, um, and the past 10 years, I think it became incredibly easy to launch a beauty brand um, with the rise of social media, um, direct consumer, um, really sort of opening up as, as a valid distribution channel. And then, you know, the, the access to venture capital. Venture capital 10 years ago was not even part of an equation. And I think it queered the market a little bit, to be quite honest with you. And I'm not sure what the other side of it looks like. Um, but I think all of those factors are going, we're going to see, and we've already started seeing it. Uh, something that we've never done before is tracking bankruptcies and closures. It's not easy to do because a lot of them, no one wants to talk about, which is a co completely separate topic. Um, but it's starting to happen, and I think the ne next 18 months are going to be full of innovation on one hand um, and incredibly difficult um, for brands on the other hand. Um, it's hard to innovate when you're trying to keep your doors open. So 
it's going to be a tough 18 years, but the, the brands are 18 months. Not, I hope it's not 18 years. Um, but the brands that come out the other side of it are going to be stronger for it. It happened in 2008 and it'll happen again. Yep. Now, I like the Darwinism this, part. That was very cool. <laughs> this was not a scheduled question, but it made me think of something I think you've said before, Kelly. So I'm just going to ask you something kind of related to what you were talking about. There's often this idea that the cosmetics industry is recession proof. Often you'll hear about what is it, the lipstick index, that people will just continue to buy lipsticks yeah. because what would you say to that? It makes me absolutely insane um, because, you know, I think sometimes we kind of drink our own Kool-Aid um, and we're not recession proof. Um, I think that we have we have the luxury of being in an incredibly resilient category. So I think when times get tough, I think beauty performs better um, than, say, fashion or other categories. But we are not recession proof. And anyone who thinks we are recession proof is probably going to be on the wrong side of beauty Darwinism. Um, so, you know, I think one thing that I sort of advise independent beauty brands and, and young founders that have never been through an economic downturn is don't look at, don't look at the headlines from the industry. Look at what's happening in the world around you. If someone can't put gas in their car or feed their kids, do you really think we are sort of immune from all of that? The answer is no, it defies logic. So yes, common sense. <laughs> So then moving on. I would to say, the next... you know, I would say, Kelly, oh, just also to add to what you were saying is that, you know, it does going to be a tough 18 months. But, you know, when you're a small entrepreneur and you're just starting out and you're doing things in your kitchen yeah. sink or wherever you're going to do it, if that's how you decide to start, that doesn't mean not go for it. I mean, I think all of us would agree yeah. that it's totally fine. Just, you know, ignore all the other headlines, as you said, but, you know, just be aware of the situation you're in because, yeah. you know. You should go for it because Beware, that's where the knowledge Watch your bottom from. line. Yeah. Just watch the bottom line. Yeah. So now moving on to the next question. What are some of the challenges that you see for indie beauty? And I know you all will have interesting perspectives from your different lanes. So from the trade association side of things, Akemi, what do you think? Oh boy. Um, I'll, I'll talk about like maybe three things because I think other folks and then we'll see I think other folks might kind of talk about some other you know we did talk about it at length I think in various sessions today regulatory compliance so I think that that's going to be an ongoing challenge for Indie Beauty to stay on top of the regulations uh, and to ensure compliance not just you know for products in market now or when you launch but going forward, because a number of the regulations that are now coming out, particularly in sustainability, have a forward-looking component to them and compliance requirements going forward. So I think like making sure that you're on top of that is important. And, and we've talked about MOCRA and plastics, but there's also like imminent guidance on FT, from the FTC on green claims. Um, and there's already starting, we're already starting to see lawsuits actually around sustainability claims with some really big companies. Um, as well as uh, guidance from the SEC. So we're also waiting for that to come down um, around ESG reporting and what guidelines or requirements they may have, because that's also going to trickle down to the, the indie beauty companies. So I think regulatory compliance is one. The other one is maybe an offshoot of regulatory compliance, but data management. So I think there are going to be more and more requirements for data collection. So whether you're looking at ingredient provenance and specifications, whether you've had to, because of the last sort of supply chain upheaval, do more secondary sourcing, you need to keep track now of secondary sourcing information, your packaging and ingredient specs, uh, potentially for packaging, the quantity, size, tonnage, type of, of packaging, as well as uh, label and website version control. Again, because there's a regulatory sort of um, cadence going forward. So you're going to need to make sure you know like what's in market when uh, and what your what, what sort of um, 
consumer facing assets you have out there. And so companies have to think about data management, how it's being collected, where it's being stored, how secure is the data, and then how easy can you access and retrieve the data? And then who's gonna create these reports? So that, that's the second thing is data management. And then the third thing that I think is really challenging is demand forecasting. So I think that it's demand forecasting is always difficult. Like the one thing about forecasts is they're always wrong, right? That's like kind of what we always say in product supply. <laughs> but I, it does feel like it's even more challenging right now to make these planning decisions because the current economic climate is so um, is so difficult to understand. You know, the past few years have had really anomalous demand signals, and typically you go back into historical data to figure out your 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 go forward plans and the backward looking data is really unreliable. Um, and then the current environment is still working through this sort of like post pandemic hangover. So even the current buying and, and sort of purchasing cycles are not to kind of like normal levels either. So, you know, I think like brands have to really think about um, all of that as well as now managing e-commerce and retail channels because they have their own sort of different supply and replenishment strategies. So all of that with like pressure on cash flow means that you're your big purchase orders, your cash cycle to payment, your on-hand inventory. Like these are all like really critical decisions and like yeah. rely on that good sort of data inputs <laughs> along with, you know, your pricing and promotional strategies. And like, that is really hard to do right now. So th those are, I think, the three things I'll call out that I see. <laughs> Kelly, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that some of, I'll, I'll pick three challenges too. Um, I think one is the capital markets are going to remain to be tough, are going to be, are going to remain difficult. So I don't think that we're going to see pre-revenue um, sort of investment happening unless it's an anomaly and a sort of a kind of a, a very special founder um, with very deep connections. So I think brands are really going to have to be very smart about how they um, are funding their businesses. So looking for alternative ways, debt financing, um, traditional loans. Um, I mean, interest rates are, are really high and in, until they go down, I don't think that's gonna change. Um, so it just means that you have to be more efficient with the capital that you have because raising capital has become incredibly difficult unless you have sort of traction in Sephora, Ulta, Target, Walmart. And then it becomes you're raising against funding inventory um, and investors seem to be open to doing that at the moment. So I, I think sort of how you're going to fund your business um, is going to be sort of a challenge. I think a challenge um, that is is not sort of immediate, but is going to happen in the future is going to be around sort of claim substantiation um, and justifying the claims you're making. And I think that pressure is gonna come from both the consumer side who's, de who's demanding science um, and also sort of pressure from what's happening in biotech. There is some crazy innovation that is producing some wildly efficacious products um, with the substantiation. Um, so that is, even as an independent brand, um, a lot of these are indies as well. Um, they are just sort of built a different way. Um, and I think that, you know, I think one of the challenges, and I don't know how this is going to play out, um, but it's one of the it's one of the moments where I'm very glad I don't own a beauty brand because navigating social media at the moment in this current culture, like you can't win. Um, and it is, um, it's tough. I have to say social media doesn't seem very fun anymore. Um, it seems toxic to me and, but yet it's, you know, how beauty brands market and drive revenue. But um, the, the current culture on social media like something's got to break. I don't know which way it's going to go, but I think I think navigating the climate and the expectation to have opinions about things that brands probably have no business opining on um, is not easy to navigate. 
And now for the co- uh, the founder perspective, brand <laughs> founder perspective here. Yeah, I was thinking Dr. about, you know, you know, <laughs> right. I was thinking about, you know, I'm the one that's gone through the gauntlet and I've come out, you know, yeah. the other end, less hair, but I still came out. Uh, <laughs> so the thing is, is that, you know, you start with six people or three, three founders. And the next thing you know, you have 600 employees. So uh, it's quite uh, challenging as you migrate through that and evolve. Um, I think the main thing to speaking to the people that have never just thinking about creating an indie brand, it has to be with where do you get started? I mean, you hear all the regulations and everything, but where do you even go? I mean, you have this, you know, this idea of you want to create a, a moisturizer, but where do you get that moisturizer from? And then, you know, the whole gauntlet of, of going through a contract manufacturing process and how do you get a product? And, and they, they send you prototypes. So for those of you that don't know, if you do want to create a moisturizer or a cleanser, you can go to these contract manufacturers and actually ask them to say, oh, this is the formula I think I love, but I don't like the color, I don't like the smell. Can you make something like this for me? And they'll send you prototypes and you go through this whole development process where you sort of pick the one you like best. And then the next thing you know, they start uh, producing it for you. But the thing that a lot of indie brands don't realize is you don't own that formula. I mean, you can on the phone, but most of them don't know that. And so they end up having to, they end up having to, to get into a situation where they're dependent upon a contract manufacturer to give them the product at a low price, but as their sales goes up, that price changes. And so you have all these different, you know, sort of like, I don't know if I'm making sense, but you have these different dead ends that you could potentially run into where the price becomes too high for, from this contract manufacturer and Therefore, you end up having to pay more money and you just lose your margin. So there's a lot of pitfalls in the process of where you get started. I mean, are you going to make this in your kitchen sink? Yeah, you can make it in your kitchen, but there reaches a point where you have to have a volume. We actually have to have it made on a commercial level. And how do you do that? I think that's a a major stumbling block for independent uh, brands when they just get started because they don't know where to go. And there's a lot of uh, education. This is that's probably a whole other seminar on contract manufacturing and what to do <laughs> and, and how you can own your formula. There's a way to own, own your formula, et cetera, and, uh, and still still make it. I think the other thing that Kelly pointed out, another challenge is communication. Uh, it's become so fragmented. You know, you used to be able to broadcast through, and then people that have heard me speak before, you could broadcast through ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, and then you would hit, you know, advertise on those channels and you would hit the majority of, of the world in the United States. Um, but now that's not true. And those, those companies have less and less uh, grab or uh, power. And now it's fragmented to different websites and then it's gotten fragmented to different social media. So your audience is becoming, um, you can have influencers talk, but they're only talking to a million people. And to grow a business, you need more than a million people. And out of that million, how many really are uh, purchasers and how many of those followers are really even real? Uh, you know, and so you start getting to the point where you could throw a lot of money away trying to get your message out there and not get much return on your investment ROI. So that's another huge area that they have trouble with. So lots and lots and lots of challenges for <laughs> indie brands and yeah. now continuing on the challenges. I'm going to direct this question to Kemi and Rob and Kelly, if you want to chime in by all means, but I'm interested Akemi, especially from the perspective of a trade association, how is the patchwork of regulations impacting indie beauty? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm sure that you can kind of, your your audience can surmise this, you know, from like listening throughout the day today. I mean, there's some things that have been good in, in terms of um, leveling the playing field. So at the federal level with MOCRA, I think that that's been helpful in ensuring safety and consistency, you know, at a foundational level across the industry, right? So that's encouraging certain best practices. And I think that that's important. The challenge is for, uh, you know, brands that are working in in the U.S. and, and even starting to export even earlier outside the U.S., you know, there's now the the concern around a variety of state level uh, legislation and, and regulatory activity that creates this um, this really difficult um, sort of beast to control because now you have potentially 50 different rules you have to comply with. And that's just in the U.S. alone, right? Now you're also having to think about outside of the U.S. And um, each of these rules um, have their own set of requirements. And so I think that the, the that makes it really challenging because they, you know, they they create um, 
like an impact around heightened regulatory compliance that requires small brands to stay on top of all this stuff. And, and as a small business, like you're just trying to get your product out the door. You're just trying to deal with like, how do I pay my employees, right? Like versus staying on top of all of this regulatory activity. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that um, that's really challenging. It also means, you know, brands need to think about, you know, how their business growth or their product portfolios, um, you know, how those, the timing of, of launches like aligns with future regulatory compliance. I mentioned that earlier, like it's not enough to just say like, am I compliant right now? But like, will I be compliant in the future? Uh, and that's like, that can be a really hard thing to wrap your head around. Cause you're so worried about your just like existence today. Right. So how do I even think about going forward and more and more brands have to think about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and as well as the tools and expertise they'll need, in-house versus externally, you know, vis-a-vis -vis compliance or product design, you know, procurement and then and data management. And I think mm -hmm. there are some tools that are coming out. So I think that that's also been kind of interesting, like in response to this sort of overwhelming need to um, stay on top of the, the regulatory environment, there are some tech solutions that have come forward. So IBA has partnered with IRI SIS, for example. And so this is a way to get really quickly an understanding of ingredient level compliance, you know, around the world uh, for formulations that you're building. Uh, the Good Face Project is something similar. So there are these like sort of tech database solutions that are trying to help smaller companies like wrap their arms around these requirements. And the requirements aren't just happening from a government regulatory level, like retailers have requirements too. So often like these tools are, are trying to also factor in retail requirements. Um, you know, and then the other thing I think that's made a, a little bit challenging for the, the, the regulatory environment and this heightened activity just means that there's more lawsuits emerging around statutory non-compliance. And I think Avril talk, spoke about this, Avril from KNL Gates, but you know, there are just, you know, groups that are interested in sort of trolling the new laws and seeing who is and isn't compliant just just from a letter of the law standpoint right and and um and and start to kind of go after brands and founders because they think there's opportunity there and and those are issues that really they're really difficult because they just take focus away from founders from developers and and businesses from what you're trying to do because you're now having to like kind of swat away all these other you know, sort of things that divert your attention. So I, I think the regulatory landscape on the one hand, it's admirable that we want to have like, you know, safe, compliant products. It's admirable that we're trying to tackle sustainability, but there are these sort of other things that kind of come along with that that can really um, be difficult for, for small brands to, to be able to focus, you know, on some of the, the, the core value propositions they're trying to bring to market. Anything to add before we move off of this question? I think the, I would the... just say be. Oh, sorry. The, I would just say be careful of the sources of your information because there's also a lot of misinformation. Not intentional, but this, these are complicated topics. So make sure that you have reliable sources. Independent Beauty Association is a fantastic one, and mm -hmm. also have find external resources that are experts because. This isn't something you want to figure out on your own and it'll end up costing you more money in the long run. Can we please grab speed? Oh, sorry. So when oh, you I wasn't sure if that was my uh, headphones. <laughs> that's all right. No, no, it's me. So actually, uh, when you, um, when you, I think of the, uh, this independent beauty when you first start out as you're like a little child and you don't know really what to do and so your parents are always giving you instructions like brush your teeth and you know you know right from wrong etc i think the key thing with independent beauty brands when they start out is establish good habits early on even if you're really small it doesn't mean you can't start recording people usage i mean like the, the reporting that amy uh, that kimmy's talking about when it comes to like adverse events i'm sure you guys talked about that earlier today just start taking notes and keeping good records. And as you grow, it's less of a burden on you to maintain those once you establish those habits up front, because it's gonna, it's it's a lot of information you need to keep track of, but it's not something that should scare you away from having your own brand. Right. 
My next question is, what are some common mistakes you see in the indie beauty world? Kelly, do you want to kick this one off? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I think we've all made them. Um, you know, you learn from mistakes. I think sometimes, um, you know, I think sometimes independent beauty owners come in with this very disruptive mindset. Um, and I'm going to use kind of a crazy e example, but, you know, there are a number of, of independent brands that launched without um, UPCs because they thought they didn't look nice without thinking of the ramifications of that. <laughs> you can't be in retail without a UPC. So sometimes things exist for a reason. So before you go and think you're going to, to disrupt um, the status quo, you need to understand why the status quo exists. Sometimes it exists for a very good reason. Um, so I, I, I think that is sort of di kind of disruption for, for disruption's sake um, is often a mistake. I think this, the, another mistake um, is launching a brand and spending the bulk of kind of your, the money that you have to do it on packaging, brand identity and marketing and inventory. And then you're left with nothing to run the business um, you know, that is a mistake I've seen so often. Um, and it can be actually critical because if you, if you don't have money to run the business, you can't sell the product. Um, and then I would say a, another, um, another mistake that I have seen, and this is sort of further along the path, not only have I seen it, I have lived it and it is painful, um, is having the capital in place to fuel growth. So if you come out of the, the gate with a really strong launch um, and you get the marketing support from sort of press and you get into retailers and you win awards, all these opportunities emerge. Um, and it's really great to think you can cash flow these things until one of your suppliers misses a delivery and all of the other components are sitting in the warehouse and the invoices are aging. Uh, you know, you have to, to be able to grow, you have to have the capital on hand to fund it. Um, you know, I learned the hard way and we sort of put ourselves out of business by, by self-funding and not having the, the, the capital on hand to fuel growth. Um, so that, that's also sort of, um, kind of a mistake to think about sort of further along the way. Right. I think that on my, on my side, it's more like, um, you should be your worst. When you first start out, you should be your own uh, worst critic. You should start throwing rocks at your glass house right away, uh, because everybody else is going to. And if you come up with a product, that's just a me too product, another moisturizer, how are you going to differentiate yourself? Just because you might be a celebrity, it's still a moisturizer. And then maybe, you know, most of these people that are starting indie brands are not celebrities. They might be just for someone that just loves lipstick or they just love makeup or whatever. And, and if you can't figure out a way to say this is different than a thousand, I think there's what, 10,000 products a year launched or different SKUs. It's like, how are you going to, you know, differentiate yourself? So, that's the key, one of the key things, I think. How do you differentiate? Yeah, I, I, I actually, it's funny because I you made me both think of different things. Like I, with Dr. Rob, I think, you know, brands not thinking about what their product is for and thinking about what it's against, like is like a kind of a problem because then you don't have a North Star when you're when you're like doing sort of portfolio expansion. So, so really understanding your core value proposition to your consumer is important. And then the other thing is like, how do you think about that core premise when you scale and you expand and like because I've lived this part too is like you sort of have a proposition and then you get into a retailer and you're really excited um, one of the things you have to also be prepared for is possible outside influence on your growth strategy and your growth project trajectory right because you're sort of like this is what I want to do and you're talking with a retailer and they're like that's great but here's what we want you to do. <laughs> and yeah, so right. there are these like interests that come out from 
investor partners, from retailers, and then things that you're going to have to do because of, you know, regulatory or legal compliance. And so not sort of being prepared or aware that those could have sort of outsized influence in like how you grow. And then that leads to maybe Kelly's question, comment about sort of having the capital on hand to deal with it. Because I think that there are a lot of brands that start and have no idea of the operational cost and the like the hidden costs like running a business there are just like things you never think about um until you're in it and and that's it's almost too late right so you know you're, you're thinking about product design you're thinking about marketing and customer strategy but that business operations piece you know your supply logistics the cash flow and, and your payment cycles what credit terms you are extending or are being extended to you you know, things like, or, you know, in a retailer, there's a cost to that. You know, every time there's a promotional program, those aren't free, you know, th those, there's a cost to that as well. And then often, you know, for your accounts receivable, especially the larger retailers, I won't say who, but I, I think across the board, you know, there's there's always sort of these these discounts or penalties that, that are sort of, you know, levied on you often yeah. uh, from them. Um, yeah. And so you have to go back and kind of claw back that money. And so right. these costs, they eat into margin. They can compound really quickly. Um, right. They might mean you have to hire really specific staff to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. You know, having that really strong sort of financial modeling and understanding your business is is really right. as important as, you know, the marketing investment and, and you know, getting your, your brand out there. Just to add to what, Kimmy, for those that don't know, if you go send a pallet of product to a retailer and they have a certain process and the labels have to be on a certain side and the pallet has to be a certain stack, it has to be a certain dimension, has to be a certain weight. And if you miss any of those, they start doing what they call chargebacks and they actually penalize you. And you can run up 80,000, 100,000 just in penalties. And some of the retailers look at that as a revenue stream to manage their business, to maintain their business. So they're always looking for ways to get you charged. And that's why you have to go claw back your money to get it going. So yeah, that was quite interesting. So now for maybe a more positive question here, I'm going to lump <laughs> my next two questions together just so that, and maybe the following two, I'll do the same just so that we have lots of time for Q and A for the audience. So the first of the two is, what are some opportunities that you see for Indie Beauty? And then I know you, we don't have a crystal ball, but from your perspective, what does the future of indie beauty look like? Kelly, do you want to start this one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the future of indie beauty. Listen, I have spent my entire career in indie beauty. I love it. Um, I think that there, the future of indie beauty is, 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 I think that the opportunities are those that you create for yourself. So Indie Beauty has this amazing community attached to it. Um, and I think during tough times, I think that community becomes even more supportive. Um, I do think that Indie Beauty is not created equal anymore. So I think that you cannot equate sort of a venture backed indie beauty brand and a bootstrapped indie beauty brand i think they're they're very different things so i kind of think the future of the indie beauty um indie beauty is kind of going to be bifurcated um and i think it is also important for those brands that are bootstrapping not to compare yourselves to those that are venture backed it's a completely different business model um, but I think that, you know, the, the Indie Beauty always drives innovation. And I have seen come across my desk some of the coolest, most complicated brands. Like, I've built brands my entire life. These brands are so nuanced and live in the metaverse. And they are so, um, they're intended for sort of digital and physical and, um, it is the, I think the brands of the future and how we're going to shop, I think they're being created today and it's going to come out of Indie Beauty. Right. Well, you took mine away. Innovation, <laughs> that's the key with with small brand. No, seriously, I mean, look at me. Yeah. I mean, if you innovate, 
that's that's the advantage that small companies have over these giant companies. They have their R and D divisions, but there's so many restrictions put on their chemists because they have to play it safe. Because if they actually make a a big launch on something they do internally and it flops or it causes their stock to drop, a lot of heads roll. So people are always cautious. They always have parameters around what the chemists can and can't do. We can create anything we want. I mean, that is the true beauty of it. We can go out and innovate and create things that people have never seen. And those companies say, oh, wow, that's really cool. I want to acquire that or I want to license that technology. And that I think is the future of Indie Beauty. So we're able to do things, especially as you mentioned, the biotech world. All those things are going to sort of come together and allow us to have this you know, future that we're not going to be able to dream about today until we see it tomorrow, right? Yeah, as a as a chemist, I have to like plug innovation. I'm always like bullish on innovation. Um, but I'll put my sustainability hat on a little bit. I think um, I do. <clears throat> I think that sustainability is going to shift from, well, maybe it won't shift. Like I, I think that there is an ongoing conversation about materials. Like what are the materials we're using and the provenance of the materials. I think it's going to start shifting to look more at conspicuous consumption, right? Like just start, starting to look at. Um, overconsumption and um you know and, and it's going to push like beauty and fashion probably also to reconcile and balance the need for newness with the realities of waste management and and then compliance with like big regulatory driven sustainability sustainability initiatives but I, I actually think that that represents a really interesting opportunity for innovation and collaboration and not just across like the beauty space, but some of these big laws like cross multiple industries. So there's also like a really interesting opportunity for the, the beauty industry to kind of collaborate with some other areas, whether that's food or beverage or automotive or, you know, like there are just some like really interesting sort of cross collaboration opportunities. And to that end, I think an opportunity for indie beauty relative to some of the other industries is that indie beauty has this more like direct line to consumers than a lot of industries. I don't know if it's just because it's just more tangible of an industry than like, I don't know, farm equipment or, you know, ag or, you know, whatever, but it's just like, it just seems to have like, um, you know, just this, this more um, interesting hold and interest from consumers. And so there is like a real opportunity to see if there's a way to harness that relationship with the consumer and the general public to evolve the public mindset or the sentiment, you know, around cosmetics and personal care uh, as a seriousness of an industry, um, but also to push for more meaningful science-based policy and funding uh, in the cosmetics and personal care space. And so I think that's like a, a really interesting opportunity to lean into. It's something like for, for me, I'm interested in kind of understanding the, the power that, that sits there. And now I will ask one more question before I open it up to Q&A. There are many brand founders or prospective brand founders that are tuning in here. So do you have any top suggestions that you would want to give them in how they're navigating launching a brand or continuing on in the early stages of having a brand. Dr. Rob, do you want to start this one? I think first I already mentioned you should be your own uh, best critic or worst critic. You should go after yourself because you're, you have to put make sure your brand is stable before it goes out to the market. Test, test, test. I mean, I know it can be expensive, but you should be doing all the safety testing that I'm sure we've talked about today somewhere in one, one of the sessions to make sure your product is safe because People, I will tell you that if, if it's not safe, why, why sell it? I mean, there's no reason to sell it. Uh, and um, the other thing is that the financing part is that, you know, what happens in the beginning, if you're just starting out, it's your credit cards, it's your savings. I cashed in my 401k for Clarisonic, uh, which paid off, but it could have not. Uh, it's a risk. But if you really believe in your idea, you take those risks. And I think that uh, you, you only inside know how solid your idea is. And with that confidence and, and knowing how solid it is, it can take you a long, long way. Kelly, what do you think? Yeah, um, you know, being a founder, it's hard. It can also be really lonely. Um, and so I think it's really important that founders make time and find ways to take care of themselves because these businesses are also not built by founders. Success is created by a team. You can't take care of your team if you're not taking care of yourself. So I, I think sometimes um, 
I think sometimes founders were really good and we're so passionate and we push, 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 push. But it's also, it's important to have mentors around you, either an advisory board or good friends that you can reach out to when times are tough and have like a real honest conversation um, where you can just be like, I don't know what's going on today. Like, I, I just need someone to listen to me. Um, because for your team, you need to be sort of the the cheerleader and and, make, and pushing things forward, you know. And you often see these these founders, especially when you're raising money or trying to land retail. Like the world always has to be 68 and sunny, but the reality is, it's not. Shit is falling apart all over the place. <laughs> that is the reality of a startup. Um, yeah. So it's important to build sort of people around you that can help you navigate that. Um, and also, you know, a team, because at the end of the day, like success requires a team. Definitely. I just want to say yeah. before Akemi moves on to the uh, answer that your uh, answer could be like a, in a picture frame for like an inspirational business quote. So thank you for that. Akemi, what do you think? Falling out, falling before falling that. <laughs> or that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's funny because I, it, I, my thought was it was similar to to Kelly's and that I you know it's like man learn as much as you can from people who have gone through what you're about to do right because like those people who have been in the industry have seen a lot and they can just like help you to avoid like stepping into the same same pitfalls as much as possible and so find them find them in the associations like conferences like they might be your supplier or service providers like find your people. And then also like take a good look in the mirror, like like Dr. Rob said, you know, like be your own worst cricket and, and understand like where your weaknesses are. So as you build your team around you, you can yeah. augment, you know, your um, your expertise with people who can sort of address the weaknesses that you have. So if you're not really right. strong in like financial modeling or assessment, like bring on a really strong CFO, right? Like if you don't have like really strong marketing chops, you know your product, bring in someone like really good in, in marketing. So like just understanding your weaknesses and then figuring out how to bring in folks like who can address the blind spots and then just like really practically make sure you have proper insurance, make sure you have like you check in with a lawyer, you know, so you've got like legal protection and you can mitigate some risk. And then, you know, do find someone who can help you with some of that financial modeling, right? Like there, there, and there are groups out there and consultants out there who can help with that. So just practically like those, those are some. <clears throat> and, and to add to what you guys were saying is that you don't necessarily have the, the, the people, the sounding boards, if you will, they don't have to be in the beauty industry. They don't yeah. have to have experience in that. They can be, they could have gone through something else. We started, I was at Sonicare Toothbrush, right? And then we went from there from that into beauty. So we had to learn along the way. And we learned, you know, so we didn't know about that. We knew about sonic cleansing of teeth, right? So it's totally different. But still, you can learn from anybody if they've gone through a startup somewhere. Now, moving on to the live Q&A from the audience. So this first question is directed to Kelly from The Pretty Mad Scientist. What kind of innovation do you think will come from this moment of beauty Darwinism or this recession? <laughs> uh, what direction do you expect to see independent brands move towards? Um, I think, I mean, I can, I, I'm already seeing it. So I think this, this rise of, this rise of, of biotech, um, and what ingredients can do in terms of delivering performance. I also think that it is going to help clean up the clean beauty mess we have all created for ourselves um, because these biotech ingredients are inherently clean. They're sustainable. They're also expensive right now. Um, but I think that there is going to be um, we're going to see the bar raise on efficacy, especially in skincare and probably color as well, because so much of complexion are hybrid products. I think there's going to be actually a lot of innovation around fragrance as well. We're already starting to see it with this idea of neurosense and, um, and, and how fragrance can kind of expand the mind. Um, you know, there are scientists working on making our computers that smell. I think beauty is going to be much more about the five senses 
and brands are going to be, the brand experience is going to be more immersive and more sort of on one hand, um, sort of creating communities, both online and offline, um, and then incredibly immersive sort of in the same way. So I think we're going to see a lot of um, innovation um, around um, around fragrance. And in retail, I, I honestly think we are going to see as much as much as technology is super exciting. Um, I think that brick and mortar retail, what what the key differentiator is, is human connection. And I think that we all spend too much time on screens. And I think there's going to be sort of retailers that emerge that go back to good old fashioned retail, saying hi to someone when they come in, knowing who they are, and really building relationships rather than it being so highly transactional. Some of those things are probably wishes as much as they are predictions, but those are some of the things I'm watching anyway. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> I can just briefly talk about, I can just briefly talk about that. I know Kelly, I've talked to Kelly about this actually in the mm -hmm. past, but I think when you look at incubators, you know, if you're it, just let people that don't know, let's say it's a larger company, name a big beauty company, they have a small fund that they'll invest in these technologies or these brands that they think have potential and they want to watch them grow or develop their technology. That's great because it's money coming from them. Uh, oftentimes um, there's a concern that if they take money from a large company, you always, so let me back up just a little bit. You should always think, even when you first create your brand, how are you going to exit? Because at Clarisonic, we thought, okay, we didn't even know we we're going to create a Clarisonic face brush. We were looking at different industries and one of the founders said, how are we going to exit? Is that a, you know, a VC flip? Is that going public and on a trade? Or are we going to just keep it and hand it down to our kids? Or are we going to sell it to a big fish like one of the big beauty companies like we sold Sonic here to Philips? So we said, we're going to do that. And then the next question, how much are you going to sell it for? And we actually picked a dollar amount before we had a prototype. And that, you know, knowing that and then getting it to go to the next level is, is you know, to actually do that exit is, uh oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Darn it. So what was the so back up? Uh, I had a clear point that I was going to tell you and I screwed up. So go on. I'll think about it. God. <laughs> Well, I don't think you have to exit. So I think that that has been oh. a misnomer that, right. you know, you know, you build it and, and someone comes with a billion dollar check. That's no. an anomaly. So, so, yeah, I would, so that's true. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So the <laughs> thing is, is that what people worry about now, I remember, so people worry about when they take money from big companies, that it's going to have extra strings attached and people are not going to want to buy your company because if they do not want to purchase it, let's say you take, you know, a gazillion dollars from company X and you're getting ready to sell it and company X doesn't want to buy it. All the other companies say, well, I don't want they want it. They've been in the inside, you know, and then they're going to worry about it and not follow through. So that was my point. But, you know, the thing is, Kelly's right. You don't have to exit. You can grow. I think that's going to be one of the trends. People are going to grow these companies and keep them and make them, you know, something that's really unique. And there's very few independents that are really big that they maintain that. They usually get gobbled up by somebody else. So I think in we don't re we don't really... I mean, I think incubators mean a lot of different things in beauty, like in tech incubators mean something, right? So, and some beauty brands participate in sort of those traditional like tech stars of the world, right? So there are incubators where um, founders can go and, and sort of go through a mini boot camp. You have sort of accelerators with retailers. So I think mm -hmm. incubators and accelerators, there's they sometimes get sort of used interchangeably. Regardless, I mean, there are the incubators that that Dr. Rob was talking about that sort of are attached to to fundraising. But some of these accelerators or incubators, I think the um, 
you have to think about the time commitment, right? So um, there is a time commitment to um, some of these things, be it first, there's a time commitment of filling out the application and going through the process of getting accepted, then you're accepted. And in the case of like tech stars, like you have to go physically be somewhere else. So who's going to run your business while you're at the tech star incubator? So you have to think of the business implications and the participation. Um, if you have a co-founder, different thing, you can kind of divide and conquer. So I think you need to to look at the time commitment and and what you're going to get out of it. Um, I think um, first-time founders perhaps get more out of it than sort of a more seasoned founder. Um, but you really need to think about why you're doing it, what it's going to take, and, and what you want to get out of it. Yeah, I was focusing on the uh, financial side. So, yeah. Yeah, got it. yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So it's a good question, you know, because some of it has to do with how much expertise you have, right, like in your sort of founding group. I mean, I think ultimately regulatory compliance lies with the brand, right? Like you are the face, you are the one who's going to address like if there's a recall or there's like a social media impact, it's it's on you, right? Like even if you have a manufacturer behind you, you're not going to be like, it's that guy, right? Like the you, you're the face. So I think ultimately it's up to the brand to make sure that they've got uh, regulatory compliance and legal compliance um, advisement. Um, you know, I, I do think it, it often can help to um, have regulatory at the brand level, because often like the manufacturers, if you're working with the contract manufacturer, they'll have a, they'll but they're looking at compliance across many brands. They're looking at compliance across their own operations. Um, and, and they're looking at how do I make sure like, you know, we're meeting our customer needs. Whereas if you have someone focused just on your brand or your company, they're only looking at your brand's compliance needs. And there's some value to that because they're not spread across like kind of you know, multiple tasks. So I think there's some value in, in seeing reg your brand. And, and there are different ways you can structure those relationships, um, you know, and, and often, you know, the regulatory consultant a little bit less expensive than billable hours that might be a little bit out of reach. So, you know, thinking about sort of what you can afford, um, you know, may also crystallize sort of your your approach to like <laughs> where you need that that help, that third party help. Now I've seen in the comments that you guys can hear me. Hopefully you can hear me now. I might be peaking because my microphone only has a limit of eight hours and I've been streaming for more than that. So I had to switch to my earbuds. I'm sorry about that. Hopefully you got the gist of the question that I asked Akemi, which was around how do brands navigate regulations? Uh, question from the comment. Okay. I thought this question was really interesting from Hanson who asks, hopefully you guys can hear me also. Just let me know if you can. But the question was, any suggestions on how to get your products to be reviewed by beauty editors? Do you still send sample products to editors or editorial staff? How does this work? I guess I'll take that. <laughs> um, listen, it is at the end of the day, it's not rocket science. 
Um, what I would say is if you want to get attention, be very focused in your outreach. I mean, if you saw my inbox and, and the rest of the editorial team's inbox, most of it is polluted with information and products have nothing to do with me that we would never cover. Um, so I would say don't send out a blanket email. Um, pick some editors that you like, that you think would get your product. Reach out personally. Take the time to do sort of a personalized note. Um, you know, don't blindly send product because it will just end up in a box, um, kind of not, not knowing who it comes from. So I think I, I would suggest, especially for independent small brands, be really targeted. And it's like everything else. It's like build relationships. Um, so, you know, I, I have to triage my inbox every day. And so I triage it by what catches my eye and, and what's interesting. Um, and so a personal, really meaningful email that tells me your story um, and, and why I should be interested always catches my attention. And then don't forget the follow-up, right? So it's not just about one, um, one placement. Um, follow, you know, Follow those those writers that gun relationships. Dr. Rob, do you have anything to add? No, I, I agree. It's well, the key word here is relationships because um, what we agency or a large agency, uh, and they that whole world, uh, the editors and the and the PR people all know each other. Uh, and they have a level of trust that they're, the special editors know that if this PR person is going to bring them a product, it's probably because it's something that they really think they believe in. It's not just, at least I'm, I'm hoping that's the case. And so we've always gotten uh, in through a PR agent. Uh, they're not always cheap. It just depends upon, uh, I'm sure you can find some someone that can do that for you. And, and they actually have ends with different editors. Uh, you just don't want to have one that's obnoxious that all the editors say, oh, my God, this person again. So <laughs> and, and I don't know if Kelly could speak to that or not, but that's, uh, you know. Yeah, I, but I would also say you want to know what your agency is. And on both sides of the equation. And sometimes I get things and I was like, oh, my God, if this brand even knew that this is how this yeah. was being sent out. So I think like any of these other external relationships, it has to be managed. Um, and you need to make sure that they have internalized what your brand is about and that they're pitching it in a meaningful way that they're just not sort of spamming editors. Um, if you want me to interview you, well, I don't know your business. So what, you know, what is it that makes you special? That's going to get my attention. So uh, my, my suggestion for personalization doesn't end with sort of the founder. It's also right. for PR agencies agencies as well. Right. You've got it. They right. have to be managed the, the same right. way any other relationship that you're yes, sort of looking for. Yeah, I agree. And we actually review anything that goes out to the press yeah. ahead of time and know what the what that looks like and if it's on brand and whether or not in all the all the text, the copy is all reviewed, et cetera, because you, it, it's your brand. And also, you know, uh, yes, use your PR agency, but also build a personal relationship. So if someone's written about you, pop them a note and say, hey, thank you. That was such a great relationship as well. Yeah, yeah. like I've done with Kelly. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to echo what Kelly is saying just from the influencer point of view, because that is also something that brands increasingly need to think about is working with influencers, build relationships with influencers. Don't just spam us in our inboxes, in our DMs. I get it so often. People who are like, oh, I love your content. I want to tell you all about this organic, clean, non-toxic brand. Do you actually love my content? Do you actually follow me if this is what you think is relevant to me? So if you're going to connect with someone like me, then like, or whoever is the influencer, just like make sure what you're saying is in line with their doing and then try to build that relationship and don't just, yeah. I get it a lot for my podcast as well, for people just, it's the same kind of emails. We want to tell you about this non-toxic XYZ and we're going to tell you about this on your podcast. Um, so relationship building, just echoing that. 
from some of my experiences influencing. We are over the hour mark for this <laughs> panel and over the timeline for this whole conference. <laughs> this is over the timeline for my <laughs> microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our panelists for agreeing to participate in this panel. I'm just going to close out the conference just in general. So a few thank yous to say as I close out. So, well, firstly, thank you for this conversation. This was super insightful. I'm going to try my best to turn this conversation into a podcast. So stay tuned for that. That'll come out when I come back with my podcast in the next year. I'll be back in February at, at some point. Um, the replay of this whole conference will be published tomorrow. Stay tuned. I'm going to be sending it to everyone registered to your inboxes. We also have a little directory that I made that feature the speakers and our sponsors. So stay tuned. If you want the uh, resources that were in this conference, you want to, for example, uh, work with one of them as a consultant, then now you'll have the information to start that relationship. Uh, thank you so much to all of our other speakers throughout the day, everyone. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Avonic and CLR Berlin. They were our bronze sponsor. And Beauty Matter was also our media partner. It's because of our sponsors that we are continuing to be able to make these conferences free and accessible to everyone. I hope this was a really exhaustive uh, 101 for what you need to know for starting a brand. I haven't seen that many uh, like robust conferences, especially online, especially free available to indie founders. So hopefully this was that for you. So I hope you enjoyed the day. Thank you so much for tuning in. And with that, I will leave you all to the rest of your Sunday. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye.